Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. And welcome to Star Wars Prequel Month! May the Fourth be with you! Yeah, I know this is Star Trek. I don't think Star Wars has an official greeting thing with their hands. Except for Han Solo shooting someone first. It's been interesting these last two decades. Loving Star Wars, then not liking it because of my dislike of the prequels. Growing to love them again with the sequels, and during that time, I've seen a transformation of opinions about the movies. Seeing more film analysis of all of them, learning the history of what inspired them, the creative processes that outlined the decisions they made for iconic moments, still discussed today, our own nostalgic memories for which movies got us into the franchise, it all shapes how we end up feeling about these things. Oftentimes, leading to divisive opinions about them. And of course, the only subject we're all united by, Baby Yoda is adorable. Well that, and for the love of God, stop making revisions to the original trilogy! Let's get something out of the way here. If you like the prequels, that's okay. I am not judging you. I am not attacking you. Last year, I talked about the idea of fan entitlement and this feeling of ownership that some fans have with properties. Works of fiction are important to us. In many cases, they help shape our identity, and thus it feels like if a property is scrutinized, we are in turn criticizing the person who likes it. I am not doing that. You are not the property. A person is not a product. I am not casting judgment upon you for enjoying the prequels. You are allowed to like things that I do not. It's called an opinion for a reason. I am explaining why I have a problem with them. But you can just shrug and say, okay, I still like them. My critiques are my own. This is stuff that I personally cannot get past. Last December, I made my defenses of The Last Jedi, and people responded and argued with me, and a lot of them had good points that I could probably concede to. But I still love the film, and they're not changing my mind. Just like I'm not doing this to change yours. I'm here mostly to analyze comic adaptations and to make boner jokes while recapping it. What's more, it is okay that there are problems. None of these movies are perfect. It's just the problems with the prequels are so glaring in comparison to all the other movies that for me and many others, they detract from the experience and make it difficult to enjoy them. And we wanted to enjoy them. We wanted to love these movies. We're all Star Wars fans. We all grew up with them. In 20 years, a generation will grow up with the sequel trilogy as their first and favorites. I know a big reason why a lot of you defend the prequels is because they're your Star Wars, the ones you saw first as a kid. And I freely admit there's a problem with talking about the prequels in this way. This is a review of the comic books, but one big part of why they don't work is because of the medium they were made for. Movies. The acting is bad. It is really, really bad. Some bits of acting are obviously better than others, and there are sequences where the acting is fine. Especially Ian McDermott, who's clearly having the time of his life and knows exactly what he's doing. There's a reason why a lot of dialogue in the prequels has become infamous and meme-worthy. Because the delivery is so stilted, or the lines are so lame, that you have to laugh at it. It's the same reason why The Room is so infinitely quotable. Because it's bad writing, linked with a terrible performance. And while some of that can be laid at the feet of the actors, as someone who has had to direct other people in storylines and movies, a director often needs to work with their actors to get the kind of performance they want. And it's clear that George Lucas did not do that. And I will be fair to the man. He knows he's not that kind of director. Hell, his passion is in camera technology and the mechanics of filmmaking. He is not an actor's director, and he is not a writer, and he will be the first to admit that. It's why he had other people revise his scripts and direct his movies with the original trilogy. But by that same token, he knows his own faults and shortcomings, and didn't try to improve on them or play to his own strengths while letting other, better qualified people handle his weak spots. It was ultimately his responsibility when he made the these things. He is most certainly not the boogeyman of Star Wars that many made him out to be over the last couple decades, but he is not blameless in the problems of the prequels. I mean, when you're the writer and director, I'd like to think that you have some control over the product you're making. Call me crazy if you'd like. 
Anyway, like with my reviews of the other Star Wars movie comics, I'll also be commenting on these things as adaptations of the films, their strengths and weaknesses in that regard. One big advantage the comics have over the movies already is in the effects department. At the time, the prequels showed off state-of-the-art CGI technology, not just for creature effects, but entire environments. They have not aged well, and in fact, for a lot of the movie, you can definitely notice a fakeness of everything around the actors, as if everyone was inside of an old 90s full-motion video game. Comics don't have that weakness, instead allowing for everything to look like it all belongs in the same universe. The bad performances are not present if you've only read the comic and not seen the movie. Unless the artwork doesn't carry the emotion, but then that's the artist's fault. Unless somehow there was an editor or something who looked at the art and said, No! No! More bland! More hollow husks of living beings! Make it sound more like they're reciting city council bylaws! But there are things I like about the prequels, and I'm gonna talk about those, too. So sit back, full screen the video, and let's take our first step into a larger world by digging into Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace, the official comic adaptation. from a trade and we've got enough comic to talk about already, so let's just dive right in with our standard issue opening crawl. Turmoil has engulfed the Galactic Republic. The taxation of trade routes to outlying star systems is in dispute. Taxation based turmoil! I'm gonna get into this more later, but this is something that's a bit overblown, claiming that one of the things the prequels are about is taxes and trade routes. The problem is this really should not have been the first lines of the opening crawl. The opening crawl is to establish the current situation in as simple a manner as possible. The second paragraph establishes that the Trade Federation is greedy and has set up a blockade to stop shipping to Naboo. That is more relevant information and more interesting than taxing trade routes. I think you can keep the same information in the crawl, but reorder it. Start off with, The Greedy Trade Federation is blockading the peaceful planet of Naboo for unknown reasons. Some say it's over tax disputes, while others suspect more sinister motivations. It sounds more mysterious, yet conveys the same exposition. This is another thing I'm going to be doing throughout these reviews. I think the prequels have the foundations to be good movies, but they zig where they should have zagged, and I'm going to try to explain how I think they would have worked better because I'm an egotistical blowhard who thinks he knows better. Anyway, because of this turmoil, the Supreme Chancellor of the Republic has secretly dispatched two Jedi, Obi-Wan Kenobi and his master Qui-Gon Jinn, to see if they can settle this dispute peacefully. I'm curious why exactly he did it in secret. There's some reason you don't want to say you're sending Jedi off to act as ambassadors? I mean, aside from that being the only explanation for why they don't talk about what happened in the Senate chambers later, Anyway, they're left in a conference room. I have a bad feeling about this. I don't sense anything. Then you're not very good at this, Qui-Gon. Obi-Wan asks how he thinks the Viceroy, the guy in charge of the Trade Federation's forces here, will respond to the Chancellor's demands. These Federation types are cowards. The negotiations will be short. I feel like we should have, like, a running tally for every time Qui-Gon is horribly wrong about things. The Viceroy learns that the two are Jedi Knights. His assistant thinks that this is to force a settlement and that their plan, whatever it is, is doomed. Stay calm. I'll wager the Senate isn't aware of the Supreme Chancellor's moves here. Yeah, it'll really upset the Chancellor's anti-Jedi constituents. 
Anyway, they send in a droid to distract the Jedi while they contact Darth Sidious. I sense an unusual amount of fear for something as trivial as this trade dispute. The galaxy is in turmoil! The Viceroy informs Sidious of the arrival of the Jedi. In turn, he says they have to accelerate their plans and for them to begin landing troops on Naboo. Ah, oh, my lord, is that legal? I will make it legal. Damn Sith lobbyists! The Trade Federation destroys their transport ship and then vents poison gas into the meeting room. Fortunately, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan realize something has gone wrong. Though it seems weird that their first reaction to sensing people getting murdered is to pull their lightsabers on the... you know... nothing that's actually attacking them. I mean, unless they plan to use the lightsabers on the poison gas. The Trade Federation employs these battle droids as their army. When I first saw the trailers for The Phantom Menace as a kid, I was hyped for these things. Partly it was because I saw the idea of these waves of faceless, almost inhuman droids getting deployed, folded up, and thought they were just cool. My brother and I had a big Technic Lego set of one too. But unfortunately, a poor decision completely undermined them right from the get-go. Their voices. Instead of, say, an unintelligible string of noises like R2-D2's beeps or some kind of alien language, they were given a high-pitched sing-song sort of voice. Check it out, Corporal. We'll cover you. Roger, roger. If they're down here, sir, we'll find them. Corazon, uh, that doesn't compute. Uh, wait, uh... All potential tension from these things disappeared, not helped by, frankly, how pitiful they actually are as fighters. Most of the time, they're just employed for comic relief, and yet they're the main foot soldiers of the Trade Federation. Say what you will about stormtroopers getting beaten by teddy bears or having terrible aim, at least they're treated like something we should be scared of. Naturally, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan were not killed by the gas, probably employed some kind of technique to hold their breath longer than normal, and quickly make short work of the battle droids being sent in to destroy their bodies. The Viceroy seals off the bridge as the Jedi head for it. No doubt to kindly ask the Viceroy, what the hell, man? However, apparently lightsabers are more effective than bombs, since Qui-Gon is able to start melting through even the blast doors to get to them. Why doesn't everybody carry a lightsaber for these situations? Sure, you don't need to employ it as a sword like the Jedi do, but it seems like a really useful tool for things like this. The more effective, and frankly cooler droids arrive. Destroyer droids, or droidicas. Unfortunately, the comic does not actually show them off properly. They roll around like a Don fan from Pokemon and then unfold, deploying a defensive force field bubble. They look even more inhuman, with three legs and not even the hint of facial features like the battle droids do. In the comic, they just show up and start clanking, and our heroes are like, ah, oh, crap, with no reasoning explained why they should be frightened of them, versus any of the other dozens of droids they've destroyed. It also doesn't do a good job of showing Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan employing force super speed or whatever the hell they did to blur away from them down a corridor. Instead, just the destroyers shooting at the door themselves now. Keep shooting, droidicas! They must have employed their cloaking devices! Evading the droids, the Jedi arrive in a hangar bay where they see battle droids and tanks getting loaded into ships. Realizing that this is an invasion fleet, they decide they need to inform the Naboo and the Chancellor about this. Well, actually, Qui-Gon says they need to warn them about it, but considering the invasion is about to start, warning the Naboo is more like... I just want to tell you both good luck. We're all counting on you. The comic fixes a minor dialogue issue from the movie. Qui-Gon says they'll stow away aboard separate ships and meet back on the planet, but of course if this army is invading the entire world, there's no reason to believe they'll end up anywhere near each other to meet up. Instead, the comic just says to go on separate ships and lock on to my comlink, suggesting they'll keep in touch, but both try on their own to reach the Naboo. They might have better luck that way. The leader of the Naboo, Queen Amidala, contacts the Viceroy, and unfortunately the comic takes a step back by adding additional confusing details about the Senate voting on the trade boycott. It's just unnecessary fluff that overcomplicates what the hell is going on. Again, you come before me, your highness. The Federation is pleased. You will not be pleased when you hear what I have to say, Viceroy. Your trade boycott has ended. I have word that the Senate is finally voting on this blockade of yours. You can tell how smug and happy I am about this. I'm just jumping for joy right now. Still, again to the comic's credit, we have another advantage that the movie does not. The Trade Federation's accents. As you know, our blockade is perfectly legal. What? What did you say? My lord, is that legal? Again, you come before us, your highness. 
We would never do anything without the approval of the Senate. As has been pointed out before, it sounds very, very much like a racist Asian stereotype. You know the kind. The sort of thing that'd be in, like, a 1940s or 50s comedy where a white dude is in yellow face or something. And let's be clear here, I don't think that Lucas intended to be racist here. It was just a bad creative decision because, hey, aliens in Star Wars have weird accents and languages. The comic not having that means that I can give them any accent I want, giving them the dignity they deserve. I know nothing about any ambassadors. You must be mistaken. Anyway, yeah, the call ends and the Federation works to block off communication so they can't inform the Senate of what's going on. Down on Naboo, we see the High Council discussing what's going on with Senator Palpatine, their representative to the Republic. Their call gets cut off and... yeah, let's talk about Amidala for a second. I have made fun of Queen Amidala's appearance and other things before... And I'm gonna keep doing so now. Why the hell does she look like this? Why does she look like this in universe and out of universe? Out of universe, I kind of get it because they want to give her a unique, merchandisable look while also trying to hide the big revelation later on. But did nobody look at this design and think this is goofy and no one will take her seriously? I mean, if you look at this scene with no knowledge of this movie, wouldn't you assume she was the court jester, not the queen? And then there's just the bizarre in-universe. Maybe Naboo has some stupid tradition where queens dress up like this in elaborate robes and makeup, especially since the queen in the next movie does so too. But that's the best explanation because nobody else on Naboo looks like this! And it's just jarring every time we see her suddenly wearing these elaborate, ridiculous outfits and makeup. I mean, the only other explanation is that Diamond Hagen conquered this planet years ago and they just carried on the tradition. The troop transports arrive in Naboo in some swamp areas and begin going through a forest on their way to the capital city. Qui-Gon apparently got ahead of them and has to flee from them along with all the other life forms. And unfortunately, he encounters an alien that he throws to the ground when it grabs onto him from being scared. If somehow you have completely avoided Star Wars stuff, this is Jar Jar Binks. As I mentioned with fan entitlement, sometimes that entitlement can turn particularly toxic, sending death threats and hate messages towards people involved with the thing you're a fan of. Like an actor for a character they played, as was happened to Ahmed Best, who played Jar Jar Binks. It is never appropriate. It is never okay. Ahmed Best and Jake Lloyd faced so much hardship after this movie, and it's sickening. And it's important to state that. I may not like this movie, but that in no way extends to the actors playing characters in it. These are all talented people trying to do their best. As we go through this, I will explain my problems with the character as he comes up, but for me, the big issue is that he's just not funny which is a bit of a problem when they're meant to be comic relief. Frankly, I got more amusement out of Amidala acting super serious in meetings while dressed as Krusty the Queen. Anyway, Jar Jar proclaims how happy he is that Qui-Gon saved him. You almost got us killed. Are you brainless? Now get out of here. Okay, unfortunately, the comic cut out one of the best lines of the movie, but instead it makes Qui-Gon's stoic demeanor break, and suddenly he has a Boston accent. Get out of here, indeed. Misa stay. Misa call Jar Jar Binks. Misa use humble servant. The first problem with Jar Jar's comic relief is the way he talks. Others have pointed out that it's very reminiscent of, again, racist stereotypes in old movies. In this case, almost minstrel show depictions of black people. And like the Trade Federation, it of course wasn't intentional. They were just trying to do silly voices and accents. But you add them together and it makes it uncomfortable and head tilting. But even if you divorce those kinds of criticisms, it just sounds dumb. I think that really spells out the big issue with The Phantom Menace overall. When it's trying to be serious, it's silly. And when it's trying to be silly, it's moronic. You have our Jedi trying to evade capture by the battle droids and help the Naboo leadership with this invasion, but here comes Jar Jar all, Ooh, Misa so cowardly! Misa gonna step in poop now! It just becomes frustrating. Anyway, Obi-Wan meets up with them and they decide they need to head out. When they mention that more droids will be coming, Jar Jar suggests going going to the underwater city where he grew up. Since a city could mean contact with Naboo's leadership, they elect to go, 
though Jar Jar becomes a little reluctant because he was exiled from the city. Probably for stepping in some sacred fish poop or something. We never really learn what it was other than he's clumsy. But he's more afraid of the droids, so they end up going. They're immediately captured by Jar Jar's people, the Gungans, and brought to Boss Nass, their leader. He's not particularly fond of the Naboo for undisclosed reasons, other than... They take brains so big. Actually, that does make me wonder. EU fans, in Star Wars, have they ever fought a giant brain? And if not, why not? But yeah, no real reason given for a conflict between the two people. I think it's because they don't want to get into anything that would make one side or the other look bad. Like, our heroes were helping a xenophobic colonial empire or something by helping the Naboo, so it's left vague. Obi-Wan tries to convince them that an invasion would be bad for them too, and thus they need to work with the Naboo. You and the Naboo form a symbian circle. What happens to one of you will affect the other. You must understand this. You form a symbian circle! What with how you both share the same planet, but in totally different places, and have no diplomatic ties or contact. Qui-Gon, knowing this isn't going anywhere, just uses the Jedi mind trick to get a transport ship to the Naboo capital. Remember this point for later. He also convinces Nas to let Jar Jar go with them instead of being punished, figuring they'll need a navigator for their ship, even using the mind trick again, though this time it's at least to save him. They travel on their way to the capital, evading some giant fish on the way. In Naboo, however, the invasion forces arrive. Based on what we do know of the Naboo, they don't seem to have a standing army of any kind, just security volunteers, so it's pretty easy for them to just roll in. The Federation is not tricked by her disguise as a giant blackbird, it's still the same day, isn't it? Why did she change outfits? Is this her formal surrender gown? Well, I say surrender, but that's not accurate. They want her to sign a treaty that will legitimize their occupation army. Probably says something like, we were invited versus military invasion. And she refuses. I'm guessing a forgery would be too difficult to accomplish. Probably need, like, a visual record of her doing it for anyone to believe it. They take Amidala, her immediate counsel, and guards to be processed, but fortunately the Jedi have arrived and destroy the battle droids guarding her. We've come to warn you about an invasion by the trade Federation. Thanks. Glad to be of service. Bye. They need to contact the Republic, but with communications being blocked, that means grabbing a transport ship and hightailing it off the planet. They head to a hangar bay swarming with battle droids. There are too many of them. That won't be a problem. I mean, these things are basically toothpicks held together with duct tape and prayer. I could probably win back the whole planet on my own. Faster with Obi-Wan watching my back. Amidala doesn't want to leave her people, but everyone else thinks their only chance is to plead their case before the Senate. They will kill you if you stay. They need her to sign a treaty to make this invasion of theirs legal. They can't afford to kill her. They convince her to leave and charge in, easily dealing with the battle droids. I can't decide if I like this more or less than how it was in the movie, where they just walk up and say, We're leaving for Coruscant, and confuse the hell out of the droids. On one hand, it once again lessens the menace of the battle droids, but on the other hand, it's hilarious, and there is something to be said for utterly confusing them like that as part of their strategy. They fly their ship up and have to deal with the Federation's blockade, which is kind of pitiful, frankly. Sure, they manage to knock out the ship's shield generator, but that's it. And this is not like a combat-ready fighter with full-on maneuvering thrusters or anything, like, say, Poe's X-Wing at the beginning of Last Jedi, or Han Solo in a kick-ass freighter with tons of experience as a smuggler running blockades or something. It's basically the Queen's friggin' yacht, and they can't shoot this thing down? Anyway, the shield generator is all they need to run said blockade, so when it's damaged, a collection of astromech droids are dispatched to repair it. Including, of course, R2-D2, who manages to be the single greatest hero of the entire franchise. However, damage they did sustain during the run was to their hyperdrive. They don't have enough power to reach Coruscant, but they can land on Tatooine. While it's controlled by the Huts, the Trade Federation has no presence there, and the Huts aren't looking for them. This is followed up by a scene that's... Odd. Amidala saying that they owe R2-D2 their gratitude for repairing the shields. Droids in the Star Wars universe are second, third, and fourth class citizens. It's usually only our heroes who care about very specific ones because they formed a camaraderie with them. And yet suddenly, here's a scene where a queen decides, Yes, this trash can deserves a special commendation for saving our asses. 
I mean, don't get me wrong, the way droids are treated in Star Wars makes me really appreciate L337 from Solo and, of course, fan-favorite HK47 from Knights of the Old Republic, who will happily tell you about how sucky meatbags are. It's just weird to have a scene where they're like, ooh, this droid is awesome and deserves our gratitude. Clean it immediately! The Viceroy contacts Palpatine and informs him of Amidala's escape and how they can't pursue. As such, Palpatine calls in his own help. Viceroy, this is my apprentice, Lord Maul. Ouch, in the comic he doesn't even get a Darth title. It doesn't matter if it's movies, TV shows, or comics, Darth Maul is the most screwed over character in all of Star Wars. Our heroes land on Tatooine near the outskirts of a city. Obi-Wan is staying behind with the ship to guard the Queen, Qui-Gon telling them not to send any transmissions. He, Jar Jar, and R2-D2 head out towards the city to obtain a hyperdrive generator for their ship, but the Queen also dispatches one of her handmaidens, Padme, to come with and learn more about the planet. Qui-Gon doesn't want her to come along. I've been trained in defense. I can take care of myself. This is not a good idea. Stay close to me. Padme gets into no problems whatsoever. Instead, it's the other companion who's tagging along who gets into trouble. This right here is where Jar Jar was make or break, and mainly why he doesn't work. In my opinion, Jar Jar's presence does not positively impact the story. His antics do nothing to advance the plot, nor does he provide helpful or insightful commentary on the Jedi, the Republic, anything like that, which would be good for the audience. He's not even really some big connection to the Gungans. Well, he needed to be there to have them meet the Gungans and get them transport to the capital. Yeah, because it was written that way. Lucas could have just put them down right outside the city. One could also wonder, wait, why did they even land on the other side of the planet anyway? But I'm guessing they were securing some other major Naboo city. It's a big planet, I'm assuming they have lots of cities. Not very many people in them, but cities. More on that later. Now, Jar Jar is not pointless. As we've established, he's comic relief. And comic relief is a purpose. In Empire Strikes Back, 3PO served as comic relief without any other purpose in the story, and it worked really well. Jar Jar, however, does not. Comic relief needs to be handled delicately. Too much of it and everything becomes a farce. Or just frustrating. And that happens with Jar Jar. He shows up way, way too often and at the worst parts. Comic relief needs to be paced properly, there to relieve tension or provide levity to an otherwise serious situation. 3PO's form of comic relief is his snootiness. Someone who thinks way too highly of himself getting taken down a peg. Jar Jar is an idiot. His comic relief comes in the funny way he talks and in slapstick occurring because of his buffoonery. And again, that can work. There are plenty of Hollywood movies where the focus is on someone who's a complete moron for two hours. But again, too much, too quickly, and our heroes look absolutely incompetent when they bring him with them for no reason. He's an amphibious being that is going along on this quest to a desert city. As far as we have seen, he has no bartering skills. He's not particularly strong to act as muscle, nor is he technically inclined so as to have special knowledge for the equipment they need. So why is he there? I did love the Darth Jar Jar theory from a few years ago, but we know it's bullcrap. If that had been the plan, Lucas wouldn't have dialed him back in the following movies. He would have kept him in so he could retroactively go, see, that's why. Also, Lucas just isn't that great of a writer to think of it. Anyway, they make it to town where Jar Jar steps in some poop, I'm not even joking this time, and Qui-Gon says they'll try looking for the hyperdrive in one of the smaller dealers. They meet Watto, this weird mixture of a fly and a tapir, and his slave, some kid who I'm sure isn't important at all. Are you an angel? Did it hurt when you fell from heaven? He explains how he and his mom are slaves, and we get this weird panel of him with a purple glow around him and his mouth kind of hanging open. I don't get it. Anyway, Watto has the hyperdrive generator they need, but Qui-Gon says he only has Republic currency, which isn't any good out here. Credits will do fine. No, they won't. Uh. Credits will do fine. No, they won't. Uh. What, you think you're some kind of Jedi waving your hand around like that? I'm a Toydarian! Mind tricks don't work on me! Only money! Okay, how about lightsabers? Do you take lightsaber blades? No money, no parts, no deal. And no one else has a T-14 hyperdrive, I promise you that. Only because they use proprietary components. I bet there's a tutorial on Space YouTube to build a custom one. 
Okay, let's talk about Qui-Gon, because this right here is a big issue. As has been pointed out by others, he could just trade in their existing ship for money and get a smaller ship, or even just use Republic credits to hire someone to transport them to Coruscant. After all, smugglers, traders, and other people probably still do business in the Republic, and they should be happy to get that kind of money. This is a pretty big plot hole, and while I'm loath to just describe a movie as bad because of plot holes, this is a significantly bad one, because him not exploring these other solutions and needing to follow the actual scheme that happens makes up a good chunk of the movie. But hey, let's say for the sake of argument that they don't trust that they wouldn't be betrayed to the Federation and can't pursue that option. Option. We have a bigger issue with Qui-Gon here, and in turn, kind of a problem with the entire prequel trilogy. It is argued that one of the overarching points of the prequels is that there is an imbalance in the Force by the Jedi being in control, what with there being so many light side users and so few dark side users, that in turn, the story is about the fall of the Jedi because of their hubris, their growing inability to use the Force, and their willingness to compromise their morality during this time. This is best exemplified in Qui-Gon during parts of this movie. It's one thing to mind-trick bad guys so you can slip past them to serve the greater good, but Qui-Gon is perfectly willing to use his powers to get what he wants. He did it with Boss Nass, and he tried to do it with Watto, basically steal from him to get the parts he needs. He doesn't know anything about Watto. He doesn't know if he's just some guy trying to make a decent life for himself, but he's perfectly happy to steal from him. But hey, even if he knows he's an utter scumbag, why not just find some other scumbag on the streets to steal the money from who isn't immune to mind tricks and exchange the money? We'll talk some more about this later and throughout the rest of the prequel reviews, but yeah, Qui-Gon is not well written. Anyway, they decide to leave, with Watto telling Anakin he can leave after he cleans some racks. Yippee! Yeah, I would have love to have been on set when they filmed this scene so I could ask George Lucas why he thought this was a good decision. Qui-Gon contacts Obi-Wan and wonders if there's anything else they can trade for cash. A few containers of supplies. The Queen's wardrobe, maybe. I really hope the wardrobe was already on board the ship when they took it, because I'd hate to think they slowed down their escape so they could grab more ridiculous clothes for her to wear. Jar Jar, being ever helpful, decides to just randomly grab some alien frog to eat, but spits it out when the shopkeeper tells him he has to pay for that. It lands in the soup of Zabulba, a pod racer who gets ready to tear Jar Jar apart, but Anakin convinces him to leave it be. Nevertheless, the boy is right. You were heading into trouble. And no one would ever want bad things to happen to you, Jar Jar! A sandstorm starts brewing, and Anakin volunteers to bring our heroes to his home for safety, since they won't make it back to the ship in time. Mom! Mom, I'm home! These are my friends, Mom! I decided to invite total strangers into the house, Mom! Anakin brings R2 and Padme back to his room to show off the droid he's building. C-3PO. I just... I don't understand the logic of this. When did Lucas decide... Yeah, Darth Vader built C-3PO, that makes sense. Just... How is this an improvement? At best, it's fanficy, but most fanfics at least have some sort of reason to have these kind of goofy, illogical connections. Like, does this say something about 3PO's character? Or Anakin's? I'd say Anthony Daniels was just under contract to appear and he couldn't think of any other way of including 3PO in the story, but even I can come up with a few. He's a protocol droid. He could be in Amidala's court, too. Or maybe he's helping out the Queen at the Senate or something. Just, there are so many other ways they could have done it, but nope. Anakin built C-3PO for some reason! Whatever, back on the ship, the Queen's minister, or whoever, says that there's a massive death toll on the planet and that she needs to contact them as soon as possible. Naturally, Obi-Wan says to send no reply whatsoever, that it's bait to establish a trace on them. Is it a trick? Eh, kind of. Later, when we see Naboo, it looks like it's in pretty decent shape. People are just being held at gunpoint, but no signs of civilians or anything along those lines, and certainly none of them suffering. Her people apparently consist of her handmaidens, a few politicians, and some fighter pilots. Maybe all of Naboo is just one big, overly elaborate castle? Apparently, they were somehow able to get a trace, and Darth Maul is dispatched to Tatooine to get the Queen. At last, we will reveal ourselves to the Jedi. At last, we will have revenge. I'm not supposed to like to tell us what you're getting revenge for, huh? 
I mean, I know this is your only line in the entire movie, but... World building? History? Some insight into the Sith? Anyway, back at Anakin's place, he talks about how he is the only human who can do pod racing, a sport on the planet. You must have Jedi reflexes if you race pods. This makes me very sad for some reason. Anakin recognizes Qui-Gon as a Jedi after seeing his lightsaber. I had a dream I was a Jedi. I came back here and freed all the slaves. Have you come to free us? No, I'm afraid not. I think you have. Why else would you be here? Oh boy, uh, uh say, I, I heard you built a robot, kid. I'd love to see it and end this conversation immediately. They discuss the situation and Anakin's mother, Shmi. Yes, with our proud Skywalker family name, I shall name our daughter Shmi. Suggests that gambling is the weakness of traitors like Watto. Everyone bets on pod racing here, and Anakin has been secretly building a racer. Shmi doesn't want him to do it, and for once, Qui-Gon has the good sense to say no as well, not wanting to risk the kid's life. But Anakin's got this. Mom, you said that the biggest problem in the universe is no one helps each other. Yes, well, maybe when the Jedi come to help free the slaves, we can talk. No, apparently this is enough to convince her. No, there is no other way. I may not like it, but he can help you. He was meant to help you. I know this because shut up. Padme is against the plan and says the queen won't approve. The queen doesn't need to know. <laughs> Watto agrees to the race since Qui-Gon puts up their ship as collateral. The ship that belongs to the queen and not to him. If they lose, Watto gets the ship, but if they win, Watto can keep the money as long as Qui-Gon gets the hyperdrive. Later, Qui-Gon talks to Shmi about Anakin. He has special powers. He can see things before they happen. It is a Jedi trait. The Force is unusually strong with him. So let me postulate a different way this could have played out that would have filled that plot hole about Qui-Gon selling the ship and getting a smaller one or whatever. Picture this. Qui-Gon fails to exchange his Republic credits with Watto, but then he spots Anakin working in the yard. All of a sudden, a wall of junk behind Anakin is about to fall on him, but Qui-Gon sees Anakin not only anticipate this, but use the Force to push it back, purely on instinct. Anakin is clearly exhausted and overtaxed by this ordeal, but even at this young age, he's powerful with the Force, and, as Qui-Gon says, he can anticipate things before they happen. If he tries to bargain for another ship, or hire another ship, that means he gets away from Anakin, who he wants to take back to the Jedi. And thus, that becomes his character goal for this sequence, and easily fixes the plot hole. It helps show why he's going to ridiculous lengths for a ludicrous plan. He knows he can get Anakin out of this too, and doesn't want to risk coming back for him later. It also gives us a chance to actually see Anakin being strong with the Force like Qui-Gon suggests he is. We only know it because he says it, and let's face it, Qui-Gon has not exactly wowed us so far as such a great and noble Jedi. Credits will do fine indeed. Who was the father? There was no father. I can't explain what happened. Eh, nothing weird about that! Just space Jesus down in here! This episode is gonna be long enough as it is, so we'll get into the virgin birth thing when we get to Revenge of the Sith, but needless to say, it's just a dumb, unnecessary idea. The fact that Qui-Gon even asks bugs me. It's clearly meant as a way to try to establish if there was some Force user in his lineage, because that gets passed down. It's the divine right of King's bullcrap, implying he's special because of who his dad was. But whatever. She asks if there's any way he can help him, but he isn't sure. Later that evening, he takes a sample of his blood and sends it to Obi-Wan for examination. Specifically, a midi-chlorian count. The reading's off the chart. Over 10,000. Feel like I should be making an over 9,000 joke right now, as old a meme as it is. <sighs> oh well, might as well. It's over 9,000! Hey, wait! Is that a regular-ass microscope Obi-Wan's looking into? Darth Maul arrives and checks out the area with his space binoculars. The next day, on the cliffs above Mos Espa, a lone Sith Lord stands, observing the city below. Damn it to hell, there isn't a park and ride anywhere around here. At the race prep, Watto admits that he's bet all of his money on Sebulba to win, since Sebulba always wins, and Qui-Gon decides to take that bet. 
offering his pod against the freedom of Anakin and his mother if Sebulba wins or loses. Watto's willing to do it for one of them, but not both, using a die to determine which of the two it is. Naturally, Qui-Gon uses the Force to cheat, so it's Anakin. The race starts up, though despite the comic leaving out Sebulba sabotaging Anakin's racer, they do leave in it stalling at first in the starting gate. Since I'm not going to give a play-by-play -play of the race, let's talk about the movie's version of it. One of the things that a lot of people who hate The Phantom Menace will say is that even if they dislike the rest of the movie, that they still like the pod racing. This was common even when the movie was fresh. People loved the pod race scene. And I have to be contrarian because I do not. I'd be okay with it except for the fact that it is way, way too long. If we go by when Anakin actually gets going to when he wins the race, it's nine minutes. Longer if we include the surrounding bits. I have had episodes of this show shorter than the pod race scene. And I'm a colossal windbag in case you hadn't noticed by how long this episode is. It just goes on and on and on, and you only get music near the end. A race like this is supposed to be fast, intense, and exciting, but it just lasts so long it starts getting boring. You know, the original Death Star trench run in A New Hope actually had three attempts to shoot the torpedo into the exhaust port to help emphasize how desperate a plan this was. They cut it down to two trench runs because the pacing was awful. If they just cut the pod race in half, a good five minute sequence, I'd be fine. But nine to ten minutes? It's too much! The comic at least understands this, cuts it down to about three or four pages. Admittedly, that's probably a bit shorter than it needs to be, but it hits the highlights and keeps the excitement. Boom! Done! And yeah, Anakin wins. It's so wonderful, Annie. You have brought hope to those who have none. How? God, one panel he's all happy and excited, and the next he looks utterly depressed. What the hell, comic? The parts get delivered to the ship, but Qui-Gon has to head back to go pick up Anakin. Why do I sense we've picked up another pathetic life form? God, not even the other characters like Jar Jar. That's harsh. Qui-Gon gives Anakin some cash. These are yours. We sold the pod. Uh, I hope you asked the kid before you did that, since it was, you know... His pod. They let Anakin know he's been freed and he can come with them to become a Jedi. He's reluctant to leave his mom behind, and honestly, this is one of the better bits of this movie. It's only natural he wouldn't want to leave her. Although it's weird how apparently he can't, like, get some cash from the Republic or the Jedi that would work on this planet and then come back and buy her freedom. You'd think they'd be okay with that, especially with what happens later. He also says goodbye to 3PO. For whatever reason, he's leaving him behind. Don't know why he can't come along, but whatever. See you in the next movie, dude. The spy droids that Darth Maul sent out detect the Jedi, and he flies off in his Scooty Puff Jr. to intercept them first. There's a brief battle between Maul and Qui-Gon, forcing him to leap into the ship as they make their escape. Obi-Wan and Anakin formally meet. Hi, you're a Jedi too? Pleased to meet you. Well, strike me down. Pleased to meet you too. After a brief look at Naboo to confirm that the people are starving, it's been like two days max. Do none of these people have fridges? We have another good scene, this time to set up things between Anakin and Padme. Anakin is cold, not used to an environment that isn't a desert. Since Anakin's not sure if he'll ever see Padme again, he gives her a little necklace he carved for her. What does not work about this scene is that it's supposed to be helping set up the future romance between these characters. As the Weird Al parody pointed out, the age gap is iffy. From what I've heard, Lucas decided that Anakin should be this young because it was the age where the separation from his mother would impact him the most. If he was much older, it supposedly wouldn't affect him as much to be separated from her. I get the reasoning, but I personally disagree with this. Especially if, say, he knew she was still a slave. Even as a teenager, he should be close enough to her, given their situation, that all this would bother him. It also really confused me when I was a kid when later on they say Anakin is too old to begin the Jedi training. Training. And I'm just baffled. Sure, we see pretty young kids in Jedi training, but honestly it feels even more unbelievable that three to six year olds have the discipline for this stuff. Teenager? I can buy that as too old. This? This is nothing. 
They arrive at Coruscant. The entire planet is one big city, which just makes gridlock all the worse, I think. And they're met at a landing platform by Senator Palpatine and Chancellor Valorum. They're calling a special session of the Senate to hear about the invasion while Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan head to the Jedi Council. First priority for Amidala, though, shove a fan on her head and change clothes so she looks like a friggin' geisha. Palpatine says there's little chance of the Senate voting to intervene. That over time, the Republic has become a bunch of greedy, squabbling delegates and bureaucrats with no interest in the common good. The Chancellor has very little power to do anything. I'm the government. I'm the government. I'm the reason nothing works. Despite the Chancellor being their strongest supporter, Palpatine suggests calling for a vote of no confidence in Valorum to elect a new Chancellor who can push through support to stop the Federation. We cut over to the Jedi Temple, where Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan are being debriefed by the Jedi Council. There's too much happening here. My only conclusion can be that it was a Sith Lord. Impossible. The Sith have been extinct for a millennium. I mean, can you imagine an evil force returning in this franchise? They order Qui-Gon to stay with the Queen. We will use all our resources here to unravel this mystery. We will discover the identity of your attacker. And by that I mean we're gonna sit around in these comfy chairs and not actually do anything. It's one of the real benefits of being on the Council. Qui-Gon brings up Anakin and how he has the highest midichlorian concentration he's ever seen in a life form. In fact, believing that the midichlorians actually conceived him. Shmi said that they took her out to dinner first, went to the movies, had a really good time. You refer to the prophecy of the one who will bring balance to the Force. You believe it's this... Boy. This prophecy, which of course we never learn any details about, could have been extraordinarily useful in the later movies, but they don't use it and that kind of annoys me. We'll save that for one of the other episodes though. Instead, let's talk about another idea for how they could have done Anakin. As mentioned, there's that huge plot hole about not just selling their ship and getting another one, or booking passage on another ship. How about they go that route? but on board this smuggler's ship or whatever, make him a teenage stock boy or assistant. That way the age gap isn't as extreme. We see him as a cocky young kid with all this power. To supplement the pod race, you could have him be in a dangerous situation, either being pursued or chasing through an asteroid field or something, and he has to take the controls and pilot them to safety. That shows off that the kid has piloting skills as per Obi-Wan's, he was the best star pilot in the galaxy and all that, instead of what we get later. Anyway, Qui-Gon requests that the boy be tested, and they agree to do so. Speaking of, Anakin stops by the Queen's quarters to try to see Padme one last time before he goes off to the Jedi Temple and wanted to say goodbye, but the Queen says she's been sent off on an errand. No doubt to find some more hairspray to keep those Sailor Moon pigtails of hers up like that. And thus it's time for the Senate scene. Palpatine and Amidala have come to state their case concerning the invasion. The Trade Federation objects to this a couple of times, and okay, her latest outfit was already kind of silly, but why the hell did they need to add the high shoulders? Did Strife and the Batman from the Technus Imperative stop by and tell her, No! Make your shoulders really tall! It makes you intimidating! There. Sure glad I don't look stupid in this. Anyway, the Trade Federation representative says there's no proof of the allegations about invasion and that they need to send a commission to ascertain the truth. AKA caring more about the civility and rules of procedure than actually helping. As Palpatine points out, Valorum will concede to these demands. He asks Amidala if she'll defer her motion so they can send to someone to investigate. Uh, what about those two Jedi representatives who were there? The ones the Chancellor requested be sent? You can't say they've got a bias. They're not from Naboo and have no political stake in whoever wins. Or can they not come in because they were a secret? I will not defer. I have come before you to resolve this attack on our sovereignty now. I was not elected to watch my people suffer and die while you discuss this invasion in a committee. I was elected to be the most fabulous looking person on Naboo and damn it, I'm succeeding. She calls for a vote of no confidence and the rest of the Senate seems to agree with her. So a repeated criticism of this movie and the prequels overall is that it's too boring, too much talk, too much about train negotiations and long-winded tax debates and yeah, that's horse crap. That is not really a problem with this movie. There is one, 
one scene taking place in the Senate. It is two and a half minutes long in a two hour, 16 minute movie. It is by no means a good scene, most certainly, but it is not the end all be all descriptor of why these movies don't work. It exists to fulfill its purpose, establish that the Republic is not gonna help and to set up Palpatine's takeover of the Republic. We're not watching a Senate filibuster here. It's not an issue that the scene exists. But you know what? What doesn't work with this? The acting. And I don't just mean in the movie. It's a problem in the comic, too. Amidala is so stiff and lifeless. She's supposed to be angrily proclaiming that she's not gonna let this crap go, but she looks utterly bored. And I'm sorry, but the non-acting and lack of emotion is not helped by the fact that she looks like a clown! While the movies are unfairly maligned as being about trade negotiations and Senate debates, a lack of passion in this scene makes it come across like a boring procedural meeting on C-SPAN 3. Political intrigue in science fiction can work just fine. It can be interesting and engaging even for little kids because it's ultimately about friends and enemies and cunning maneuvers. As a reminder, we had almost 10 minutes of space NASCAR. These movies do not lack action scenes. It's just a scene we've been building up to to get Amidala here. The point of the first half of the movie instead just has Emmett Kelly calmly reciting the Gettysburg Address. Outside the council chambers, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan discuss Anakin. Obi-Wan doesn't think Anakin will pass the council's test. Do not defy the council, Master. Not again. I will do what I must, Obi-Wan. If you would just follow the code, you'd be on the council. They will not go along with you this time. Okay, and this dialogue right here is pretty much the indication of why Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan don't work in this story. We are told that Qui-Gon has this tendency to defy the Jedi Council, act independently of them, doing things the council would not approve of. That's a perfectly fine idea. Show that his decision to train Anakin is because of his own arrogance and independence. And he is arrogant. I joke with the Qui-Gon is wrong counter, but he does keep reiterating to Padme on Tatooine, I know what I'm doing, just shut up and do what I say. That would actually fit more in with Qui-Gon's less than moral attitude of attempted theft and mind control, but that attitude is never called out and Liam Neeson's performance is not as a reckless, arrogant, morally questionable figure, but as a wise, stoic, seasoned master. It feels like him and Obi-Wan should be reversed. Obi-Wan questions questions Qui-Gon all the time and is the one concerned about the council's approval, as if he was Qui-Gon's little brother worried about their parents finding out about something bad they did. And indeed, they changed the characterization of Obi-Wan in the later prequels so that he's more ready to fly off the handle and clearly not ready to train someone. So it seems like they took that lesson to heart, but it doesn't fix the fact that in this movie, the two are written so badly. Anyway, the test. They leave out him using the Force to psychically ascertain what's on the display screen, though Mace Windu, aka Samuel L. Jackson, is still holding it, and go straight to Yoda's fear speech. Afraid, are you? No, sir. Your thoughts dwell on your mother. I miss her. Afraid to lose her, I think. If a Jedi you were, never would you be afraid of losing loved ones. Messed up, that isn't at all! Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. He's not entirely wrong, but anger also can lead to drive and dedication. Fear can lead to preparation and bravery. I don't know, I get how it can lead to the dark side, but it feels like friggin' Green Lanterns have a better grasp of this stuff. Over to Jar Jar and Amidala, they talk about their worries for what'll happen to the Gungans. This scene right here is what we needed more of from Jar Jar. He's more dignified, he's more serious. Sure, his weird way of speaking undermines it a bit, but he actually makes an interesting point. Gungans no die without a fight. We so warriors. We so got a grand army. That why you no liking us, methinks. It's a subtler bit that I don't think anyone ever caught on to. The Naboo apparently don't have a standing army of their own. Is their conflict based around fear that the Gungans will be the aggressors in a war? 
It'd be interesting if this was explored more, but instead it seems to be more of an epiphany moment for Amidala, that she has to actually fight back and not hope for more peaceful means of settling this conflict. Though if it is, it's really underplayed. And again, it's a moment with Jar Jar where he's not being an embarrassment. This is what we needed more of in the movie. Less straight-up comic relief, maybe even more moments of insight, but whatever. Palpatine returns and informs them that he's been nominated to be the new Chancellor. He's confident that he'll be elected and that they'll finally resolve this situation. However, Amidala has decided to go back to Naboo to help free it. Palpatine objects, wanting her to stay safe, but she's adamant. So another big criticism of the movie is that Palpatine's plan makes no sense. Engineering a conflict to become Chancellor is fine, but that some of his actions don't agree with that, like ordering the Viceroy to kill the Jedi instead of just letting them go and tell the Senate what's happening. I don't agree with this criticism. To me, Palpatine is playing both sides against the middle. Acting as Darth Sidious, he has control over the Trade Federation and can exploit the planet. If the Trade Federation is successful in killing the Jedi and forcing the Queen to sign the treaty, he rules the planet and can springboard that to more opportunities down the line. If the Jedi get away, he can take advantage of that to push towards becoming the Supreme Chancellor and get even more power, but it also has the potential to look opportunistic and paint a larger target on his back. Hell, having Darth Maul succeed and get the Queen after she got away would still work. He could argue for defending Naboo, do the vote of no confidence without the Queen here, and retain power over Naboo and the Senate, and make it seem like, oh yeah, I totally resolved that situation on Naboo, no problem, while of course doing nothing. Palpatine is a manipulator and opportunist. He can get around bumps that occur in his plans. This is expanded universe stuff, but part of the Sith philosophy is to always operate from a position of strength. Being able to change your plans on the fly to amass more power is a necessary skill for someone like Palpatine. It doesn't matter if the Trade Federation succeeds or not. He's gonna come out winning regardless. Also, after the Senate session, apparently Amidala decided to switch into her Centauri from Babylon 5 cosplay with this hair. Back to the Jedi Council, they elect not to train Anakin despite his strength in the Force because of him being too old. Okay, even if I bought the nine years old is too old to learn crap, what do you propose to do instead? By your own admission, he's strong with the Force. Do you want the Sith to end up recruiting him? Or for him to try to learn to choke people on his own? Qui-Gon says he'll take on Anakin as his apprentice regardless, saying Obi-Wan is ready to face the trials to become a fully-fledged Jedi Knight. However, they decide to table this discussion for now so that they can go with Amidala back to Naboo to protect her and hopefully draw out the Sith attacker. I'm guessing the reason they don't send, like, a dozen more Jedi as backup is because Maul could probably sense that many Jedi in one place and elect not to reveal himself. Later, Obi-Wan still objects to this, saying that the Council can all sense Anakin's dangerous, but Qui-Gon is convinced that his fate is uncertain, indicating that he might sense it too, but believes he can steer him on the right path. Qui-Gon, sir, I don't want to be a problem. You won't be any. I'm not allowed to train you, so I want you to watch me and be mindful. Okay, training or no training, maybe don't bring the nine-year-old into a war zone? Anakin asks the million-dollar question that he had overheard from Yoda. What the hell are midichlorians? Midichlorians are a microscopic life form that resides within all living cells and communicates with the Force. They live inside of me? Yes, in your cells. We are symbionts with them, life forms living together for mutual advantage. Without the midichlorians, life could not exist, and we would have no knowledge of the Force. They continually speak to us, telling us the will of the Force. The midichlorians are a stupid, unnecessary addition. The big criticism of them claims that they provide a scientific explanation of the Force, but that's not accurate. What they do is overcomplicate the Force. The Force suddenly has an extra step to it. When a Jedi meditates or tries to feel the Force, they're not actually communing with the Force or accessing it. They're telepathically talking to bacteria who do the talking for the Force. Midichlorians aren't a scientific explanation for the Force. They're the frickin' Lorax! I'm the midichlorian! I speak for the Force! Why can't life exist without midichlorians? And why did you need them to learn about the Force? Are the midichlorians the ones lifting rocks? Or seeing the future? Is it just the midichlorians sending you images of it? How does this account for the dark side or the light side? Are there good midichlorians and bad midichlorians? 
If there are thousands of them in one body, how do you get them to agree on something when they're all just trying to talk to the person they're inside of? Why do they even want to talk to the Jedi or the Sith? It just raises too many questions. The midichlorians are an asinine, unnecessary addition to how this works. Made no better by the implication that you're special if you have more of them in you for some reason. Anyway, on their way back, Qui-Gon asks what exactly the Queen hopes to accomplish by returning, since they won't have an army, and the Jedi probably won't be able to take down tanks. Now, if they only had battle droids, oh hell yeah, this war would be over by lunchtime. As such, she needs Jar Jar's help to contact the Gungans. Once they arrive, the comic solves a plot hole from the movie by just making the enemy stupid. When they left, there was that whole blockade, but it's gone now. In the comic, they say it's because with the invasion over, there's no need for a blockade. Except, of course, people can still escape, still send other forces in, like, say, a commando unit of Jedi and the Naboo leadership. If Palpatine did want her recaptured, having a big-ass blockade would certainly be a way to grab her or shoot her down. Hell, just shooting her down would be a smart move on Palpatine's part. Make her into a martyr. They land their ship in the swamps near the Gungan City. Do you think the Queen will be successful? I don't know, but we mustn't use our powers to influence the Gungans. We can only use them to steal boats, as it says in the Jedi Code. Jar Jar returns from the city and says the whole place was deserted. Looked like a fight. However, he knows where the Gungans usually go if there's trouble, leading them to some ruins. The Gungans are indeed there, and Boss Nass doesn't want to hear them out, but Amidala still offers an alliance. Until Padme speaks up. Padme reveals that she is Queen Amidala. The lady who we've been thinking is her is actually her decoy. Well, points for that. Everyone does pay attention to her whenever she's in the room. I do love how Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan in the background exchange looks like, seriously? How the hell did we not sense that? Padme humbles herself before Boss Nass, having everyone bow to him and making it clear they need his help and will do what they need to to secure it. This is, sadly, another missed opportunity for Jar Jar as a character. We could have had him be the bridge between the two cultures. Maybe have him reveal Padme as the true queen. Like, he had some insight or was a skilled observer who figured it out before anyone else did. But no. Instead, we just have Boss Nass declaring Jar Jar to be a general of their forces while claiming that he brought them together. This is also in spite of the fact that Jar Jar was exiled for being clumsy, and you want to give him command over troops? Again, this could have been an arc for Jar Jar. Maybe he's clumsy and slapsticky to start off with, but then he sees his own people getting killed and tortured, and he takes a level in badass. Or he's some savant in military strategy, but never had the opportunity until now to show it off. They make contact with the resistance groups on the planet. It's not a lot, but it should be enough. The plan is to lure the droid army defending the capital away to fight the approaching Gungan army, while Padme and her forces sneak into the city through hidden passageways. The goal is to capture the Viceroy. Supposedly, without his leadership, the droids will be lost and confused, but I think it's more likely that they're playing off a remark made at the beginning of the movie, that the Trade Federation is normally very cowardly. As such, if they capture him, they can probably force him to surrender the invasion if they threaten his life. However, if they fail to reach him, they have another part of the plan. Use the few pilots they have to take some Naboo starfighters in the palace hangar bays and send them up to destroy the droid control ship in orbit. Take that out, the droids will die on their own. Seems like a really crappy design flaw for these things, especially since you live in a world with droids acting independently all the time. But then again, these battle droids have proven to be as effective as poking a rock with a fork. I mean, for crying out loud, the only reason they've succeeded as well as they have so far is because the Naboo put up no resistance to their invasion. Anyway, the Viceroy takes the bait and orders his forces to attack the mobilizing army. Some have criticized why he'd fall for such an obvious ploy, but chances are he thinks his skeleton defense is enough to hold off a small force, and even then doesn't know about the hidden tunnels under the city. In addition, if the Trade Federation really are cowardly, he wouldn't want there to be a big battle in the place he's currently occupying. Hell, why risk destroying the city? He sees the Gungans as primitives and his battle droids expendable fodder. And thus the battle begins, with the Gungans having shielding technology that protects them from the artillery of the Federation tanks, but not the battle droids attacking with small arms. The force at the palace gets in, and yet again they bring Anakin along with them. Congratulations! This plan goes to hell, and you either get a little kid killed, or you hand the chosen one over to the enemy to be shaped into a bad guy! God, you suck, Qui-Gon! Anakin goes into a spare fighter to avoid the shooting. 
Anakin, stay where you are. You're safe there. As the Naboo starfighters fly up, Darth Maul intercepts Amidala's force. And here's where the comic starts having some issues as an adaptation. Up until now, it's actually been pretty dang good. Doing a lot, effectively slashing a few minor bits of dialogue here or there just to speed things along. But now with four simultaneous bits in the climax it has to cover, corners are being cut. For instance, the big reveal of Darth Maul's double-bladed lightsaber it gets covered up by a reaction shot of Qui-Gon. Some might say, well, everyone who knows about the movie already knows about it. But if that's the case, why even bother translating the story into comic form at all? You might as well just have stills from the movie with text next to them. While Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan decide to engage Darth Maul, some droidicas are unleashed on the rest of the commandos. Realizing they need help, Anakin uses the blasters on the starfighter he's in to break through their shields and destroy them. Wizards! That's cool! Sorcerers! That's a terrible line! Unfortunately, since he's unfamiliar with the starfighter's controls, he accidentally engages the autopilot and sends him into orbit to join the rest of them. The droid fighters soon begin shooting at him, too. This is really where the worst of Anakin's lines come from, and there's no saving any of this dialogue, even with a seasoned actor. Woo, boy, this is tense! If we tell the audience it is, surely they'll believe us! Strangely, the part of the finale that gets trimmed down the most here is the fight with Darth Maul. And that's really weird, since one of the things that everyone seems to love about this movie is that fight. Me personally, I'm not as into it. I hate how acrobatic and ninja-like the Jedi are in the prequels. It stops being a sword fight and turns into a big dance routine. The only thing that makes it epic or exciting is Duel of the Fates, which... Okay, if there's one thing we can all agree on when it comes to all of Star Wars, it's that the music is freaking awesome! Personally, I prefer lightsaber fights where we have a more personal connection with the characters, where they're really displaying their emotions. I don't need them doing fancy telekinetic tricks or jumping around everywhere to be impressive. And unfortunately, the movie doesn't have that. Qui-Gon is emotionless throughout the fight, and as established, he's just a black character for me. We've barely spent any time with Obi-Wan throughout the film, and Maul has one line of dialogue in it, two extras in the comic. I just don't care enough about it. Although, while I'm not big on the movie's version of this fight, I do admit the choreography is still a spectacle. The comics is not. I've said this before, but there's been a serious downgrade in comic book fight scenes in the last 20 years. Not just in this adaptation, but in superhero books too, where it's just random stills of a battle rather than sequential storytelling of a fight. It's the same here and does a disservice to the movie. I will say there is a bit of the fight that I do like that the comic kind of butchers. There's a moment where the three characters are separated from one another by some force fields. Realizing they can't get to each other, Qui-Gon immediately sits down to start meditating, while Obi-Wan is in the back worried, and Darth Maul seethes and paces impatiently. No dialogue is spoken during this bit, and yet illustrates character and philosophy brilliantly by just their body language. Qui-Gon is a seasoned master of the Jedi and the Jedi philosophy is peace, contemplation, defense. There's no reason he needs to have his lightsaber out, so he turns it off and calmly waits. He is at peace with the Force. Obi-Wan isn't experienced. He's young and still emotional, so he's worried about his master having to fight a Sith Lord single-handedly, so he's standing and anxious. The Sith philosophy emphasizes operating from a position of strength and anger. He's trying to intimidate Qui-Gon, while also clearly annoyed that he can't slice up this Jedi that he he hates. It's a wonderful bit of visual storytelling in a film that desperately needs more like it. And the comic reduces it to one panel. Qui-Gon doesn't have his lightsaber put away. In fact, it looks like he's about to accidentally cut into his own leg. We can't see Obi-Wan. And the force field looks like two energy beams that you could just duck under and continue the fight. Maybe that's why he still has his lightsaber out. He knows Maul can just reach under there and poke him with his if he doesn't. We arrive at the moment where everything seems to go wrong. Padme's group is captured, the Gungans are overwhelmed, and Anakin's starfighter crashes inside the hangar of the droid control ship. You'd think there'd be a force field or something to prevent, like, stray debris or blasts from the fight going in like that. And of course, the most important part, Qui-Gon getting stabbed. 
Things start turning around, though as a distraction from the decoy Amidala, wearing her warrior makeup and giant tam shanter allows Padme to overtake the guards and hold the Viceroy at gunpoint. Obi-Wan rushes in to fight Darth Maul, even managing to slice his double-bladed saber in half, though it still functions. Wait, it still works after being cut in half? Is a double-bladed lightsaber just two regular lightsabers glued together? Obi-Wan gets kicked into one of those giant pits without safety railings that are just all over the place in Star Wars, and loses his saber in the process. Back on the droid control ship, Anakin manages to shoot torpedoes out into the ship, apparently reaching the reactor. This is another bit that's criticized about the film, this child taking out the entire droid control ship on his own. Honestly, the idea of young Anakin destroying it could have worked. But having him be excited and happy and saying things like, I'll try spinning, that's a good trick, it's bad. I wouldn't even say it's childish, it's just not how humans say things. You want to actually make me invested in this scene? Make him panicked. This is a child in the middle of a space battle. Show him looking all around him and just barely surviving, getting some lucky shots off. Keep his dialogue to a minimum beyond, oh god, oh god, oh god. And then, when he wins the day and lands, you have someone come up to him and tell him, Anakin, that was amazing! You're the chosen one! And suddenly there's this gleam in his eye, this slow smile across his face as those words etch into his memory that he is the chosen one and can do no wrong. Or, you know, just have him yell, now this is pod racing! Whoopee! Back in the fight with Obi-Wan, he uses the Force to grab Qui-Gon's saber, which in the comic has a nice shot where the saber goes over Maul's shoulder, and he leaps up and slices Maul in half. Jeez, all I asked for was a little off the top. <laughs> so, like, Maul ends up surviving this in spinoff media. Do they ever, like, explain how? Because between this and a bunch of other Star Wars stories, I'm beginning to suspect that bottomless holes are actually Lazarus pits. Qui-Gon dies, his final words asking Obi-Wan to train Anakin. With the droid army disabled, the Viceroy is shipped off to explain his actions to the Senate. I think you can kiss your trade franchise goodbye. Yep, really makes all those people starving to death worth it. After Palpatine returns to Naboo, having successfully been elected Chancellor, they hold a funeral for Qui-Gon. And the comic put the scenes out of order. Yoda is supposed to convey Obi-Wan the rank of Jedi Knight and state that the Council has approved his request to train Anakin while giving his own concerns about it, but they put that after the funeral in the comic instead of before. So Obi-Wan tells Anakin in the comic that the Council has given their approval to train him, before they actually do so. Speaking of, the funeral is a scene that the Phantom Menace actually did right. A good sequence. And once again, comic screwed it up. Off to the side, Yoda and Mace Windu discuss the fact that clearly the guy who fought Qui-Gon was a Sith, and they speculate about whether this guy was the Master or the Apprentice, because the Sith in this era only operate with two at a time. In the movie, it cuts over in a panning shot to Palpatine, as the score has an undertone of menace about him. That is honestly a really good shot, and a good moment in the movie, and the comic leaves that out, just as the dialogue. It's fine, it's just once again a shame that the comic is leaving out some actual good parts. And so our comic ends with a splash page showing the big parade and celebration of peace between the Gungans and Naboo. Though weirdly, instead of Boss Nass being presented with the sacred plasma ball, or whatever the hell that thing was, it's Obi-Wan, Anakin, and Jar Jar approaching the Naboo leadership. Huh, I guess in the comic version, there is no peace between these two peoples. Can't wait for that to be followed up on in Episode 2's comic. Anyway, I still think the movie is bad, but the comic adaptation, as an adaptation, is actually pretty damn good. In rewatching the movie for the review, I'll say this. It's not unbearable. It's still quotable, still enjoyable, depending on what you're looking for. But the effects are still a major issue in a lot of scenes. Jar Jar in particular has a very uncanny valley thing going for his movements when walking alongside the real people. I actually found him much more distracting than the Yoda puppet that everyone seems to hate. I don't. I much prefer it to the CG version used in later cuts of the film. Ironically, I'd actually welcome an update to the effects there. Marvel has shown that you can have characters like Thanos and the Hulk 
standing alongside real people and seeming fine. So a version with better effects for Jar Jar and the Gungans would be pretty cool. Even if I don't like the overall product. The dialogue is still awkward as hell in a lot of spots, not helped by very low-key performances where no one is being told how to act or emote like they should be. Personally, I feel that The Phantom Menace is the weakest of the three prequel films. It does set up a lot of stuff. The Senate, Palpatine's takeover as Chancellor, the titular menace that is a phantom since they don't know exactly what it is, Obi-Wan and Anakin, but the story stakes don't feel as high as they should be. And many people have pointed out that despite all that setup, you could honestly start straight from episode two and not really miss anything important. In some ways, it being better to do that, because then you don't have the awkwardness of knowing that Padme and Anakin met when she was a teenager and he wasn't even ten yet. Hey, wait, why did they elect a teenager as queen? As for the comic, I don't know if I'd call it better than the movie, but it doesn't really cut much out that's important. Sure, they shortened the pod race scene, but the climax is preserved in its most important elements, even if it's rushed through. The artwork, despite a few standard hiccups, is pretty good, and any adaptation that's able to capture so much of the story without feeling bogged down should be commended. Really, its problems are that in trying to recapture so much of the film, it replicates some of the same problems. The flat emotions of the characters and a lack of interesting dialogue, but that's less the comic's fault than probably a mandate to copy the film exactly. Next time, Star Wars Prequels Month continues with Solo! Of course it doesn't. Attack of the Clones is next. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Star Wars Prequels Month continues! Without the cloak. Yeah, I was trying to go for the cloak and cape thing like I did for the The Star Wars reviews, but it really wasn't working with the blue outfit. Maybe it'll be better whenever the hell I get back to that series. Instead, oversized jacket again. So here's going to be an unpopular opinion. In terms of actual story, as in the actual narrative and how things progress, Attack of the Clones is probably the best of the prequels. Now, before you get ready to scream at me, let me be clear here. I don't mean that this is the best movie, the most entertaining, or the movie I'd rewatch the most. This thing still sucks, and it's understandable why a lot of people were telling me last week that they think this one is the worst. For me, in terms of enjoyable movies for the prequel trilogy, ones that I'm more willing to return to, Revenge of the Sith wins hands down. I'll of course explain why next time, but here's why I think Attack of the Clones' story works best. There are two main plots, we mostly care about the protagonists of those plots, they have a narrative arc to them that eventually brings both back together, and despite some loose ends and clear setup for the final movie in the trilogy, it feels like a mostly complete film as a result. Although let's be clear, here. The dialogue is still terrible, there are still a lot of dumb and confusing creative choices, and while the acting is vastly improved over The Phantom Menace, it's still not exactly anything Oscar-worthy. But will the comic adaptation improve even more upon it? Or just have even more incredibly goofy bits than in the film? Well, let's dig into Star Wars Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, the official comic adaptation, and find out. I could have sworn I had a physical copy of this thing donated by a fan, but for the life of me, I can't find it. Let's just assume that it became one with the Force at some point. But it was a trade, and once more, four issues, so we'll skip the covers once again. All I'll say about the covers of any of these prequel comics is that most of them are gorgeous, attempting to replicate a Drew Struzan-esque painting for them, and in some cases, just replicating a scene from the movie. Good stuff. Otherwise, weirdly, when Disney absorbed Star Wars, they actually reprinted all these comics. Originally, they were published by Dark Horse, who held the Star Wars license for the longest time, and weirdly labeled them as part of the Legends continuity a.k.a. the old Expanded Universe. I know I commented on the idea of releasing an updated effects version of Episode 1 last week, but I do laugh about the idea of Disney basically just redoing the prequels in their own way. Basically, remakes like any other remake. And here's another weird thing with this comic versus pretty much any other Star Wars movie comic we've covered. It doesn't have an opening crawl page. Yeah, seriously, they integrated the crawl as narration in the opening text boxes. This isn't a complaint, it's actually an efficient use of space, it's just... 
bizarre that we don't have it. Anyway, let's check up on the state of things. There is unrest in the Galactic Senate. Their floating disk platform things keep spinning too fast, and no one wants to spend the money to fix them. Several thousand solar systems have declared their intentions to leave the Republic. This separatist movement, under the leadership of Count Dooku... Okay, this has been a lesser issue that now comes to the forefront because this is a major character. Lucas's naming conventions can be really silly sounding. And I know, I know, the original trilogy is full of this stuff too. Lest we forget the beloved X-Wing pilot, Porkins. But it feels like the prequels kind of dialed that up to 11. Names like Naboo, Dooku, Kit Fisto, Shmi, Zoop Florba, Panaka, Bibble, Depa Bilaba. One of those names I actually made up, but I guarantee you, unless you're more entrenched in Star Wars Expanded Universe stuff, you don't know which one it was. And admittedly, one of the reasons why that is is because most of those names are not actually said on screen. It's just that the Star Wars Encyclopedia needs to justify being four volumes, each one longer than Les Miserables. But then we have Count Dooku, which, yes, I know that it was explained that it comes from the Japanese word for poison, Doku. That sounds fine, but in English, it's a name that can easily be made fun of by calling him Count Dookie, aka Count Poop. I also heard a rumor back in the day that some of these names were suggested by Lucas's kids, which is cute and all, but it doesn't make it less stupid, it just confirms that they are, in fact, childish. I'm just saying, you could have just made it into Count Dukun, or Dukar, or something, and it would have worked much better. Oh god, that diversion was like half a page long. This is why these episodes are like an hour and a half, by the way. My Star Wars name is Link Won't Shut Up. Anyway, Count Dooku's little threat of civil war in the Republic is forcing it to have a critical vote on whether the Republic should form its own army to assist the Jedi, who, while they act as peacekeepers in the Republic, are unable to fight a war due to their lower numbers. Padme Amidala is no longer queen, but now the senator of Naboo. Some people last time were confused about how the hell the Naboo's leadership worked, because... Well, you don't vote for kings? It seems pretty clear that Naboo is not a traditional monarchy. The title of queen, presumably they could have a king to either through existing marriage or if a guy was elected, is more akin to a president, just retaining the name. It's possible that Naboo was once a standard monarchy, but changed through time into a democracy, and the moniker of queen is just retained because of tradition. Of course, I can only speculate about that because it's not explained in the movie. Now I'm just wondering if the new queen is also somehow a friggin' teenager. And by the way, this is a much better opening crawl than last time. It sets up the current state of the galaxy for us in very simple terms, and sets up a major plot thread in the film, while also bringing us into focus on Amidala as we start things off. Her ship lands on Coruscant and she exits, her security chief commenting on some worries he had had. We made it. I guess I was wrong. And then her ship blows up. Okay, but to be fair, we did still make it. I was expecting us to blow up in space, so I'm still in the clear here. However, while Padme's not the queen anymore, decoys are still all the rage, as Padme was actually disguised as one of the security personnel. Instead, it's a woman named Corday who was hit by the blast. I'm not sure I... I've failed you, Senator. I mean, your job was as a decoy. I, I think you did a bang-up job at it. Uh... 10% raise? Sadly, Padme's longtime friend Corday passes away in her arms. No! 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 Not Corday! She was such a beloved character! Remember when she. Uh. Dramatic flashback, you got anything? Yeah, sure, we'll go with that. We'll come back to this opener in a bit, because I think it's... lacking. We get a scene that wasn't in the movie, although only told through narration over images. Palpatine reporting Padme's assassination, which gets many senators riled up to demand the formation of an army to confront the Separatists, while others prefer a more peaceful settlement. Fortunately, Padme shows up and argues against creating an army, since it will just invite a war with the Separatists. She also says that the attack wasn't against her personally, but her opposition to the army. Like last time, Sidious's plan seems to be to play both sides against the middle, and and come out on top with more power regardless. But the assassination plot's part in all this is a bit more head-tilting. See, the assumption is that the Separatists are behind the assassination attempt, 
Except why is the assumption that the Separatists would want to kill her? As Padme points out, the assassination is about stopping her opposition to a Republic army. Wouldn't the Separatists want her to keep arguing against it? As we'll see, the Separatists have the Trade Federation and their vastly improved Battle Droid Army on their side. If the Republic voted against the Army, they'd have the tactical advantage. It makes no sense to assassinate Padme if they wanted to keep the Republic from having an army. Now, the assassination makes sense from Sidious's perspective, of course. As we just saw in the comic, her assassination could be a rallying cry for vengeance in her name, but if the assassination fails, then the Separatists gain power and can overtake the Republic. Either way, he wins. It's just in-universe when they don't know who's the puppet master here. Why would they assume the Separatists would take out someone who's helpful to their cause? It'd be like Hitler trying to assassinate assassinate Neville Chamberlain right after the Munich Agreement. It requires the Separatists to be so stupid as to be like, Sure, we want war, but only if we were fighting fair here. Marcus of Queensbury rules and all that. As the bureaucrats bicker about procedure, the vote is delayed until the following day. Well, yeah, there are like 10 subcommittees that need to be formed when someone who's declared dead shows up to debate. Now, the assassination's explanation will make sense later, but it actually has nothing to do with her position on the army. Anyway, later Palpatine meets with the Jedi Council, saying he's hoping his negotiations with the Separatists will be successful. Though even Mace Windu seems to suggest that an army is in their best interests, since there aren't enough Jedi to protect the Republic public in a war. Padme and her entourage arrive for their own meeting with Palpatine, seeing the Jedi on the way out. Padme, your tragedy on the landing platform, terrible. Greatest of all of us, Corday was. Many statues in her honor will be built. Seeing you alive brings warm feelings to my heart. Uh, something about that line just feels super awkward. I can't explain it. There's nothing actually wrong with it. It's just, it seems weird coming out of Yoda, I think. She asks if the Jedi have any idea who is behind the assassination attempt. Our intelligence points to disgruntled spice miners on the moons of Naboo. Intelligence for the Jedi Council basically means we googled who doesn't like Padme, and that came up third or fourth in the results. I don't wish to disagree, but I think that Count Dooku was behind it. Then why did you ask? The Council doesn't think it was him. You know, milady, Count Dooku was once a Jedi. He wouldn't assassinate anyone. It's not in his character. Yeah, but you just unintentionally pointed out the big issue with that. He's not a Jedi anymore. Since Padme's still in danger, Palpatine suggests assigning a Jedi to help with security, specifically suggesting Obi-Wan Kenobi since it's someone she knows. Palpatine's the type who has plans within plans, so of course I'm inclined to believe he's more into getting Anakin close to her. It's been 10 years since The Phantom Menace, and in that time, Palpatine and Anakin have become closer, so he probably knows about his attraction to her and is hoping to use that to his advantage. The comic cuts out the elevator scene between Anakin and Obi-Wan, where we first meet him, now played by Hayden Christensen. Christensen gets a lot of flack for his performance in this and Revenge of the Sith. I don't think to the same extremes Jake Lloyd and Ahmed Best did, though I could be wrong there. It was still pretty harsh against him though, so once again, I reiterate, I have no problem with any of the actors in this. He's doing the best he can with the material, it's just the lines they have him do are just... Eh. But yeah, they leave out the elevator scene that establishes the relationship between him and Obi-Wan. I haven't felt you this tense since, since we fell into that nest of gundarks. Thank the midichlorians that I'm an expert in force shoulder massage. Once they're out of the elevators, they also cut out one of Jar Jar's small appearances here that shows he's now the junior senator from Naboo. I may not like his accent, but I'll give the movie this. Jar Jar's still a better speaker than a lot of real-life politicians I could name. Instead, they skip over that to Obi-Wan and Anakin greeting Padme and- Gah! Criminy, what the hell is this expression that Anakin is giving here? You people bring matches for Mikey? Yeah, this right here is where a lot of people start hating Attack of the Clones. The romance between Anakin and Padme, and it does not start off well. The comic changes the dialogue a bit, so it's slightly less bad, but it's still bad. My goodness, you've grown. So have you. Grown more beautiful, I mean. And much shorter. For a senator, I mean. Don't worry, Annie, just keep digging that hole. She'll be taller again soon enough. Oh, Annie, you'll always be that little boy I knew on Tatooine. Yeah, and that's kind of the problem. I sort of misspoke last week. A five-year age gap isn't so bad. It's the fact that he could barely be considered a preteen while she was a teenager when they met and set up their future romance. It just comes across as weird. 
And yeah, his little compliment slash flirtation is really awkward and uncomfortable, and the preceding argument does not help. So like I said earlier, I felt that the opening scene was a bit lacking. It's fine, it's not bad, but especially when it's an assassination attempt, it feels like it needed... something. A stronger action-y start to it. I think you can make it stronger and establish Anakin and the romance better. Bear in mind that Anakin is supposed to be super good at the Force. They keep telling us that in these movies, that he's so impressive and powerful and stuff, but his reintroduction here is just him being a teenager who's gonna wet himself over having to say hi to his crush. So let's start with the bomb on her ship. But instead of just having the ship explode, suddenly Jango Fett appears with some mercenaries to continue the attempt. They get close to killing Padme, when BOOM! Anakin shows up and directly saves her from a mercenary. The Jedi were sent here to escort her to the Senate. He turns around and reintroduces himself to her, and she's all impressed and smitten as he acts charming and likable. He can't stay and talk because they have to chase after Jango as he flies away. We get a quick fight scene, you can establish Anakin and Padme being into each other right out of the starting gate, and make a good first impression of him as a skilled Jedi. Rather than our actual first impression of him shifting around around in an elevator with Obi-Wan being all, Hey, remember that one time that was much more exciting than this? Good times. Anakin wants to investigate who it is who's trying to kill her, but Obi-Wan reminds him that they're here as guards, not to start an investigation. Obi-Wan proceeds to spend the rest of the movie investigating. I kid, while there is a bit of an iffy scene in a bit, he doesn't really start investigating until he's ordered to by the council later. Anyway, the scene is more about setting up conflict and tension between the two. Anakin's just overly enthusiastic about helping her because he's been crushing on her. Even admits to Obi-Wan how heartbroken he is that he spent every day of the last ten years thinking about her while she didn't even recognize him. Well, to be fair, you are played by a different actor. That can throw anybody off. Later, we meet Jango Fett, a bounty hunter who's meeting with the actual assassin, Zam Wiesel. I'm beginning to suspect that Zap Rousdower actually escaped from the Star Wars universe. Anyway, he says their client is getting impatient and they're gonna try a subtler approach this time, handing her, as the narration calls them, a pair of deadly cohoons, aka poisonous giant centipede things. We get another scene not in the movie, with Mace Windu and Yoda discussing something. This is a scene that should have been in the movie, given the overarching Jedi are weakening slash corrupting idea, but with a slight tweaking in dialogue. Why couldn't we see this attack on the Senator? Masking the future is this disturbance in the Force. Prophecy is coming true. The dark side is growing. And only those who have turned to the dark side can sense the possibilities of the future. It's been ten years, and the Sith still have yet to show themselves. This has been our most intense game of hide-and-seek ever. Back at Padme's place, Obi-Wan and Anakin discuss how Padme is using herself as bait to try to lure the assassin in and trap them. R2 is in the room as an early warning system, and Anakin is trying to sense everything going on in the room. Zam, meanwhile, loads up an assassin droid with the bugs and sends it off to the apartment. While they talk, Anakin tells Obi-Wan that he's been having disconcerting dreams of his mother lately. Dreams pass in time. I'd rather dream of Padme. Ew, we don't want to hear what you do with your lightsaber, Annie! Just being around her again is intoxicating. Ugh, that face is not helping. Obi-Wan reminds him that his commitment to the Jedi Order supersedes his horniness. And don't forget she's a politician. They're not to be trusted. It's been my experience that senators are only focused on pleasing those who fund their campaigns. And they forget the niceties of democracy to get those funds. <sighs> eh, pretty much. As the bugs are let in, they both sense them just as they get close to Padme, rushing in and slicing them very quickly. Look, I don't think they'll be able to get burnt bug guts out of those sheets. Obi-Wan, spotting the assassin droid, leaps out the window at it. As I said last time, they seem to give Obi-Wan more impulsive traits after Phantom Menace, and this is the biggest example of it. While some have criticized this, since it seems more like something Anakin would do, the thing is that even Obi-Wan's ghost told Yoda and Empire that he was a bit reckless in his youth. Mind you, I'm a little more confused confused by how easily broken that glass is. These people have got hologram communication, intergalactic travel, and floating death robots, but glass apparently has the sturdiness of saltines. It is admittedly kind of weird how, despite Obi-Wan's insistence that they're not here to investigate the assassination, He's grabbing onto this thing for seemingly no reason other than to be led back to its master. Best guess is he ended up agreeing with Anakin in the end that it serves their purpose to find out what the deal is, 
Though that's only speculation on my part. Anyway, yeah, the droid carries Obi-Wan off into the city, and all the dangers of holding onto a floating ball hundreds of feet in the air that that would entail. There's something about this sequence that doesn't work for me. I couldn't say what it is. Maybe it's just poor integration of the CGI. Maybe it's just not shot well. Maybe it's how in the movie there's some comic relief aliens confused by the sight or grumbling about the Jedi, but... There's something about it that lacks tension or thrills. Maybe that's different for other people, but for me personally, I think the comic does it better. It's only two pages, we get some truly dynamic shots as Obi-Wan fiddles with the droid's power core as it tries to electrocute him off of it, and that gets him to start falling, then being shot by Zam. I don't know, it just really feels like it's more exciting in the comic than in the movie. Fortunately, Anakin commandeered a flying car. I was promised flying cars. And rescues him before he falls to his death. The comic also fixes a minor plot hole from the movie, wherein Zam has a considerable head start on the two in her own car, yet they're somehow able to catch up, whereas here they manage to stay with her right after the rescue pretty quickly. Eventually, with Anakin leaping onto her car after some... interesting maneuvers, they force her car to crash and she heads into a bar. During that, Anakin had lost his lightsaber and Obi-Wan retrieved it. Use the Force, Anakin. Think. He went in there to hide, not run. Think about what? Use the force for what? Maybe she knows a back way out of there and is trying to lose you in the crowd. This is a bizarre assumption, and either way, you still need to pursue. A Jedi's weapon is his most precious possession. He must keep it with him at all times. This weapon is your life. Ugh, that line. I really want to use that clip of Luke tossing the lightsaber to respond to it, but I don't want to invite more sequel hate to the comments. Ooh! Compromise! We'll talk some more about that line much later. Anyway, they decide to go in. Why do I get the feeling you're going to be the death of me? I mean... Technically speaking, you kill yourself, dude. They don't spot Zam, and Anakin believes them to be a shapeshifter, though there's nothing in the comic version that would give him that idea. Several people in the comments pointed out the webcomic Darths and Droids, which indeed I have read before, and I highly recommend it. And when they did their version of Attack of the Clones, they pointed out something that really should get more attention. There are shapeshifters in Star Wars? Like, that's a big deal! Beings that can change their appearance like that adds an incredible new dynamic to potential storytelling. For espionage, for assassination, for combat. And yet in the movies, it's only ever used here! In a throwaway bit for a character who doesn't even use it for her assassination plot! Like, it's a completely superfluous detail! Especially since she was already wearing a mask! Although it's possible Zam is just trying to follow good social distancing, who knows what kind of pandemics are occurring when there are hundreds, if not thousands, of different species walking around on this planet. It's just such a weird thing to include when it doesn't even end up mattering! The mask would have been enough to hide her identity before she decides to randomly try killing these two for no reason. Go and find her. Where are you going, Master? To get a drink. Obi-Wan Kenobi. Oh, and before you ask, yes, the death stick scene is in the comic. You wanna buy some death sticks? You don't want to sell me death sticks. I don't wanna sell you death sticks. You want to go home and rethink your life. I wanna go home and rethink my life. And while I make fun of the goofy names of the prequels, this guy had the greatest name in all of Star Wars, Elon Sleazebagano. Elon Sleazebagano. Bless him. I hope he had a long, fulfilling existence after he rethought his life. Don't tell me his expanded universe story in the comments. I prefer to live in blissful ignorance. After Obi-Wan has a few shots of Romulan ale, Zam decides to try to shoot him in the middle of the bar for no reason, and gets her hand cut off for her trouble. It is Obi-Wan, however, who proves why he is one of the greatest of the Jedi Knights. He got straight A's in arm slicing off in Jedi school. He and Anakin lead Zam out, who in this panel is apparently taking a quick nap after getting her arm removed, then calmly walking with them out. Give her this, she's got the fortitude of a brick wall. Also, uh, just leave her arm there, I guess. Are you going to eat that? Easy. Official business. Go back to your drinks. Oh, thanks. For a second there, I was worried it was an unofficial dismemberment. While Anakin calls it official business, in the movie it was Jedi business, and got me tilting my head a bit. I 
think this was meant to be another example of the Jedi's growing problems and hubris. Simply put, it seems weird that the Jedi can just cut someone's arm off in the middle of a bar and then say, Jedi business, move along, without even some kind of identifier that they are a Jedi. They just have carte blanche to do this kind of thing anywhere they go? And yeah, our heroes decide to drag her out into the street to interrogate the person currently in shock from having their arm cut off! Which is definitely more of a not-so-heroic act from the good guys as they demand to know who hired her to kill Padme. She starts saying it was a bounty hunter, but said bounty hunter shoots her with a toxic dart and then flies off with his jetpack. Although this artwork makes it look like he was only three feet away, and despite being able to track Zam through the streets, I guess they can't be bothered to grab their car and chase him. So, yeah, Django just killed Zam here instead of, you know, the two Jedi who weren't paying attention. Whoops. Okay, thinking this through, I suppose you could argue that he'd only be able to kill one of them, and not both, before the other dealt with him. Or that he knows the Jedi would probably be able to slice out the shots in the air if they were aimed at them as opposed to Zam. But then, that just leads us to the utter weirdness of this assassination plot. A lot of critiques around the assassination plot focus on the bizarre chain of people being sent to assassinate Padme, but let's give the benefit of the doubt here and work through the wonkiness of the plan itself. For starters, maybe a sniper shot from across the way isn't going to work, because this place has special glass that requires a cutting tool like the robot has to get in. Glass that Obi-Wan was able to leap through pretty easily. Hell, we'll definitely give them that a bomb is not necessarily going to work either. The first bomb plan didn't work after all, and they know the Jedi are guarding her, and let's face it, Force users can do some pretty incredible things, so why couldn't they suppress an explosion or something if they sense the danger? Hell, a bomb would probably be a big flashing warning sign of danger for a Jedi's precognitive senses, versus some bugs that are just in the room and happen to sting her or bite her or whatever. There's something more innocently deadly, if that makes any sense, versus a very specific intent to kill like a bomb. And hey, what if she had gotten up to get something to drink, or she couldn't sleep or something and wasn't in the room when the bomb went off? Severely injured, but not necessarily dead. Some kind of instant poison with the bugs that would be quieter and potentially not be discovered until the next morning, giving plenty of time to get away. In addition, they need to confirm that she was killed, so they probably need to stay close by to monitor the situation, and a bomb is going to attract a lot of attention to the area when you don't want to be there. So yeah, this method is a bit weird, but you could argue that there's a certain degree of sense to it. Not so much with the chain of subcontractors! So we don't really know if Sidious ordered the assassination. Later on, the Viceroy of the Trade Federation says that he wanted Padme dead for what happened in The Phantom Menace in order to join the Separatists, but maybe Palpatine was already orchestrating this whole thing to bring Anakin closer to her. At the very least, he approved the assassination plot, and with things on this scale, that's pretty much ordering him to do it. Dooku, in turn, hires a bounty hunter to kill her, Jango Fett. Jango! Hire Zam to be the actual assassin! Yeah, 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 I know there's expanded universe material that explains their relationship to each other as more like partners, but as a reminder, we only care about what's in the movie. And in the movie, she only says that she was hired by him. That's it. Oh, but after the bomb failure, she is ordered to not actually do the assassination herself, but to have these bugs do it. Hell, let's throw in the assassination droid too for good measure, because I would assume that something called an assassination droid does some assassinating. So we have bugs delivered by a droid, deployed by an assassin, hired by a bounty hunter, paid for by Count Dooku, who was given authorization to do this by Darth Sidious. I have eight different bosses right now. A big pun? Eight bosses. Eight? Eight, Bob. Welcome to Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Ludicrously Convoluted Assassination Scheme. The Jedi Council orders Obi-Wan to investigate who the bounty hunter was while Anakin is told to take Padme back to Naboo, where she'll be safer on her home turf. Some more scenes are cut from the comic, and these ones are definitely a mistake. Palpatine meeting with Anakin, which establishes that he's been acting as something of a mentor and father figure for him. Considering the next scene in the comic features Anakin complaining about Obi-Wan's teachings, it's a nice bit of manipulation. We've seen Anakin's growing frustration with Obi-Wan, who keeps being short with him, and 
and telling him to obey his orders while never giving him any credit. Palpatine, by contrast, boosts him up, tells him about how great and powerful he is, and that someday he'll be the best Jedi. Of course he's leaning towards the guy who actually gives him positive feedback. It's a good scene, except for the crappy CGI surroundings anyway. Yeah, people pointed out that a lot of the Phantom Menace was actually practical effects, though I am dubious of the more practical effects in that movie than in all of the original trilogy combined claims, because, come on. But it's in Attack of the Clones where the CGI overuse really becomes an issue. But yeah, Palpatine's manipulations here are an important step. Cutting it was a mistake. The next scene that's cut has the same CGI surroundings issue, plus the CGI Yoda that I hate. But in this case, it's about Obi-Wan talking with Yoda and Mace Windu about Anakin and his concerns about his arrogance. Yoda says it's a trait that's becoming all too common among Jedi. Which, if it is, it's very subtle. And Mace Windu reminds him that if the prophecy is true, then Anakin will be the one to bring balance to the Force. Okay, I mentioned last time that the prophecy could have been useful for turning Anakin. We keep being told that Anakin has these super special awesome superior Jedi skills, but never really see that. Like, the closest we get is him jumping out of the car and landing on Zams, having sensed where she'd be. Impressive, but we see ridiculous stuff like that from Jedi all the time. It's just a big problem of show-don't-tell with the movie. But yeah, the prophecy. We're never really shown if Anakin is aware of it. If he is, he never mentions it. He was in the room as a little kid when it was mentioned, but there's no guarantee he actually picked up on it. But let's say he is made aware of it. If his supposed exceptional power makes him arrogant, what's it gonna do if he's told he's special? He's the chosen one. That's the kind of thing that can go to someone's head. Suddenly, he assumes he can do no wrong. Who are you to question him? He's the one who will bring balance to the Force, after all. His actions must always be right. And if those actions lead to him imposing his will on others, choking them when they don't agree with him, well, what does it matter? He's the chosen one, after all. I'm just saying, if you're not gonna bother telling us what's in the prophecy, at least make good use of it. Anyway, we start on our advancement of the romance subplot as Padme packs her things to leave. The dialogue is expanded from what it was in the original, but it mostly keeps the same beats, with the exception of adding in that he asks her not to call him Annie anymore, since he doesn't want to be thought of as a little boy like the nickname implies. This scene is one of the ones that really shows the romance is on the wrong track. Anakin complains about Obi-Wan in a very whiny, childish way, and when Padme tries to reassure him and be nice, he starts flirting with her and she tells him to stop because it makes her uncomfortable. At least in the comic, he looks genuinely sorry about it, but in the movie, he half-heartedly apologizes and smiles like a creepy doofus who's all, Yeah, she's totally into me. Ugh. Later, the two are leaving on a crappy public transport so as not to attract attention, with Padme talking to her head of security and her new decoy, both of whom will be staying to hopefully not let it slip that she's left. Be safe, milady. Thank you, Captain. Take good care of Dorme. The threat's on you two now. Thank you, Senator. I know I could never be as good a friend and decoy as Corday was, but damn it, I'm gonna try to live up to her grand example! Obi-Wan begins his investigation in a cutscene that was best left on the chopping room floor. Robots examine the dart and say it doesn't conform with anything known in their database, so it's likely a custom thing. This is what leads him to the next scene, with Dexter Jetster and his 50s diner in space. The comic underplays the 50s diner aspect considerably. I don't know how to feel about it myself. I mean, say what you will about Amidala's dresses last time being inspired by various ones from other cultures, and while I appreciate the hard work and creative inspiration that went into the design and creation of those outfits, I'm sorry, they still look stupid and goofy to me. Remember, you're free to disagree on anything in these videos, just as I can disagree right back. Those things were inspired by them, not just trying to copy them wholesale. This is just... A 50s American diner, but with robots. It's just a weird... I don't know if anachronism is the right word for it, but it feels out of place with Star Wars. Anyway, Dexter tells Obi-Wan that the dart comes from the planet Kamino, a place beyond the Outer Rim that he should be able to locate in the Jedi Archive. They specialize in cloning, especially if you have enough money to afford them. Or at least if you can mind-trick them into believing credits will do fine. Back on the transport, Anakin and Padme talk about Naboo. I look forward to seeing Naboo again. 
I've thought about it every day since I left. You thought of her every day, you thought of Naboo every day. You don't really get a lot done as a Jedi, do you? The conversation steers towards the Jedi life. Padme comments that it must be hard to be sworn to the duties of it, not being able to visit the places you like, do the things you want to do, or be with the people I love. Are you allowed to love? I thought it was forbidden for a Jedi. Attachment is forbidden. Possession is forbidden. Compassion, which I would define as unconditional love, is central to a Jedi's life. So you might say, we're encouraged to love. This is the closest we get to an explanation about the Jedi view on relationships, and it's still annoyingly vague. We'll get into it more later. You have changed so much. You haven't changed a bit. You're exactly the way I remember you in my dreams. And the comic leaves out her reaction to that, which is an uncomfortable stare and him recognizing, yet again, swing and a miss. This is really the big problem with this movie. Most of their scenes together can be described as Padme tries to be accommodating and nice, Anakin makes it creepy and wince-inducing. Next up is a scene that was cut down a bit in the movie. Obi-Wan is in the Jedi archives and talks to a librarian there who... Yeesh. The comic does not do her justice. Her upper lip has a shadow on it and is severely wrinkled, so it makes it look like she's got the same kind of mustache as Dexter Jetster. Anyway, there's a bust of Count Dooku in the archive. The librarian saying that he was a brilliant Jedi who left because he lost faith in the Republic and was often out of step with the Council, much like Qui-Gon. I really do wish they had left this in. They seem to be trying to make us unsure if he was actually a bad guy, especially given later dialogue, he says. Otherwise, Obi Obi-Wan's having trouble locating Kamino in the archive. The librarian says that it doesn't seem to exist. Impossible. Perhaps the archives are incomplete. If an item does not appear in our records, it does not exist. There's nothing in here on the history of chair design and construction. Chairs don't exist. I am literally sitting in one right now. Figment of your imagination, you're actually squatting. There's nothing in here about forks either. The hell of forks? We only have spoons and sporks. Okay, why do you have information on sporks but not forks? Stop making up fairy tale utensils, Kenobi. He goes to see Yoda, who's teaching a class of little kids in lightsaber blocking using that trick first seen in A New Hope with the blast shield down. This is part of that whole, this weapon is your life thing that I hate, and it ties back to Yoda. More later. Anyway, Obi-Wan decided to interrupt class to look for help in finding Kamino. Yoda decides to use this for his class, and in theory, this would actually be kind of cool. Using the power of the Force to detect something that was hidden, but no, they just look at a star chart, which shows a big noticeable gap where Kamino should be, and some kid who looks absolutely doofy in the comic suggests that the information was deleted from the archive. Truly wonderful the mind of a child is. Yeah, only a child could think of. Maybe someone deleted it. This feels like one of those old jokes about kids acting as tech support for their out-of-touch parents. Anyway, Obi-Wan is sent off to the spot where Kamino should be while we cut over to Anakin and Padme. There's an extended version of this scene that was deleted, it's not in the comic version sadly, that included some more dialogue between the two, which mentions Padme's family, who would turn up in another deleted scene, as well as some more fleshing out of Padme's backstory. Some of it might come across as asinine and boring, but at least during that I have an easier time buying a relationship between the two, since Anakin isn't embarrassing himself during it. Mind you, the artwork does not help. What with this sleepy-eyed Anakin with an expression that says, I want to stare at you while you bathe. I wasn't the youngest queen ever elected, but now that I think back on it, I'm not sure I was old enough. I was way too over-emotional back then. I could just fly off the handle if my makeup wasn't applied symmetrically. So at least that answers that. Not all the queens are teenagers, though it still seems bizarre that it happens at all. Who the hell wanted a more boring Star Wars version of Prez? There's a meeting with the current queen to brief her about the situation with the Separatists. The queen's outfit now is less over the top than it was in the last movie, though apparently she decided today to dress like a black daisy for the elementary school play. We also learn that the Viceroy, who is actually named Newt Gunray, I don't think they ever actually named him in the comic adaptation last time, is still in charge of the Trade Federation. After another bit of Anakin being petulant for no good reason, we cut over to another deleted scene that was wisely cut. Mace saying his farewell to Obi-Wan. It just repeats information we were already given earlier. And then back over to Anakin and Padme, who are now staying in the countryside for the time being to help protect her. They're nearby the ocean, and... Well, it's time. The line, the legend. See that island? 
We used to swim there every day. I love the water. We used to lie on the sand and let the sun dry us. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating, and it gets everywhere. So we're probably not inviting it to board game night. It's hard to pin down exactly what it is that's so laughable about it. It might just be Hayden's delivery, because on its own, if you just read it, it doesn't seem so bad. And yet it's something we've latched onto. Darth Vader's intense hatred of sand. I mean, you notice he went down to Hoth personally, was willing to walk around on Endor, but when they were searching for the Death Star plans, he never set one foot on Tatooine again. Frankly, it's a wonder he didn't turn the entire Star Destroyer's weapon systems down onto the planet and literally turn it to glass while they were there. Maybe the problem is more the clunky and creepy transition Anakin uses then. Not like here. Here, everything's soft and smooth and deeply inappropriate. Padme talks about some old guy she used to know who'd make glass objects out of the beach sand. They were magical. Everything here is magical. And yeah, that's the look of a woman who's done with this guy's bullcrap. But no, she kisses him and then withdraws, saying she shouldn't have done that. Credit where it's due, the flowers surrounding the frame in the comic are a nice touch for romance. It's a pity that this makes no sense, considering she has shown clear disdain and discomfort over his romantic advances. And that's the thing, the script wants it to be, oh, she's into him too, but is worried about social implications. But the actual performance is, oh god, I'm trapped alone with a creepy guy who won't stop hitting on me and who can choke me with his mind! While romance stories where two characters just interact with each other over the course of the story can and do happen, simply put, most of this is bad. It's boring and dull and keeps throwing up warning signs why these two should not be together. And even if the performances were better and matched the mood they wanted, it's still just kind of boring. In my opinion, the way to do it, especially in Star Wars where you want to keep up the momentum, you get the two going off on an adventure together. Sure, they do eventually head off Naboo to go do stuff for characterization, but for the first part of that, Padme is just along for the ride. Force them into a situation where they have to spend all their time together, exchanging witty banter while dealing with life and death struggles that bring them closer emotionally to each other, investigating the assassination attempt from a different angle that reveals the other half of the puzzle from what Obi-Wan is looking into. Because yeah, Obi-Wan's plot despite some hiccups, is a far more interesting one. It's a mystery hitting some detective story tropes, like the old informant who has unique insight for him, or how each new revelation adds a new layer to the mystery that keeps you wanting to find out the next piece of the puzzle. Whereas with Anakin, it's... I don't like sand. This could also build on the Anakin is reckless and disobedient thing by having him defy the orders of the Jedi Council and Obi-Wan repeatedly while letting us really start sympathizing with him despite his darker side. We can also see how a fascistic mindset can really build up as he's constantly ordered by the Jedi to, say, not help people, not oppose injustices, making him think he knows better than them, when in reality there are good reasons for why they tell him not to do something, because his way is more expedient, but a could also do more long-term harm. Anyway, over to Obi-Wan's part as he arrives on Kamino. And I love Kamino. Admittedly, this all-white design aesthetic has kind of become very popular in the last decade for depicting a high-tech environment, because even Star Wars has Apple stores. But this was made before all that, and it's a very different sort of place to anything we've seen in the movies before this. A huge ocean world, constantly raining place, but this very cool, very alien-looking and advanced area. And the calm, pleasant demeanor of the Kaminoans themselves is very refreshing and kind of unique for these movies. Still don't understand how Obi-Wan knew to come to this city and land on the exact place where he could meet their leadership and thus get some of the answers, but yeah. He's warmly greeted by the Kaminoans and their prime minister, who say that he's expected. Not him in particular, but a Jedi, to check on their progress after this current project they're working on was commissioned. Obi-Wan plays along and learns that they're creating a clone army for the Republic, commissioned by a Jedi named sifo -Dyas. Now, you may be wondering who sifo -Dyas is. I have no idea. They just mention he died ten years ago and then never bring him up again. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's explained in some book, but whatever, let's keep moving. The clones have been genetically manipulated to make them less independent than the person they were cloned from. Django Fett, whose only request, aside from his considerable pay, was to have an unaltered clone for himself. Yep, having one unaltered clone of yourself to raise as your son? This is the way. The clones also have growth accelerants so that they'll actually, you know be adults in any combat they'd be engaged in, as opposed to having an army of child slave soldiers. And seeing the fully equipped clones, we of course can tell that they're proto-stormtroopers. Back over to Padme and Anakin, they're enjoying hanging out in a field and doing a lot better being endearing as a romantic couple, though it's awkward for the audience because Anakin casually drops how he thinks a dictatorship is a perfectly good idea because politicians are dickholes who don't tend to care about people. Admittedly, for Padme, she thinks he's just joking, hence why she's not worried about it. Over to Obi-Wan, he's brought to Jango Fett and his young clone, the future Boba Fett. The dialogue isn't really that important for this. It's pretty clear that both know why the other is here. That being said, when Obi-Wan asks about sifo Jango doesn't know who he's talking about saying he was hired by a man named Tyrannus. Lord Tyrannus is Count Dooku's Sith name, which just makes me wonder, why didn't they just have Lord Tyrannus be the one who commissioned the clone army instead of Sir not appearing in this or any film? I mean, it's never a name that's said to any of our heroes, so it's not like they'd be able to connect the dots back to the Sith with it. Back over to Naboo, time for star-crossed lover stuff that's never really explained properly. Padme pretty much confirms that she's into him too, but they can't be together. What hurts the scene is the delivery. The lines themselves, where Anakin talks about how much it pains him to not be with her, aren't too bad, but the way they're delivered feels forced and phonetic, as if he's trying to make sure he gets out each syllable exactly as written and at the same pace and tone for each sentence. It feels staged and unnatural, which is why him saying stuff like, I'm haunted by the kiss you should never have given me, sounds more like a poor recitation of Shakespeare than him actually pouring his heart out. In addition, Lucas apparently felt like he needed to use as few contractions as possible. So again, these lines end up sounding robotic. And of course, there's always this gem. I wish that I could just wish away my feelings. I really want to know if Lucas thought that was clever wordplay or just didn't even notice. The dialogue in the comic is pretty much the same as the movie, except for one line missing. Padme's explanation from her side why they can't be together? I'm a senator. And that is incredibly stupid. Instead, without that line, it feels like it's more about jeopardizing Anakin's place in the Jedi. Because after all, Jedi are not allowed to fall in love because one time twin brothers loved the same woman and their battle ended up blowing up a planet. Totally happened. Check out Comic Book Quickies number one. So, yeah, let's quickly talk about the Jedi and love thing because it leads into a point about these movies that's so frustrating. As many fans will be keen to point out, it's not that Jedi are not allowed to love, it's that strong attachments have the capacity to split a Jedi's dedication. Devoting yourself to one person can interfere with the greater goal of protecting the innocent and keeping the peace, to the point where you're so worried about the other person that it corrupts your love into obsession or some other negative emotion. One cannot serve two masters and all that. It's a philosophical point that has some grounding, and indeed, Jedi can can fall in love, get married, have children, yada yada yada. The problem is, I only know all that because of supplementary material in Expanded Universe stuff. It's not in the movie! The Jedi philosophy is painfully absent in the prequels, where as far as we know, what's standing in the way of this relationship is just, Jedi are not allowed to fall in love, and I'm a senator. I shouldn't have to read a book or play a video game or whatever in order to know this stuff. If that's really how it works, then the movie should say it! But the movie doesn't say anything! I mean, I suppose it tells us we should avoid falling into a nest of gundarks, but that just seems like good advice in general. It's why I'm not even bothering to try to look up EU explanations for stuff like Amidala's ridiculous outfits in The Phantom Menace. It's not in the movie, so what does it even matter? The EU seems to exist purely to explain away problems with the films, but in turn, the expanded universe has its own collection of people who have their own ideas for how Star Wars should be. And it's a big problem because they sometimes end up directly contradicting what the films say. If they 
say anything at all! This is why when I'm reviewing these movies, I'm going 99% by only what's in the movie! Because that's what I'm reviewing! Telling me that some discrepancy or goof is explained away in a comic or a book or a video game or something doesn't help! Because how the hell am I supposed to know that?! It's not in the movie! It's not in the movie! I'm willing to try to rationalize stuff like the assassination method or Palpatine's plans, but the movie has to meet me halfway here! Whatever. The two say they can't be together in secret because they don't want to live a lie. Meanwhile, Obi-Wan contacts the Jedi Council to inform them of his findings. R4, relay this. Scramble code 5 to Coruscant. Care of the old folks' home. That's right. I did the Iggy. He informs them of the clone army, but admits it's weird that there doesn't seem to be a connection between the cloners and the assassination because there's no motive. Although, yes there is. If the Republic votes to not make an army, there's no need for the clone troopers, and the Jedi have no record of making this order, so the Kaminoans can't necessarily prove that the order was made, so trying to kill someone who's trying to block the army's authorization is indeed a motive. He's ordered to apprehend Django. Back on Naboo, Anakin awakes from a nightmare about his mother, which he's apparently been having quite a few of lately, admitting to Padme that he can sense she's suffering and in pain. He decides he has to go investigate this despite his mandate to protect Padme, but she's all on board with going with him to try to help. Much like The Last Jedi, there does seem to be a bit of a timeline wonkiness with the two plots. Padme and Anakin are on Naboo for what seems to be several days, Yet all Obi-Wan has done is gone to Kamino. Feels like no longer than a day has passed. Admittedly, Kamino is supposed to be past the Outer Rim, so maybe Obi-Wan was sitting in his fighter for several days on the trip, catching up on reading a book. Finding self-affirmation through your midichlorians. Obi-Wan goes to try to apprehend Django, and a good fight ensues, but ultimately he gets away. Fortunately, Obi-Wan was able to put a tracking device on his ship so he can pursue. Anakin and Padme arrive on Tatooine and find Watto, who explains that he sold Shmi to a guy named Lars, who freed her and married her. Okay, a thing I like about the movie right here. Anakin's cold demeanor to Watto is a good bit of character writing, especially since they don't call attention to it. Watto's all excited to see him again, but of course Anakin's not going to be happy. He was a slave to him. This is not a happy reunion. Watto should feel lucky Anakin's not actually in the dark side yet, or he would have used the Force to rip his wings off. Anyway, he points the two in the direction of Lars's moisture farm. Meanwhile, Obi-Wan tracks Django to the planet Geonosis, but Django discovers the tracker and we get a little chase. It's admittedly a good spectacle in the movie. It's not as good in the comic, though a bit unnecessary since they just had a fight scene. Yeah, yeah, space battle versus melee combat, but still. Anyway, Obi-Wan manages to elude them and make them think he's done for. Back on Tatooine, the two arrive and encounter 3PO. So some people were apparently confused by my remarks last time about why George Lucas would have Anakin be the builder of C-3PO, explaining that Anakin built him to help his mother. That's not what I was asking. Yeah, in story, that's why he built him. I realize this might be a generational issue, because of course anyone who started with the prequels won't see anything weird about it. But for those of us who started with the original trilogy, this connection is bizarre and unnecessary. It'd be like revealing that Lando Calrissian built R2-D2. Sure, there's no in-story reason why it couldn't happen, but two characters who otherwise had nothing at all to do with each other suddenly have a connection like that. It's such a weird, retconned coincidence. He built him to help his mother was also used to explain why Anakin didn't take 3PO with him. Except 3PO wasn't done yet. That was the whole point. He was building 3PO to help Shmi, but he's no good to her in the state he left him in. We're never given any indication Shmi knows anything about building robots, so 3PO is just taking up space in her house. But I guess she must have some knowledge since he's now completed. Not painted gold yet, but yeah. He brings the two inside to meet Klieg Lars, his son Owen, and Owen's girlfriend Baru. I'm a bit iffy about the revelation that Luke isn't actually a blood relative of Uncle Owen and Aunt Baru. Not because adoption isn't still family, of course not. It's just frustrating because it feels like this is only a thing to reinforce the divine right of kings crap. They don't have that mighty Skywalker blood and all that. And hey, Anakin has a stepbrother and stepfather now, but he doesn't give a crap. 
I know, he's here for his mother, but it just seems like he should have some sort of emotional reaction to all this news. It also makes me wonder, did Shmi ever try to contact Anakin to let him know all this? God, I hope so. That's something else I forgot to bring up last time. How friggin' cavalier she was to just let her nine-year-old son go with some stranger she knew nothing about with no guarantee they'd ever see each other again. Yeah, she probably wouldn't have been able to get through to him, but I'd like to think she at least tried, especially after she was freed. Anyway, Klieg explains that Tusken Raiders kidnapped her a month ago. They tried sending out a search party of 30 men, and only four returned. There's very little chance she's alive, but Anakin is determined to locate her. While Anakin searches on his own, Obi-Wan lands on Geonosis and dispatches some random lizard that wasn't in the movie. He spots Trade Federation ships landing and unloading a new model of battle droids. These ones are much improved over the originals. Bulkier, more imposing, and they don't talk. At least until the next movie, where they do talk and have the same voices as regular battle droids, because the prequels have this tendency to take anything that's scary and cool and make it stupid somehow. Making his way into a facility, he discovers that this place is being used to mass-produce battle droids. A friggin' army of them. He spots a group heading through the place that includes the Trade Federation Viceroy, who wants to know if Padme is dead yet. He's not joining up with the Separatists until she's dead. So yeah, there's your explanation for the assassination plot. It has nothing to do with her position. It's only because the Viceroy is a petty dickhead. A better villain, however, is the previously mentioned Count Dooku. Despite the name, I actually really like Dooku. It helps that he's played by Christopher Lee, and while Samuel L. Jackson is wasted as Mace Windu since he never really has any cool lines or badass moments and his performance is so restrained, Christopher Lee slips into a villain role like this just so damn easily. His dialogue might not be anything to write home about, but he's friggin' Dracula and Saruman. The man knew how to squeeze an entertaining performance out of even the clunkiest lines. Now is the time, my friends. This is the moment when you have to decide between the Republic or the Confederacy of Independent Systems. A thousand more systems will rally to our cause with your support, gentlemen. And let me remind you of our absolute commitment to capitalism. You know, we like to joke about how Star Trek's Federation is a communist utopia, but here's Star Wars just outright saying, the bad guys are devoted to capitalism. Strangely, this meeting scene has different aliens in it than in the movie. I wonder if they didn't have the design elements finished when they started working on this. Oh, and the comic's dialogue actually includes more specific mentions of trade stuff. Reduced tariffs, abolition of all trade barriers, and the treaty's purpose is all about profit. I'm guessing this got cut after the initial why was the first movie about trade negotiations thing. Anyway, point is, Obi-Wan overhears them planning to openly oppose the Republic and force them to concede to all their demands. Meanwhile, Anakin has tracked down Shmi to a Tusken Raider camp and breaks into a hut to free her, but by the time she's untied, she only has enough time to recognize him and say she's proud of him before she dies. Probably from a combination of torture, dehydration, starvation, and God knows what else. Well, it's a good thing that the Jedi taught him to manage his emotions so well. So anyway, he proceeds to murder all the Tusken Raiders. Obi-Wan's signal isn't strong enough to reach Coruscant, so he tries to contact Anakin to relay the transmission to the Jedi Council. Speaking of, he returns to the moisture farm with Shmi's body. Later, he's in the farm talking with Padme about it. The scene is... not great. It definitely shows off that Christensen was not a bad choice for this and allows him to let loose a bit on his acting, but I'll explain my issue in a minute. He rants to Padme that he should have been able to save her, but when Padme mentions that he's not all-powerful, he says he should be. I promise you, I will even learn to stop people from dying. Eh, foreshadowing for the next movie, but clunky line. Then he starts blaming Obi-Wan, claiming he's jealous of his power before admitting he didn't just kill the armed members of the Tusken Raiders, but all their families, too, even the children. From there, he moves into saying he shouldn't be feeling this way, that he should have been able to control himself as a Jedi, and he screams that he's sorry about it. It's not a bad scene. It's just it could have been so much better. The problem is a combination of the wrong dialogue with the wrong circumstances. Killing Anakin's mother like this in story makes sense. In fact, when I was a kid and first watched The Phantom Menace, I guessed that losing his mother would be the thing that got him to turn over to the dark side. But let me suggest an alternate way this plays out. 
He blames Obi-Wan for being jealous and holding him back, but that gets discarded right away. What he should be doing here is saying, this is the Jedi's fault. If they had let me go to her when I was first sensing this, I could have saved her. And even when he gets there, maybe he does get to her in time, but the raiders start shooting. Anakin tries to fend them off, but he's not powerful enough to take on so many and defend his mother. Maybe he pulls a Kylo Ren and stops a bunch of their blaster bolts in midair, but he can't stop them all and his mother gets killed. Otherwise, him proclaiming, I will be the most powerful Jedi ever, doesn't really make sense because lacking power is not what got her killed. Consider this. Instead of yelling that, he stares down at his lightsaber or his hands and just whispers to himself, I wasn't strong enough. I wasn't powerful enough. I need to be more powerful. And then his cold, angry eyes just go up and there's a dark shadow over his face. In the original trilogy, Darth Vader is always pontificating on the power of the dark side, but in the prequels, Anakin never actually pursues power. He just crosses out light side on his character sheet and changes it to dark side. Part of the problem is that they decided he should be automatically super powerful right from the start. So we never see him trying to become more powerful, except by vague allusions to new powers in the third movie. Which of course we'll get to next week. Instead, this scene is him rambling and ranting in his grief. And that's fine, it's not a bad thing. It's just it could have been used in a way that better put him on the path to become Vader. He's still a good guy here, so this is more just the good guy going through hardship and some conflicting morality and emotional vulnerability. That's a good thing. I don't object to that. I just don't feel it works with where the prequels should be at this point as prequels to the original trilogy. In my opinion, and you're of course free to disagree with me on this, this movie should have ended with Anakin becoming Darth Vader. Not necessarily in the armor, but by the end, he should have officially sworn his allegiance to Sidious and the Dark Side, with Episode 3 serving as him secretly enacting the plan that would bring down the Jedi. This should be the turning point for him. All that build up in the first half of the movie was his constant resentment of the Jedi and their methods, of Obi-Wan holding him back, teasing his more fascistic beliefs and tendencies, and now all of that gets shoved by the wayside until the next movie. Seriously, all that stuff that puts him on the path to the dark side? Completely irrelevant for the rest of Attack of the Clones. And there are apparently a few years between episodes 2 and 3, so in reality, a ton of time passes before his journey to become Darth Vader becomes important again. Anyway, Obi-Wan connects with Anakin's ship and they retransmit the message, explaining the Viceroy being behind the assassination attempts and that different factions are pledging their armies to Count Dooku. However, Obi-Wan's then captured by battle droids. Mace Windu orders Anakin to stay put and keep protecting Padme while he dispatches Jedi to rescue Obi-Wan. However, after the call is over, Padme says that they probably won't get to him in time, so elects to go and rescue him. Back on Coruscant, the Jedi talk with the Chancellor and some Senators about the situation. Only 200 Jedi are available to be sent in to help Obi-Wan, and the Separatists are clearly massing for war anyway, so they need the clone army. Problem is, it's clear the Senate will not approve the use of the clones before the Separatists attack. The Chancellor is... adjutant? Prime Minister? I don't know who the hell the Blue Devil guy actually is, but he's like an important dude, and he says the way to push past the red tape is if the Senate granted the Chancellor emergency powers to approve the use of them straight away. I love how everyone's all, oh sweet, someone ordered clones for us before we had to. Nothing weird or suspicious about that. Let's just use them without truly understanding how this happened, even though the guy who was the template for them apparently works for the Separatists. Yeah, that's a weird thing too. No one in the movie ever really speculates about why, if Jango Fett is the basis for the Republic's clone army, he's working for the enemy. Sure, he was just paid to use his DNA and stuff, but he's clearly still working with the Kaminoans, and that doesn't raise a few eyebrows. Anyway, they wonder who would actually propose such a radical amendment. Blue Devil Guy saying, if only Senator Amidala was here. She'd totally do that. Even though, no, she seemed pretty adamant not to do so. But we'll talk more about that next week. No, it's Jar Jar who steps up to the plate and says he'll do it. And by the way, this is the first time he's shown up in the comic at all. I think it's pretty clear the creators on this one didn't like him and just left him out entirely until they had to bring him in. Jar Jar gets blamed for the creation of the Empire, both in and out of universe, and that's a bit unfair. 
There's no way he could have known this would happen. Back over to Geonosis, we get our first proper scene with Count Dooku as he talks with Obi-Wan. It's... a curious scene at that. We learn that he was actually Qui-Gon's master, even him saying he wishes Qui-Gon was still around to help with what he's doing here. You see, Dooku denies being in charge or that Jango is here. The interesting thing is that he freely admits that the Republic is under the control of the Sith. Obi-Wan doesn't buy it, saying the Jedi would have sensed it. The dark side of the Force has clouded their vision, my friend. Hundreds of senators are now under the influence of a Sith Lord called Darth Sidious. It's one of the things that makes Dooku such a fascinating villain here. What is actually served by giving Obi-Wan so much information? Sowing distrust, sure, but being so specific with who the villain is? And is he just trying to manipulate him by planting the seeds of doubt in the Senate, or does he genuinely want Obi-Wan to join him and then hope to turn him to the dark side? This is one of those things I'm okay with not really knowing the full details of his intentions for. It's just very fun to speculate. After leaving, Anakin and Padme arrive and start looking around. Padme wants him to follow her lead, hoping she can try to find a diplomatic solution to all this. 3PO apparently came along. I guess now with Shmi dead, he's not going to be any help to the family who technically owned him now. Or they just wanted to get rid of him. He is comic relief after all. And he goes along with R2 so they can indeed be some comic relief. This leads to the droid factory scene, which, yeah, it kind of sucks. It's a very over-the-top action scene and feels like they should be killed ten times over during it. There's just so much stuff, it's so busy, and in the end it's ultimately pointless, except for comic relief for 3PO, since they just get captured in the end anyway. Oh wait, it does serve one other purpose, establishing that R2 apparently had jets that he could fly with and then never uses again in the original trilogy. Also, I'm pretty sure he tries to murder 3PO. I'm not against an action scene here, since it's been a bit, but it's just so ridiculous, and we're about to get the start of a much better set of action scenes anyway. We then get a deleted scene, one that probably should have stayed in. It shows Padme actually trying to negotiate with Dooku and failing, with him encouraging her to get Naboo to join the Separatists. Aren't you fed up with the corruption? Aren't you? Be honest, Senator. The ideals are still alive, Count, even if the institution is failing. You believe in the same ideals we believe in! If what you say is true, you should stay in the Republic and help Chancellor Palpatine put things right. The Chancellor means well, milady, but he is incompetent. Somewhere, Sidious just raised his head up and realized, Oh, someone's going to get his ass shocked with lightning next time I see him. Following this, Jar Jar gets the emergency powers granted to Palpatine, who swears to give them up once the crisis is over, first declaring to create an army for the Republic. In the meantime, Yoda says he'll check out Kamino, while Mace Windu says he'll take the Jedi they have to rescue Obi-Wan. Wait, they haven't left yet? No wonder Padme said you wouldn't get there in time! Get off your lazy asses already! Next is a cutscene that was a good cut because it's just unnecessary. The Geonosian leader declaring that Anakin and Padme are guilty of espionage and will be put to death. The two are brought to a cart where they'll be executed in a goofy, over-the-top manner, but we'll get to that in a minute. Anakin tells her not to be afraid. I'm not afraid to die. I've been dying a little bit each day since you came back into my life. Okay, she means that romantically, but really it sounds like she's just utterly sick of him. She admits her love for him, and they kiss before being brought out. The two, along with Obi-Wan, are tied to stone pillars in the middle of an arena, and a bunch of monsters are going to be brought out to kill them, because apparently public executions are no fun unless done by a giant praying mantis. Also, Padme apparently learned lockpicking in her free time as queen, since she uses a hairpin to undo her cuffs. They fight the monsters for a bit, with Anakin ultimately using the Force to tame one and ride it like a steed for the three to escape. Naturally, the people in charge aren't going to let them get away, Way until the Jedi arrive, Mace Windu putting his purple lightsaber up to Jango Fett's neck so he doesn't help. And I guess Yoda was being a little optimistic in his assessment, since the narration says it's only a hundred Jedi who show up to the rescue. And thus, fight scene ensues, with battle droids and Geonosians emerging out of everywhere to fight. And pretty much it's all fight scenes until the end, but they're at least halfway decent ones. For starters, this is the first time we ever saw this many Jedi engaged in combat at once. Admittedly, it's so chaotic that it's hard to follow, but like the fight with Darth Maul last time, it's at least a spectacle to behold. Unfortunately, this also leads to a few stupid moments. For starters, there's Jango Fett. In the movie, he manages to kill a Jedi who climbs up to attack Dooku, but he doesn't even get that here. No, in both movie and comic, 
He leaps down into the fray! Why did you do that? You have no reason to go down there! You were fine! There is no reason to just jump down and give up your strategically advantageous position high above them to go right down to where people are shooting and slicing and there are rhino dinosaurs running around! I know we make fun of Eye of the High Ground, but in fact the high ground is a good thing to have! Especially for Django Fett, who uses ranged weapons! But no, instead he gets knocked around right before Mace Windu chops his head off. Eventually, the remaining Jedi, yeah, a bunch get killed, get pushed into a circle, and Dooku offers them the chance to surrender. They, of course, refuse. However, the rescuers are now themselves rescued by Yoda, who has brought the clones. The sky is unexpectedly filled with a squadron of Republic gunships, which descend into the arena. There is something twistedly beautiful about seeing this scene and going, YAY! The Stormtroopers! are here! While Yoda directs the clone troopers in battle against the retreating Federation forces, we get a scene of Boba Fett cradling the decapitated head of Jango, which seems like it should have been setting something up for Revenge of the Sith, but nope, that gets followed up in the Clone Wars cartoon. It's also just kind of weird to see this little kid holding a decapitated, if helmeted, head like this. Anyway, Star Wars stuff happens as Anakin, Padme, and Obi-Wan pursue Count Dooku, who, like Darth Maul before him, is trying to maintain his dignity while flying a Scooty Puff Jr. Is that just the official Sith vehicle? Because these ships have never heard of doors, or seatbelts, it gets rocked and Padme falls out of it onto the sand. Anakin wants to land a retriever, but Obi-Wan convinces him to stop since he needs his help to take down Dooku, and Padme would want to keep going. This is what I mean about how his development towards Darth Vader is on hold. Admittedly, they do need more scenes of them being friends for it to match with Obi-Wan's description of him to Luke, since otherwise he'd go, Oh yes, Anakin was a petulant apprentice of mine. What a dick. But he just starts obeying Obi-Wan again and following the Jedi ideals here. It's like nothing has actually changed for him. Anyway, it's not shown, but in the movie, the clone trooper ship is destroyed after letting Anakin and Obi-Wan off to confront Dooku. Anakin recklessly charges in first and gets zapped with force lightning for his trouble. As you can see, my Jedi powers are far beyond yours. Wait, shooting lightning is a Jedi power? Why didn't anybody tell me? Obi-Wan is unimpressed. I don't think so. Between this and the next movie, was that supposed to be Obi-Wan's catchphrase? Dooku is able to outfight Obi-Wan and injure him, knocking him out of the fight. Anakin gets back up and engages as well. You have unusual powers, young Padawan, but not enough to save you this time. Are they ever gonna get around to explaining just what these unusual special powers are at some point? Like, he can use the force to make scrambled eggs in a cold pan? What are they? Anakin even dual wields lightsabers against Dooku, but it's not enough. I already explained last time a disappointment with the more acrobatic fights of the prequels, but I'm actually okay with this fight against him. It's not perfect, but it's definitely more restrained than others, helped by the fact that that's actually Christopher Lee doing a lot of the swordplay. Not in the wide shots, but in closer shots, yes. In terms of fight choreography, it's nothing special, especially as the final boss battle of the movie, but that's because it's more of a warm-up for what's to come. Anyway, the fight is soon lost, and Anakin's hand gets cut off. Oof, he's good at this. You gotta hand it to him. <laughs> eh, comic doesn't do a good job of showing it. It honestly looks more like Dooku just grazed the back of his lower arm. Dooku prepares to kill him, but then Yoda arrives. The comic leaves out how in the movie they try to use other force powers on each other first. Like Yoda redirecting his lightning back, or Dooku trying to collapse rocks on him, and just move straight into the lightsaber. Oh my god, look at this artwork! He's just waving it in front of his face! What the hell is this? Sweet merciful crap, it's not just one panel either! Look at this, they're just waving their lightsabers up and down or left and right! You know, there's a strong argument against this scene, and I admit, I'm conflicted about it myself. But then here comes the comic adaptation to remind you, there's always a stupider idea! What's he gonna do next? Force pull over another lightsaber so it's in stereo? Size matters not, Master Yoda. Not compared to the power of the windmill! Eventually, Yoda starts doing more intense attacks. Not quite in the same way it's presented in the movie, but here, Dooku also- <laughs> Oh my god! He does grab Anakin's saber so he can dual wield to try to counter Yoda! I was kidding! So yeah, Yoda, that tiny little dude who's always walking around with a cane, can actually flip around and jump like he was in the Matrix. I served my energy for moments like this. 
I'm of two minds about this. Yes, it is cool to see Yoda doing this stuff. I may not like the more acrobatic fights of the prequels, but I get it. The Jedi at the height of their powers and abilities, and it's amazing to behold. My problem is that it seems to be at odds with how Yoda and the Force are supposed to be. This is my problem with that whole, this weapon is your life thing, or Yoda teaching lightsaber tactics at the Academy to little kids. Yoda's entire point in Empire Strikes Back is that the Jedi are not about the fighting. While they will engage in combat for freedom and justice in the name of the moon and all, their knowledge and understanding of the Force is through inner peace, harmony, serenity. Dooku says their conflict can't be resolved through mastery of the Force, but with their skills with a lightsaber, except a Jedi's mastery of the Force is not about lifting rocks. I'm looking for a great warrior. Force not to make one great. <laughs> so making Yoda engage in a very physical duel like this, making him be the one who's teaching lightsaber fighting, and having Obi-Wan say, this weapon is your life, feels counter to his teachings. Luminous beings, Zoe, not this crude matter. Although I admit him sitting and meditating to defeat Dooku wouldn't exactly make for good cinema. I don't know, I just feel like there was a middle ground between that and here's a fan service shot of Yoda being cool. Like, here's an idea. Maybe Dooku is the one who's constantly attacking with his lightsaber, but Yoda is so strong with the force that he's constantly dodging. He's still as acrobatic as this, but he never actually makes an attack. Or like he has so strong with the force, every time Dooku tries to attack, he can telekinetically stop it. Realizing how screwed he is, Dooku suspends a big piece of machinery over the defeated Anakin and Obi-Wan, forcing Yoda to turn his attention towards helping them instead of fighting. Mind you, I would have taken advantage of the distraction to slice Yoda down, but whatever. He makes his escape. Dooku secretly makes his way to Coruscant and meets with Darth Sidious, who reveals his Sith name of Lord Tyrannus. Which, by the way, is a much cooler name than Count Dooku. Oh my god, I just realized, is it possible that calling him Count, and with the hard D and K sounds, it's actually supposed to be a reference to Count Dracula? He also reveals that he's in on the plan to start this war. Later, at the Jedi Temple, Obi-Wan discusses with Mace Windu and Yoda Dooku's accusations about the Senate. Since the dark side is all about deception and lies, they can't really trust what he's saying, but then again, lies are best hidden with a sprinkle of truth, so they're gonna keep a closer eye on the Senate. Obi-Wan says they were victorious this day, but Yoda has to be a party pooper. This is not a victory, for the Clone War has now started. Shouldn't this technically be called the Separatist War? Why are you naming the war after what your troops are? Begun. The Clone War has. At least Corday didn't live to see this. This is a great scene in the movie. The Imperial March slowly playing over the clone troopers being loaded on a proto-star destroyers. It truly hints at how bad this actually is. And so our comic ends on Naboo, where Padme and Anakin, now equipped with a robot hand, are getting married in secret. And of course, the one time it'd be appropriate for Padme to wear something ridiculously showy, She's actually pretty low-key. This movie is still bad, and actually, unlike last time, I think the comic is kind of bad, too. As an adaptation, it replicates most of the movie pretty well, but this one has a lot more artistic issues than last time. A lot more wonky faces and bizarre motions. There are spots, like the early chase through Coruscant, where it seems like the comic has a better grasp of what's going on, but then there's just bizarre stuff during action scenes, like the waving lightsaber fight where you just have to wonder what the hell they were thinking. And of course, because it's copying the movie, it yet again contains all the wince-inducing dialogue. The addition of deleted scenes, especially ones that may expand on character, is certainly welcome, but they also include plenty of deleted scenes that were cut for good reason. On the subject of the movie itself, like I said, it is a bad film. While I still think Phantom Menace is worse, if only by virtue of the delivery not being as bad as it was there, the poorly handled romance drags things down considerably. Especially since, in addition to setting up how Anakin becomes Darth Vader, it's supposed to be establishing who Anakin is as a character now to us, since he obviously is not the nine-year-old yelling yippee anymore. And the impression of him is not good, but as a whiny, petulant jerk who doesn't know when to stop hitting on the woman he's supposed to be protecting. Chunks of exposition that would give us a better idea of how things work in this universe are missing, relegated to expanded universe material. The movie is definitely more in love with its effects department than it is in developing the romance. 
This is the film that really is pushing more of the digital technology that Lucas loved so much. CGI environments everywhere, more poorly integrated CGI characters, and even the clone troopers themselves are all computer generated, probably for ease of using so many of them in large battle scenes. And speaking of battle scenes, yeah, this movie definitely cares more about the flashy action scenes over anything else. There's still stuff I like, still a foundation for a really good movie if some things have been changed, but overall, it's just the middle chapter of the prequels, and for many, it feels like we're just dragging our way to the end. Also, why is this movie called Attack of the Clones? The clones aren't really the ones on the attack. The Jedi attack. But this is pretty much a defensive action, or at least a rescue mission. Next time, the prequel trilogy concludes with the one that people actually say is the good one. Revenge of the Sith. We'll see if the comic can live up to that boast. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. The prequel trilogy ends today with Revenge of the Sith. Star Wars prequels month, of course, is not ending yet. We've still got another episode next week. Assuming the schedule slippage with these doesn't push this into June or something. Revenge of the Sith is almost universally regarded as the only one of the prequel trilogy that's good. The one that people will argue is still worthy of watching. Attack of the Clones is hit or miss among fans when it comes to viewing orders, as in how to show Star Wars movies to people who have never seen them. They'll go something like episodes 4 to 5, then 2 to 3, then 6, but Revenge of the Sith is the one that people insist is still worthy of standing alongside the original trilogy. Do I agree? <laughs> no, not really. In addition to the problems we've already discussed with the other two, we have a whole new problems with it for a variety of reasons. That is not to say that it isn't entertaining, though. Like I said last week, if I ever feel like rewatching the prequels, which is rare, admittedly, Revenge of the Sith is the one I'll go to. A lot of that has to do with Darth Sidious, who's finally allowed to let loose and just go full ham. And since the prequels have always had this problem of actors delivering lines flatly and restrained, it's so nice to finally have someone just devour the scenery. It's also the moodiest of the prequels, having a more consistent tone throughout that befits a story with a tragic ending. The final lightsaber duel, while it has its problems, finally has the emotional core that I've been seeking with the others. Like the other two films, there's a good movie in here that just needed some revisions and it would have been great. However, there are of course all the new issues with it. It kind of feels like there's a laziness in things, like it's just trying to get from scene to scene, but then you also have to find a way to cram in a lot of important events to reach a very specific endpoint. A common comparison point between the prequel and sequel trilogies is that the prequels had a plan while the sequels didn't seem to. Thing is, though, of course there was a plan for the prequels, because they had to get to where things were in A New Hope. Anakin has to become Darth Vader. The Empire has to rise. The Jedi have to be killed. The question is, do they actually do a good job of fulfilling that plan? And in my opinion, no they don't. But hey, it's still an entertaining ride along the way, and these videos keep being insanely long, so we should just get started. So let's dig into Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, and try to break down exactly where things went wrong. from a trade, no cover analysis. Though interestingly, I actually have two trades. 
the Marvel one in a slightly larger hardcover format, and the original Dark Horse trade. I noted last time the unusual choice to integrate the opening crawl into the narration. This comic decided to split the difference. The crawl is compressed up top on the first page over activity in space. Except Marvel's reprint, for some inexplicable reason, has the opening crawl happening AGAIN before the comic even starts, even though it's still on the first page. There's nothing else different, they just have the crawl twice. I guess it's not just clone troopers being replicated. WAR! In this franchise? That's completely unprecedented. The Republic is crumbling under attacks by the Separatist leader, Count Dooku. There are heroes on both sides. Yeah, except one side's heroes are Guardians of Peace and Justice, and the other side's heroes are Ferengi with racist accents. Evil is everywhere! That microwave? Full of evil. In a stunning move, the fiendish droid leader, General Grievous, has swept into the Republic capital and kidnapped Chancellor Palpatine, leader of the Galactic Senate. It happened in a cartoon that was way cooler than this. Yeah, we'll talk about the Tartakovsky Clone Wars in a bit. In the meantime, I will comment that I do love the opening shot of the film right after the crawl. The transition right into the space battle by following the fighters. When the first word of your opening crawl is WAR in big letters, I expect expect to see a war, and this movie kindly delivers it. And indeed, we start things off with Anakin and Obi-Wan and fighters trying to find the ship that Palpatine is on. There's not a lot to say about this sequence, but there is a character bit I can talk about. During the fight, some clone trooper ships become overwhelmed by the droid fighters, and Anakin becomes concerned. I'm gonna go help them out. No, you're not. They're doing their job so we can do ours. Head for the command ship. This was a mistake, in my opinion. Making Anakin care about the lives of the clone troopers is there to paint him as a hero, remind us that he's supposed to be a good guy, but by this point, as things wear down and he edges closer to being Darth Vader, he shouldn't give a crap about them at all. He should think of them as disposable assets in winning the war. You have to make strides in turning him into a villain. Instead, the movie is going to apply that the road from being concerned about clone troopers to becoming a child-murdering monster is surprisingly short. It seems that since the events of Phantom Menace, the villains have realized, hey, maybe we should have shields or something protecting our hangar bays from enemy fighters landing in them, and they have to quickly disable those before crashing their fighters onto said hangar bays. The two deal with some battle droids. R2, stay with the ship. I sense Count Dooku. I sense a trap. Yeah, they kidnapped the most powerful head of state of their sworn enemies in order to lure two random Jedi into a trap. They walk through the ship's hallways until they run into... more droids. General Kenobi, Anakin Skywalker, we've been waiting for you. <gasps> of course! It was... random droid in a cape! It was you all along! Was this supposed to be Grievous and the artist just didn't have the reference material for him yet? I think it was, actually. The two escaped from this by cutting a hole in the deck plate under them, which is what happened in a deleted scene where we were originally supposed to first meet Grievous as he kills a Jedi named Shock T, who was there for unexplained reasons. And that makes even less sense if you watched the aforementioned Tartakovsky Clone Wars. It was a good cut for the film. The opening sequence already takes up 23 minutes. It didn't need to be longer. And I guess here they just decided to change it to one of Grievous's guard droids that wield vibroblade poles. Anyway, they escape from the droids and make their way to the Chancellor, who's being guarded by more droids, as well as Count Dooku. In the film, he leaps off a platform down to the ground, but in the comics, since we don't see him leap from there, no motion lines or anything, he's just suddenly doing this weird curtsy to them. I just want to remind you all of our commitment to capitalism. You will not escape this time, Dooku. My powers have doubled since last we met, Count. What the hell does that even mean? Was my cancelled over 9,000 joke from two weeks ago actually accurate? Should I pull out a scouter and register Anakin's power level? Good. Twice the pride, double the fall. This is a weird advertisement for double mint gum. Fight ensues, Dooku is able to knock Obi-Wan unconscious. A difference right away is that after Dooku's line about sensing fear, power, and anger in him, Palpatine actually yells out for Anakin to use his aggressive feelings and focus it. I like the addition. It's a reminder that Palpatine has been grooming Anakin as his new apprentice this whole time. And we even see Anakin's angry expression right before he slices Dooku's hand off. Good, Anakin, good. I knew you could do it. Kill him. Kill him now. Who's incompetent now, Dooku? 
given the scene from last time where Dooku met with Sidious, it was fairly obvious that he was aware that he and Palpatine were the same person, but the comic actually takes it a step further with Dooku whispering, Protect me, Chancellor. Pretty evident this was not part of the plan. I do wonder what the plan was from Dooku's perspective, though. Kidnap him, and then... what exactly? Did he expect this to be the end game for the Separatists part of the war and just didn't realize Palpatine's ambitions for Anakin? We get our meme where the do it. Anakin's brief hesitation, and then... Uh, he's just suddenly dead in the next panel. Again, Motion Lines comic. It had helped to indicate when our hero just decapitated the villain. Palpatine congratulates him on doing so, but Anakin's feeling down about it since killing a defenseless opponent like this is not the Jedi way. It's not the first time, Anakin. Remember what you told me about your mother and the Sand People. I don't know why you needed to decapitate your mother, but I trust your judgment on these things. It does make sense that he'd tell Palpatine about it, what with him being his supportive mentor figure, greatest confidant and all. Maybe reassurance from him that he knew he wouldn't get from the Jedi and all, who would probably be a bit iffy on the whole murdering sand people thing. After he's freed, Palpatine insists that they have to leave and tries to get Anakin to leave Obi-Wan behind, but Anakin's not having any of it. They try to get to an escape pod, but run right into a force field. This is the oldest trap in the book. You magnificent bastard, I read your book! There are some minor dialogue changes, Palpatine suggesting that maybe they can negotiate now that Dooku's dead, but otherwise it plays out the same way as the movie. This leaves out the comic relief stuff in the elevator shaft, or R2-D2 using his magically disappearing thruster jets to light battle droids on fire too, so it helps keep the tone consistent throughout. And so our heroes, and Palpatine, are brought before... <sighs> General Grievous. Oh, General Grievous. Probably the best single example of all the problems with the films, and it's so frustrating because he's also just such a cool concept. Think about it. He's a CGI character with an awesome design and gimmick, yet lacks backstory or any interesting dialogue. The fights with him are ultimately meaningless, existing purely as spectacle, but unlike even the Phantom Menace fight, the spectacle is not even that impressive. Made worse by the fact that, much like Boba Fett before him, he was introduced in expanded universe material first where he was much cooler and scarier than he is in this movie. On the off chance you are not aware of this, the 2008 Clone Wars TV series was not the first Clone Wars show. From 2003 to 2005, to build hype and anticipation for Revenge of the Sith, a series of 25 short episodes were made helmed by Gendy Tartakovsky. They were pretty good, focusing mostly on action without a ton of dialogue, and General Grievous was introduced there. And he was friggin' terrifying! He ex exemplified the scary idea of mechanical precision and strength in a droid with advanced dexterity that couldn't be done with a living being. Rotating sections, multiple limbs, spinning lightsabers around so rapidly that you had no hope of countering it. Even his design, a skull-like head and a long white cloak covering his almost skeletal interior, a creature that could foreshadow Anakin's fate as something more machine than man since it was actually a cyborg. And none of that carried over into the movie, where Suddenly, there's just this important dude named General Grievous who the characters know about, but the audience doesn't, and as far as we know, he's just some coughing robot with a weird accent, and suddenly he's the villain for a good chunk of the film, because we decided to get rid of Dooku, the villain from the last movie, in the first 15 minutes! The movie tells us not a goddamn thing about him. At least Dooku, for all his own flaws as a character, had a backstory as a former Jedi. Here's an idea. If you really want to foreshadow Vader while also preserving the image of Anakin as a good guy until later, have him spare Dooku. Our heroes escape the ship, but Dooku decides after such a terrible defeat to upgrade himself. Turn Dooku into General Grievous, maybe encouraged to do it after Sidious spurns him, claiming that to be defeated in such a manner makes him a weak and ineffectual apprentice or the like. Oh, and the comic actually leaves out that he has a collection of lightsabers from fallen Jedi like trophies. Sure, it shows that he has lightsabers, but he doesn't say, 
this will make a fine addition to my collection, and all that. But whatever, Obi-Wan and Anakin use the Force to retrieve their sabers and escape. In the ensuing fight, a droid reports that the ship has been damaged in the battle and is falling out of orbit. Deciding that with all the lightsabers and vibroblades, things are getting a bit stuffy on the bridge, Grievous opens up a window and jumps out of it, making his own escape. He makes his way to an escape pod as, I presume, the emergency bulkheads seal the hole he made. Unfortunately, he also launches all the escape pods so our heroes can't use them to leave, forcing Anakin to try to take the controls and crash land the thing. This is not helped by the back half of the ship deciding to snap off. Ironically, this is the USS Darth Maul. They start entering the atmosphere and- Gah! That face! Anakin's gonna eat my soul! Um, anyway, they manage to crash onto a landing strip. Fortunately, Mace Windu is nearby and comes to them as they exit the ship to have a scene that wasn't in the movie. Don't know if it was a deleted scene, haven't seen one like it. They report Dooku's death and Mace Windu thinks that if the Separatists are now leaderless, they should try to arrange a peace treaty with them. Nonsense, Master Windu. With Grievous still alive, their ability to wage war has never been stronger. You are literally standing in the wreckage of one of their ships. I'm inclined to believe they're at least a little weaker. Obi-Wan heads off to brief the Jedi Council while Anakin schmoozes with Senator Organa, aka Leia's future adoptive father. In the movie, their dialogue is pretty much removed to focus on R2 and 3PO for a moment, but it's good to have it here. The end of Count Dooku will surely bring an end to this war, and an end to the Chancellor's draconian security measures. It is admittedly a bit of a tell-don't-show kind of thing, because we don't know what these draconian security measures actually are, but what it is establishing is some people growing upset with things that the Chancellor is doing. More later, of course. Spotting Padme in the shadows, Anakin excuses himself and embraces her. He and Obi-Wan apparently have been away for a while in the Outer Rim sieges, and at this point, Anakin is pretty much ready to go, screw it, I don't care who knows if we're married. The romantic dialogue in this movie versus Attack of the Clones is... not great, but Anakin is no longer embarrassing himself with talking about how much he hates sand versus her smooth skin, so I have a much easier time buying these two as a couple. Padme says she won't let him give up his life as a Jedi for her, then tearfully admits that she's pregnant. Uh, considering Padme doesn't seem to even really be showing yet, just how long was Anakin away at the Outer Rim sieges? On the planet Utapau, Grievous sends the Separatist Council off to the planet Mustafar before talking with Darth Sidious. The Jedi will exhaust their resources looking for you. Given the Jedi Council's track record for this stuff, I just expect them to open a window in the temple and yell out, Hey, has anybody seen the Separatist Council? He also reassures him that the war will be over soon, despite the loss of Count Dooku. The death of Lord Tyrannus was a necessary loss, which will ensure our victory. I will soon have a new apprentice, one younger and more powerful. Count Dooku, old and busted. Anakin Skywalker, new hotness. Anakin has a nightmare, and there's a cute potential reference here. The layout of him waking up and Padme's face are very reminiscent to Anakin's dream from the comic version of Attack of the Clones with regard to his mother. He gets up and looks out onto the city, Padme soon joining him. Anakin? What's bothering you? Nothing. It was a dream. Like the ones I used to have about my mother just before she died. It was about you. Jeez, I wonder how many sand people I'm gonna have to kill this time. He says the dream was about her dying in childbirth. Well, considering the only thing we see of it is her screaming, Help me, Anakin! Seems more likely she's just pissed off during it and wants him to force choke the doctors who keep telling her to breathe and push. She tries to reassure him that it was just a dream, but then again, it's hard to do so when the last time he had dreams of someone in horrible pain and anguish, she ended up tortured to death and all. This baby will change our lives. I doubt the Queen will continue to allow me to serve in the Senate. What the hell is with Naboo? They elect teenagers! to their highest office, they have no standing military forces to defend against attack, and apparently they don't believe in friggin' daycare services! At best, I can believe her having a kid would lead to scandal, but when the hell have we ever seen paparazzi in this universe? I mean, just saying, she was already a well-known, outspoken senator who was frequently the target of assassination attempts. If there were any sneaky reporters, their relationship would have been discovered by now. Concerned about the Jedi Council finding out, she wonders if Obi-Wan could help them somehow. Have you told him anything? No, but he's your best friend. He must suspect something. He's still on the council. Don't tell him anything. Jeez, a few hours ago, you were all gung-ho to reveal it to the galaxy, but now you're all, don't trust my best friend or tell him anything. 
Apparently it ain't just light and dark stuff that Anakin's conflicted about. The comic also wisely leaves out the romantic dialogue between Anakin and Padme. Some of it is just poor writing, like the baffling exchange about how love has blinded Anakin because Padme is so beautiful, while other bits are just poor delivery. You are so beautiful. You look divine. The next scene where Anakin consults Yoda about his premonitions is sadly cut. It serves the purpose of Anakin looking for help and reassurances from a trusted mentor figure in the Jedi, and only getting Yoda to say, Look, death is a part of life and you just gotta accept it. While I'm iffy about Yoda saying, Don't mourn them since they become part of the Force, his more important lesson was that the fear of loss is a path to the dark side, making you more desperate and greedy to hold on to someone instead of accepting what is beyond our control. However, it's a hollow sentiment because of course Anakin can't just accept that the woman he passionately loves so much will be lost. I mean, just remember how emotional he got about her. You're so beautiful. My boat. Okay, bad example, but you get what I mean. Cutting the scene was a mistake. It helps alienate him from the Jedi a bit more because if Yoda, the wisest of them, can't help and see what he needs, what good are they to him? In its place, there's a future scene that's moved up here and who's saying what is rearranged and some lines are missing or added. Basically, Yoda, Mace Windu, and Obi-Wan are discussing how the Chancellor is moving to take control of the Jedi Council, we'll see how in a minute, and Mace senses a plot to destroy the Jedi. The dark side of the Force surrounds the Chancellor, as it surrounds the Separatists. If the Chancellor is being influenced by the Dark Side, then this war may be a plot by the Sith to take over the Republic. It's a good thing he's only influenced by it. I mean, how ridiculous would it be that he's actually a Sith Lord and none of us detected that after so many years? Man, egg on our faces! Yoda says they need proof of this to take to the Council, but Mace Windu says that if the Chancellor doesn't end the war with the destruction of General Grievous, he needs to be removed from office. The comic leaves out the Jedi Council suggesting, hey, maybe we should take over ourselves to secure a transition of power. And Yoda being all, this is a very bad conversation we are having right now. I am of two minds about this. On the one hand, the problem with the version in the movie is that it feels like the Jedi are talking about staging a coup themselves right the hell out of nowhere. But that helps support the idea that the Jedi have become corrupted themselves. But with the comics version, if the Chancellor is trying to take control of the Jedi Council, that's a bigger warning sign about him. And yet Mace only says that he must be removed from office, which could mean through legitimate channels because he's not specific about the Jedi being the ones to do it. In turn, this leaves out Yoda's remark about what a bad idea this is all sounding. Later, Anakin catches up with Obi-Wan, who informs him that the Senate is expected to vote more executive powers to the Chancellor. Anakin doesn't see the big deal there, since it'll make it easier to end the war. Anakin, be careful of your friend the Chancellor. Ah, the comic changed the line! That led to one of the great Greatest riff tracks jokes of all time. Be careful of your friend, Palpatine. And your pal, friend Patine. Anakin expresses his confusion about all this. He knows the Council is afraid of both the Chancellor's growing power and his own, but aren't they all on the same side? The Force grows dark, Anakin, and we are all affected by it. Be wary of your feelings. And that right there should have been a line in the movie. Be wary of your feelings. At the heart of the conflict pulling Anakin apart is one party saying, trust your feelings, you're not wrong to feel this way, and the other saying, you cannot trust yourself or your experiences. Which is why Anakin turns from the Jedi so much. It's just, as we see in the next scene, Lucas keeps writing this conflict as, I am contrarian to whoever I'm talking to. Anakin meets with Palpatine, who informs him that the Senate is about to call on him to take direct control of the Jedi Council. They will no longer report to the Senate, but to him personally. The Senate is too unfocused to conduct a war. This will bring a quick end to things. I mean, technically speaking, haven't the Jedi been the ones conducting the war? What's the Senate doing all this time? The Jedi need to attack a Separatist base, but they're too busy debating zoning regulations or something to decide if they should? And this one line of dialogue would have helped the movie so much. Palpatine given complete authority and control over the Jedi Council. This leads to one of the big problems with the prequels, and we've been building to it since the Phantom Menace's invasion of Naboo, and having to be told that the people are starving and suffering. With the rise of the Empire, we only see things from the perspective of, for lack of a better term, the aristocracy. 
The higher-ups and politicians are the ones we focus on. We don't see how freedoms begin being taken away, how this is becoming a totalitarian state. We are told it is becoming one by the Chancellor getting new powers, but what new powers? What new authority is he exercising? Are we seeing clone troopers on every street corner? Do we see regular citizens getting harassed for no reason? Do we see a conflict between the Jedi and said troopers that would lead to growing mistrust? Are the younglings being taken from the Jedi and put in cages and tortured, forced to accept Sith doctrine? Corrupt businessmen and military officials getting kickbacks and benefits from the oligarchy? Aliens getting less rights and bigoted chanting over not enough humans in positions of power? Power? No, we are told that the Chancellor having more power is bad, and that's it. Why is living under the Empire a bad thing? Why are they so quick to accept the Jedi are bad guys? People keep telling me in spin-off media the public was growing distrustful of the Jedi, but we never see anybody in the films like that. We just have to take their word for it that things are getting worse all the time, that the war is causing so much pain and problems that the Senate is gleefully handing more power to the Chancellor to try to bring things to a swifter end. Yet even the kidnapping of the Chancellor is not shown in the film itself. The enemy forces penetrating what should be the most heavily fortified position in the Republic, the seat of power itself, and we only see things distantly from on high. Was there any devastation wrought upon Coruscant in this attack? Damned if I know, we never see anything like that. Business as usual from outside everybody's giant windows. Even the Tartakovsky Clone Wars, which actually showed the kidnapping of Palpatine, lacked any civilian presence during this attack. You'd think it was one big model city with automated trains as the only indication there might be any other life on this planet. But while the comic still doesn't shift the focus down to show the rise of the Empire from the civilian perspective, it's at least giving us something as to why everyone is growing distrustful of Palpatine. What these new powers actually mean. Direct control of the Jedi Council? At that point, they effectively become his army as opposed to the Republic's. And after two movies of them liking Palpatine and working with him fine, not suspicious of him whatsoever, in this one, it's suddenly just, be wary of Palpatine because shut up. Anyway, let's get back to that contrarian thing. With Obi-Wan, he was all, Dude, why shouldn't we trust the Chancellor with this power? It'll end the war quicker. And now that Palpatine tells him he's doing this, suddenly Anakin's all, um, the Council isn't really in the mood for more amendments. Later, he's gonna do this again. Basically, until Palpatine reveals himself, almost every conversation Anakin has between the Jedi and Palpatine, he's always on the opposite side of the people he's talking to for seemingly no reason. At least, that's how it is in the movie. In the comic, things play out a little differently. In the movie, Palpatine just appoints Anakin as his representative on the Jedi Council, and that's that. Instead, in the comic, we get a continuation of what was started in Attack of the Clones. Palpatine boosts him up, talks about how proud he is of Anakin's accomplishment and power before leading into his misgivings about the Jedi. I fear the Jedi. The Council keeps pushing for more control. They're shrouded in secrecy and obsessed with maintaining their autonomy. Both sides are planting the seeds of doubt in Anakin about the other, but the difference is that Palpatine has actually been supportive of Anakin, whereas every conversation Anakin has with the Jedi has been about their own distrust or telling him not to believe in what he feels. And speaking of stuff that should have been in the movie, we have a deleted scene next. Padme is given the shaft in Revenge of the Sith, where she mostly exists to be pregnant, be worried, or be choked to death. This deleted scene, however, shows her talking with Senator Organa and Mon Ma Mothma, who was also a senator at the time, about how concerned they are about how things are going with Palpatine's growing executive power. Do you think Palpatine will dismantle the Senate? Why bother? As a practical matter, the Senate no longer exists. Weird that it took him 20 years to officially dissolve it then. They are worried about the fact that their own rhetoric sounds a lot like the Separatists, Padme even expressing shock because of how Palpatine used to be a close friend and advisor. Not only is it a reminder that Padme had her own agency and history throughout the prequels, but this is basically setting the stage for the foundation of the Rebellion. Having Padme be a part of that is good, and I have no idea why it was left out. Pacing reasons, maybe, since there are a lot of talky scenes in this one, but it would help break up all the scenes of Anakin arguing with people, since there are like three in a row. Speaking of, the Jedi Council meets with Anakin. Anakin. While they reluctantly approve of his placement on the Council, they don't grant him the rank of Master. What? How can you do this? I'm more powerful than any of you! 
How can I be on the council and not be a master? You ever stop and think about the fact that one of the things that drove Anakin off the rails was just that he got denied a promotion that he hadn't earned? They get him to calm down and discuss the search for Grievous. They suspect he's in the Outer Rim and want Obi-Wan to contact their spies out there for any leads. What of the droid landing on Kashyyyk? I know that system well. It would take us little time to drive the droids off that planet. Skywalker, your assignment is here with the Chancellor. Kenobi must find Grievous. Um, not that Mace is wrong, but why did he bring up Kenobi and Grievous in relation to Kashyyyk? All that he suggested was, hey, I know that system and could probably deal with the problem. Obi-Wan wasn't even mentioned in that. Yoda, who apparently has good relations with the Wookiees, helps that Yoda is a firm Life Day traditionalist, will go instead. Later, the comic once again expands and slightly alters dialogue afterwards, as Anakin complains to Obi-Wan about not being declared a master, despite being on the Council. Obi-Wan points out that he put himself into a delicate situation by being so close to the Chancellor that he was asked to be his representative. And what's more, his frustration is not healthy for him, especially when he suggests that the Jedi Council are just upset because he's the youngest ever to be on it. Anakin, I worry when you speak of jealousy and pride. Those are not Jedi thoughts. They're dangerous, dark thoughts. Jedi High School must be weird. Obi-Wan says that they've approved his placement on the Council because they want him to act as a spy on the Chancellor, report all his dealings to them. Anakin, of course, brings up that this is kind of treasonous, and what's more, he considers Palpatine a personal friend and mentor. Obi-Wan reminds him that his allegiance is to the Senate, not to its leader, one who has already stayed in office beyond his term limits. Use your feelings, Anakin. Something is out of place here. Oh, you mean those things you told him to be wary of? Good that you're being so consistent there, Kenobi. Later, Anakin confides in Padme his same thoughts about the Council that he did to Obi-Wan, thinking that the Council fears his power. Sometimes I wonder what's happening to the Jedi Order. I think this war is destroying the principles of the Republic. You know, the principles of bureaucracy that kept the Senate from aiding the Naboo. Why can't we go back to the good old days, dammit? Padme suggests that maybe the Republic itself is transforming into the evil they hate, but Anakin rejects that outright. She encourages him to try to talk to the Chancellor and push for peace, but Anakin's had enough of everyone trying to tell him what to do in regards to the Chancellor. Hold me, like you did by the lake on Naboo so long ago. Tell me again about how much you hate sand. So let's talk about Padme for a second, because I realized as I revisited these movies, that she is the most consistently written character in the entire prequel trilogy. She's staunchly anti-war in all three films, with Phantom Menace establishing right away that she refuses to take any action that will lead to outright war, even in the face of invasion, thinking that the Republic and the Senate will solve the crisis without the need for it. She was against the formation of the army in Attack of the Clones, despite the growing threat of the Separatists to the point of assassination attempts, and now, in Revenge of the Sith, she's pushing every angle she can to try to to end the war through peaceful means. However, despite this strong anti-war stance, that doesn't mean she's naive or a pacifist. She knows that when the chips are down, at some point you have to be willing to fight. We see that in Phantom Menace when she elects to ally with the Gungans with a military action. In Attack of the Clones, when it becomes clear that negotiation with the Separatists is impossible, she'll pick up a gun and help pursue Count Dooku to take him down. And now here, in the face of the Republic becoming totalitarian, she's working with others to start up a proper rebellion if things don't go the way she hopes they do. Padme is strong, firm in her convictions, and ready to do whatever she has to to secure a better future. I may make fun of the goofy queen outfits, the terrible romance dialogue, and the occasional flat delivery, but honestly, the character herself is really good when you actually stop and think about her. Like I said, it's a pity this movie does her such a disservice by excising some of her scenes. Anyway, later Anakin is summoned by Chancellor Palpatine to the opera he's watching. The comic doesn't show what the opera is, but the movie portrays some kind of weird Final Fantasy X blitzball bubble thing with creatures swimming between orbs of water. You know, Anakin, I was once the star player of the Xanarkin Daves. Palpatine continues trying to sway Anakin to his way of thinking, knowing full well that the Jedi have asked him to spy for them. All those who gain power are afraid to lose it. Even the Jedi. The Jedi use their power for good. Good is a point of view, Anakin. For instance, some would say that this opera we're watching is good. Trust me, it is not.
The Jedi point of view is not the only valid one. The Dark Lords of the Sith believe in security and justice also, yet they are considered by the Jedi to be evil. Yeah, but you don't see the Jedi trying to create as many doomsday weapons as the Sith, so I think one side is leaning more on the evil scale. Yet the Sith and the Jedi are similar in almost every way, including their quest for greater power. The difference between the two is that the Sith are not afraid of the dark side of the Force. That is why they are more powerful. Palpatine attempting to use the both sides mind trick. Anakin counters that the Sith rely on self-interest for their strength, whereas the Jedi are meant to be selfless. The fear of losing power is a weakness of both the Jedi and the Sith. You know, I joked about the opera being bad, but Palpatine summoned Anakin here to have a philosophical debate with him instead of watching it, so it can't be that good. And thus it's time for the scene that many cite as possibly the best of the entire prequel trilogy. Or at the very least, even if they hate the prequels, it's still one of the few good things to come out of it. Have you ever heard the tragedy of Darth Plagueis? He thought you could treat midi-chlorians with antibiotics. It didn't go well. He was a dark lord of the Sith. So powerful and wise, he could use the Force to influence the midi-chlorians to create life. Unfortunately, the only thing he created were bees that smelled like gasoline. He wasn't very good at it. He had such knowledge of the dark side that he could even keep the ones he cared about from dying. A fancy way of saying he was rich and could afford good health care. He could actually keep someone safe from death. He taught his apprentice everything he knew, and then his apprentice killed him in his sleep. Plagueis never saw it coming. I noticed the comic omits that he was nicknamed Darth Plagueis the Wise. Good call there. He could save others from death, but not himself. Is it possible to learn this power? Not from a Jedi. Although there are tutorials on WikiHow. The Darth Plagueis scene is dripping in atmosphere, and it's a nice change in tactics for manipulation. Anakin is beginning to teeter on the edge of the dark side as he feels like he's being pulled between Palpatine and the Jedi. So this scene shows a different, subtler approach to pushing Anakin after it seems like the the Sith and the Jedi are the same thing approach seems to fall flat, reminding him of his fear of Padme dying. It's also one of the few scenes in any Star Wars movies that we actually get any insight into the Sith beyond they're bad guys who use the dark side. It's not a lot, but it shows something. Bear in mind, the word Sith is never used in the original trilogy. This was the first real chance for the movies, which I remind you is pretty much the only thing the majority of viewers will ever watch to get into the long time opposite of the Jedi. It's not a lot, but anything is nice. I like that we're not certain if Palpatine was Plagueis' apprentice, or if this was just indeed a story he knew. Forget the expanded universe stuff that went into detail. Let this scene be as a movie where you're in Anakin's shoes and you're not quite sure about this stuff either. I also like that while it's implied that this may have been how Anakin was created, they don't confirm it. I don't like the Anakin as virgin birth thing. I'm pretty sure that was done just so they didn't need to have some family lineage about Luke's grandfather or anything. But implying some Dark Lord of the Sith created an artificial pregnancy in a random woman in the desert is detestable and icky on so many levels, especially in an all-ages franchise, and we really do didn't need that as fact in the universe. And no, I don't care what some comic says about it. It's better if we don't know. The virgin birth thing is even more ridiculous because it turns Anakin from some tragic tale of a guy who was seduced by the dark side into the most super special awesomest most important guy ever. But yeah, the Plagueis scene is arguably the best scene in any of the prequels. But unfortunately, while it is the best scene, it still has some problems. See, once again, Lucas's failures as a writer rear their ugly head. Just the signs that there weren't enough drafts, revisions, or script editors who looked at this and found the contradictions or confusing parts, or made him alter something so it would fit better with what he was saying. The tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise is not actually that big of a tragedy. The implication is it's a tragedy because of his overwhelming desire to keep the people around him from dying, but Palpatine doesn't say he was obsessed with keeping people from dying. Maybe he was just a smart guy who could extend life or rejuvenate it. That's not tragic, that's cool. 
Hell, we don't even know what keep the ones he cared about from dying actually means. Did his cousin get chopped in half and he kept them alive through sheer willpower? Does he have his best friend's head in a jar that he keeps alive? Or does he mean, like I suggested, that he could stop old age from killing them? There's a lot of wiggle room there. Mind you, the movie has one thing going for it that the comic, for whatever reason, left out. The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be unnatural. That implies the power is like necromancy or something, and it's creepy as all hell, but again, the vagueness doesn't help. But yeah, that's all the story is. A dude has a cool power, his apprentice learned it, and then killed him. That's not a tragedy, that's a Tuesday for the Sith. The other problem is, like so much else, the line delivery. Not during Palpatine's explanation of the legend itself, but right before it. Anakin's supposed to still be torn, but his reactions to things like Palpatine saying, I think the Jedi are going to try to take over the Republic, elicits the same emotional response as if he just learned a TV show he liked got preempted by a half hour. It's not helped by Palpatine's own underplaying of the whole thing. Sure, of course he's not actually worried about any of this, but when you say the guys who can telekinetically lift the entire Senate chamber and crumple it like a piece of paper are gonna stage a coup, maybe you should express a little concern to keep up the act? I'll grant you that Anakin's not really thinking straight right now, which is why he probably doesn't pick up on the guy who he has been warned seems to be surrounded by the dark side is now openly talking about how he knows things about the dark side and all that, but it seems like he should be at least a little suspicious of this. After a scene not in the movie where Obi-Wan meets with Padme and basically admits that he knows about their relationship and wants her to help Anakin any way she can, Obi-Wan is called away because they've located General Grievous and want him to go after him. He and Anakin say their farewells, with Anakin even admitting his own arrogance and frustration have been taken out on Obi-Wan unfairly. Obi-Wan says how proud he is of Anakin. Goodbye, old friend. May the Force be with you. May the Force be with you. It's a good bit there to make sure that they have one last scene together as friends because they're supposed to be best friends and their relationship ends in tragedy. It helps justify Obi-Wan's comments from A New Hope. And he was a good friend. The problem is, for whatever reason, Lucas decided that this scene should be immediately followed up by one where Anakin is paranoid and moody about Obi-Wan for absolutely no reason. Seriously, after they say goodbye, boom, Anakin is with Padme and he senses that Obi-Wan was there and he's suddenly paranoid that Obi-Wan was there. If we had anything, anything earlier to show why he'd be distrustful of Obi-Wan, like if he had overheard him talking to another Jedi and only heard his own name in a grim tone or something, maybe that'd justify his growing distrust, but instead it's just... Wait, Obi-Wan was here talking to my girlfriend? Grrr! This conversation transitions to Anakin briefly being concerned about how despite being a Jedi, he's craving more power. I have found a way to save you. I am becoming so powerful with my new knowledge of the Force, I will be able to keep you from dying. Yeah, this dialogue ain't in the movie, and rightfully so. Has it been weeks since the Opera House? Has Palpatine been training him in this new knowledge of the Force? Maybe we could see Palpatine doing that, or, like, Anakin hitting some books or something? Obi-Wan arrives on Utapau and learns from the locals that Grievous is indeed there with an army of thousands of battle droids. This is reported to the Council, who order Anakin to tell the Chancellor this, and his reaction will hopefully allow them to discern his true intentions. Obi-Wan, in the meantime, acquires a ride. I need transportation. Get it for me. You need transportation. I will get it for you. Ah, following in his master's footsteps of stealing from locals. And thus he gets this giant feather iguana thing. Boga. She answers to Boga. Good girl, Boga. I look forward to the comments about the extensive backstory that Boga has. So, major change from the movie to the comic here and an improvement in my opinion. In the comic, Obi-Wan climbs up the side of a ridge and encounters Grievous alone and decides to take him on. In the movie, he sneaks above where Grievous is, surrounded by hundreds of battle droids, and just drops down. Hello there. This is stupid on so many levels, and I am baffled by it. The line itself feels like it's meant to be clever or something, like he's leading into a joke. You know, something like this. Excuse me, can you help me? I'm a spy. <laughs> but even if you ignore that, 
Why in God's name would you drop down like that? I know I make fun of the efficacy of the battle droids, but make no mistake, that many should kill him. And they have no reason not to. Dooku was the one who wanted to turn Obi-Wan, not Grievous. They treat this like it's some personal, long-established rivalry between the two, and that's why Obi-Wan thinks he'll be fine. But if you only watch the movies, Grievous has only just appeared, and there is no history between these two. They have no reason to not just slaughter him on the spot. It's mind-boggling that this is happening at all, and the ensuing fight does not help. In the comic, it makes sense. He's alone, unguarded, he thinks he can handle this. But in the movie, after easily dispatching Grievous' guards, Grievous unveils his very cool trick, actually having four arms, each one with a lightsaber, and Obi-Wan grins. GRINS! Each one of those lightsabers is from a Jedi who was killed by Grievous. Even if you ignore the coughing fits he has, Grievous is such an advanced cyborg that he can hide extra limbs and is incredibly dexterous and can move in the vacuum of space without difficulty. Even if the other battle droids weren't there aiming guns, Grievous is not someone Obi-Wan should feel confident about taking on single-handedly. And certainly not grin at the sight of four lightsabers wielded by this guy ready to slice him apart! Comic version? No facial reaction from him, just the really cool image of Grievous wielding those sabers while still wearing the cape. That's actually pretty damn badass. Attack, Kenobi! I have been trained in your Jedi arts by Count Dooku himself. Behold, Jedi! The power of the Windmill! I'm not even kidding. In the movie, he has two of his arms rapidly spinning the blades like a fan, and then stops for some reason. Anyway, in the ensuing fight, he cuts off two of Grievous' hands and then destroys his remaining lightsabers. In the struggle, Obi-Wan's lightsaber is lost, but he grabs a nearby gun and uses it to shoot Grievous dead. Obi-Gun Kenobi! <laughs> the comic also leaves out the bizarre moment where we get a close-up shot of Grievous' and Obi-Wan's eyes as if this was really intense and he's all, You're doomed, Jedi! And Obi-Wan's cunning retort. Oh, I don't think so. God, it's like placeholder dialogue that he never got around to thinking of something better to put in. That's a recurring thing that's so irritating about these movies. It feels like dialogue is written with a particular plot development in mind, but then George Lucas decided to go in a different direction and then never bothered to go back and change the lines to match with how things progressed. That's why oftentimes the writing feels like a first draft, hence stuff like, I sense a trap, and then they're not actually being a trap. It's the same way with this dialogue that seems like they're leading into a quip or a badass action movie one-liner, and instead we get, Oh, I don't think so. Hell, remember last time with sypho -Dyas? As people were so keen to inform me, it was originally supposed to be sypho which is a corruption of Sidious, to hint that it was an actual person. But there was a typo, and he decided, yeah, that's a cool name for a Jedi. I'm just gonna make him a new character. And then never explain anything about who the hell sypho -Dyas is in the movie! Palpatine is informed of all this, and he starts pushing Anakin again. Anakin, you must break through the fog of lies the Jedi have created around you. Let me help you learn the true ways of the Force. Chancellor, how do you know the ways of the Force? Wait, only now are you asking that? You were just spewing bullcrap to Padme, weren't you? Your new knowledge of the Force was you just googling dark side powers for keeping people from dying, wasn't it? Palpatine admits that his mentor taught him everything about the Force, including the nature of the dark side. A few stray neurons finally fire in Anakin's head. You're a Sith Lord! Actually, I'm genuinely curious now. For those of you who were little kids and saw the prequels as your first Star Wars movies, were you actually surprised by this revelation? Like with other scenes, the dialogue has been rearranged a bit. In the movie, it's Palpatine admitting that he knows about Anakin's dreams about Padme that gets Anakin to realize he's Sidious. Whereas here, it's that he knows about the dark side. I'm pretty sure in the movie this was not intentional on Palpatine's part, that he just realized that he probably pushed too far too early and just decided to go all in at that point. In the comic, he pushes Anakin's buttons about his distrust of the Jedi, making a little speech about how much he fears that they'll destroy him and that his only chance 
chance to defend himself and save Padme is to learn to control the dark side. Anakin leaves, intending to turn him into the Jedi Council, but of course Palpatine is acting all civil and reasonable. He informs Mace Windu of this, and he takes some Jedi over to confront the Chancellor, ordering Anakin to stay put and meditate, since it's clear he's full of internal conflict. Mace and three other Jedi arrive to inform the Chancellor that Grievous is dead, and that the war is over. However, they say that they're here to arrest him, and thus we get to Palpatine pulling out a red lightsaber and fighting them. Like with Yoda last time, I am not fond of Palpatine leaping around and wielding a lightsaber. At least with Yoda, even if you ignore the philosophical implications of him fighting with one, it's kind of cool to see him so acrobatic and dexterous and whatnot. Not so much with Palpatine. He's wearing this incredibly bulky outfit, and yet he's spinning around in the air and somehow moving so fast as to kill three of them so quickly, and it just looks absolutely ridiculous. It also doesn't help that, yet again, for all the bluster about these dark, evil powers and abilities and mastery of the Force and stuff, it just comes down to some old dude waving around a laser sword. The comic at least cuts down the length of it, and since it's just motion lines, it doesn't look as silly. It's still a little silly, admittedly. It also helps that it didn't include a few lines that have become... mimetic. I am the Senate. It's treason, then. No. 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 You are God! Anakin, deeply worried about Padme's potential fate, arrives to find Mace and Palpatine engaged in battle, with Palpatine finally unleashing the lightning. Anakin! He's a traitor! He'll betray you just as he betrayed me! Yeah, that might hold a little more water if you hadn't already admitted to being the Dark Lord of the Sith who started the war and is literally shooting lightning out of your hands! You're not one of them, Anakin! UNLIMITED POWER, ANAKIN! HELP ME! Yeah, another meme line that doesn't really translate to the comic. And for both movie and comic, why did he even yell that? Also, the comic doesn't show the lightning being reflected back at Palpatine, so he just shifts to melty grandpa face for no reason. Mace wants to press the attack and finally kill him, but Anakin insists he has to be kept alive. Movie did it better because he at least shouted that he needs him, but either way, the result is the same. Mace Windu disarmed and thrown out a window. What have I done? That line should not have been in the comic or movie, in my opinion. Even after this, he's still conflicted, which will lead into my larger issue in a minute. At this point, he should be committed, but even now he's portrayed as uncertain and just as confused as he was a few scenes ago, as if nothing has changed. Palpatine says they can now bring order to the galaxy and save Padme's life if he becomes his apprentice. I want the power to stop death. Yeah, I'm betting Mace Windu would appreciate that power right now if he wasn't an overcooked pancake. You were right. The Jedi betrayed both of us. I pledge myself to the ways of the Sith. How did the Jedi betray you, exactly? Anakin Skywalker, you are one with the Order of the Sith Lords. Henceforth, you shall be known as Darth Vader. Go to the Jedi Temple. Do what must be done, Lord Vader. Show no mercy. Then go to the Mustafar system. Wipe out the Separatist leaders. And once more, the Sith will rule the galaxy. And we shall have peace. Fat chance of that, Palpatine. I mean, this franchise ain't called Star Peace. So, yeah. This doesn't work. It really doesn't. I saw this in theaters in 2005, age 17, last day of high school in fact. My family went out to see it that night, and even as I watched it, I thought he turned too easily. Fifteen years later, now that I'm older and have again revisited these and thought more about it, considered all these alternate ways they could have done this story, I think I figured out exactly what the problem is. It's not that Anakin's fall to the dark side is unconvincing, it's that he's not there yet. These last two movies do a good job of putting him on that path, but it's still a huge leap from I have some fascistic tendencies and I'm conflicted because of my dreams to I will murder not only innocent children, but people I've known almost all my life. He's getting there, 
but he's not there yet. We needed more early red flags, like him feeling less conflicted about killing Dooku. Maybe Obi-Wan being the one to say, that was wrong, but Anakin saying, why, he was our enemy. That sort of thing. Even him killing the Tusken Raiders, where he did explicitly kill children, He's disgusted with himself afterwards for it. He's so guilty and confused and recognizing that these are bad things. And that was a fit of rage from his mother getting killed. You can't even use that same excuse for what happens later with him killing the kids in the temple. It comes across like every step he takes towards the dark side, he quickly starts backing up again. The movies needed him to be a good guy because it's a story about the tragedy of Anakin Skywalker turning to the dark side. But the movies have been so worried about about him not coming across as a good person that they forget he needs to become a bad person. There's no turning point where that happens. Even after killing Mace Windu, he's all, what have I done? Even now he's conflicted. He went from running down a path to pole vaulting to the end of it. Another thing that would have worked? In the comic here, he says that the Jedi betrayed him too. Maybe instead of Anakin slicing off Mace's hands, how about Mace, in his anger, turns his lightsaber on Anakin, and he instinctively brings his saber up to defend himself? Mace realizes his own mistake and starts saying an apology, but the opening is enough for Sidious to blast him out a window. Anakin thinks the Jedi just betrayed him, and that's what makes him turn. Or hell, maybe Mace is actually that enraged, and Anakin tries to stop him, and Mace is all, You're as bad as him, Skywalker! I'll stop you too! And that solidifies his belief belief that the Jedi were planning to betray him. But this, this, this is too quick. He's suddenly all aboard the dark side train. Hell, he doesn't even embrace the dark side. He's just willing to do whatever Palpatine says. That's not being seduced by the dark side. It's just blackmail. Palpatine's masterstroke is enacted and sends out a mass transmission to all the clone troopers. Execute Order 66. It's gonna be really awkward when there's one clone trooper battalion that has bad reception, mishears what Palpatine says, and just replies to him, Noice. And indeed, the clone troopers turn on the Jedi wherever they are, murdering them throughout the galaxy. It's not a bad sequence at all, but this is also why I kinda wish Anakin had become Darth Vader at the end of Episode 2. I'm not such a stickler for continuity about this, but Obi-Wan said in A New Hope that Vader helped hunt down and destroy the Jedi, implying that he was actively going after them across the galaxy, like a space slasher movie where Vader killed them from the shadows or something. I remember long before an actual trailer for Episode 3 came out, I saw, like, a fan-made Lego one where some dark force was killing Jedi in secret, and I like that idea. Again, Order 66 is fine, no objection to it, I just think that would have been an interesting idea. The comic actually shows more of it than the movie did, a lot more Jedi getting blasted, and instead of Yoda decapitating the two troopers who were going to kill him, it's him, Chewbacca, and some other Wookiee having a close-range fight against them. Oh, yeah, Chewbacca's in this movie too because fan service. And again, two characters who previously had no connection whatsoever, Yoda and Chewbacca, know each other now because the Force likes making bizarre coincidences. Back on Coruscant, Senator Organa witnesses the clone troopers attack the Jedi Temple, them even taking some pot shots at him, but ultimately let him get away because he's not a Jedi. Anakin stops by to see Padme and inform her that the Jedi just tried to stage a coup, much to her disbelief. He even mentions traitors in the Senate trying to take advantage of the situation, so I'm guessing Palpatine is having himself a little Knight of the Long Knives for any of his potential political opponents. He informs Padme that he's going to Mustafar to deal with the Separatist leadership. The comic leaves out the scene of him killing the kids at the temple, and I am of two minds about this. On one hand, in the movie it's pretty ballsy in an all-ages franchise to act actually show him murder kids, and it really does illustrate that there's no going back for him. Bear in mind, Vader's redemption only comes at the cost of his own life. There is no reasonable scenario where he turns to the light earlier and is walking around in, like, white armor or something. Yes, I know that happens in a comic. But at the same time, like I rambled about before, he kind of went from conflicted about the Jedi and the Chancellor to I will slice innocent children in half without even the rage of my mom dying as an excuse in like 15 minutes. So not showing that seems like a smarter move narratively. Senator Organa manages to acquire a Jedi homing beacon and heads out into space to try to find any surviving Jedi and protect them before they walk into the massacre. He meets up with Obi-Wan and Yoda, both of whom escape 
from their attacks. How many more Jedi managed to survive? We've heard from none. We can only hope that some have managed to escape to the expanded universe. The Jedi Temple is emitting a coded retreat signal to all Jedi, a trap to lure them back to be killed, so our heroes elect to head there to disable the signal. While Anakin arrives on Mustafar and starts killing the Separatist leaders, who have also disabled their droid armies per Sidious' orders, though I wonder why he didn't elect to just keep the droid army and claim that they were taken from the Separatists, the Senate meets for Palpatine's speech. He claims the Jedi attacked him and attempted to seize power, but now that their attempted insurrection is over and the Separatists are defeated, the Republic will be reorganized into the First Galactic Empire to be ruled by the Senate and a sovereign ruler chosen for life. And everyone seems pretty okay with this for some reason. But then again, they kept granting him new authorities, so this is just formalizing it all. So this is how Liberty dies. With thunderous applause. Okay, that's actually a great line. Kudos, Lucas. Organa doesn't want this to happen, but Padme says they can't do anything now. But there will be a time in the future, again hinting at the Rebellion. At the Jedi Temple, Obi-Wan has reconfigured the signal to warn the Jedi away. And while I don't really follow Rebels or Clone Wars, yeah, yeah, I know they're supposed to be good, I'm just not interested, I do recommend looking up Obi-Wan's message, because it's actually pretty damn good. Would have been a great way to end the movie, honestly. Though, of course, it wasn't written at that point, so what you gonna do? Anyway, Obi-Wan decides to dig deeper and finds hologram recordings of the attack in the temple, including how Anakin helped kill everyone there. Also, apparently Sidious stopped by so he could announce that his name is Darth Vader now. Obi-Wan wants to be sent to go kill the Emperor, since he can't bring himself to kill Anakin. Oh yeah, that'll help the Jedi's image at this point. But Yoda says he's not powerful enough to take someone like that on. He's not wrong, given how easily Sidious walked through the Force sent after him, Though why not just both go together? Best case scenario, I think they assume they have to kill both at once, or the other will escape justice, but it's not like the Emperor will go anywhere, especially after he's finally executed his endgame. Kill Anakin first, then go after the Emperor together. Anyway, Obi-Wan goes to Padme first so they can compare notes. Padme disbelieving that Anakin would turn to the dark side or kill kids like in the recordings. Obi-Wan recognizes that Anakin's the father of her children and apologizes to her. She goes off to take a ship to Mustafar, Obi-Wan secretly stowing away to follow. Yoda heads to the Chancellor's office at the Senate to confront Palpatine. Master Yoda, you survived. Surprised? Eh, not really. I mean, you had Wookiees on your side. While they begin their fight, Padme arrives on Mustafar and meets with Anakin. Obi-Wan told me terrible things. He said you've turned to the dark side? That you killed- Obi-Wan was with- Gah! Again with the weird Anakin face! Jeez, this is why they had everyone give such a low-key acting in these movies. When you transcribe emotionality to art like this, you get that. Anyway, Anakin claims that Obi-Wan is just trying to turn her against him and that he's super duper powerful. I don't want your power or your protection. Anakin, all I want is your love. Love won't save you. Only my new powers can do that. What new powers? For God's sakes, can we have something that shows Anakin has gotten more powerful? I mean, even Dooku could shoot lightning, but Vader never does. Or does more power just mean I can do somersaults in the air better? We don't have to hide anymore. I have brought peace to the Republic. I am more powerful than the Chancellor. I can overthrow him. And together, you and I can rule the galaxy, make things the way we want them to be. He's been on the dark side for like an hour, and already he's talking about killing Palpatine. I don't think the rule of two thing is working out as well as hoped, honestly. I don't believe what I'm hearing. Obi-Wan was right. Look, honey, I don't know if you've noticed, but it has been a crazy day. Could we please talk about this later? Anakin rants some more. I don't want to hear any more about Obi-Wan. The Jedi turned against me. The Republic turned against me. Don't you turn against me. Everybody betrayed me. I fed up with his world. He spots Obi-Wan emerging from the ship and assumes she brought him, and thus indeed betrayed him, and starts force choking her. Yep, trapped alone with a creepy guy who can choke me with his mind. This is what I was afraid of back on Naboo. Called it. He shoves her into a wall with the Force, which honestly makes a lot more sense for killing her than just choking her for a few seconds. You turned her against me! This is the human condition of madness, Lita. It is. You did that yourself! I love how Obi-Wan's attitude in the scene can be summed up as, Dude, I left you alone for five minutes! I have brought peace and security to my new empire! Your new empire? 
My allegiance is to the Republic, Anakin! If you are not with me, then you are my enemy! And they cross sabers. What, no, only a Sith deals in absolutes? Almost like that was a really stupid line, and it was good to be cut. Back over to the fight between Sidious and Yoda. You will not stop me. Darth Vader will become more powerful than either of us. It's such a weird statement. Why would he want Vader to become more powerful than him? And he doesn't! He just picks Sidious up and tosses him down a hole. Any reasonably fit person could do that, you wrinkly old weirdo. These movies are so obsessed with trying to convince the audience how super amazingly awesome and powerful Darth Vader is. A prophecy, constant proclamations about how strong he is. And even the guy who manipulated things for years masterfully is boasting about how wonderful he is. What's the point of that? Oh, and yeah, the fight between Yoda and Sidious is the most over-the-top, ridiculous nonsense. It looked bad enough with Sidious's flips against Mace Windu, but now it's even more awkward when he's wearing huge bulky robes everywhere and Yoda's just a tiny little goblin jumping around. The comic has the good sense to skip the part where they start tossing those spinning senate discs at each other and Yoda just falls down because of force lightning that he apparently forgot how to deflect from the last movie. Yoda slips down somewhere and lands in Senator Organa's car that he just had sitting there at the ready I guess. Failed I have. Well, what's stopping you from going back up there? In the movie, he even says he needs to go into exile for his failure instead of, you know, organizing a resistance, trying to find Force-sensitive children to help train his Jedi for the future, you know, anything else. Nah, just become a weird old hermit because some other old dude zapped you with lightning. There is logic in what he says. And back over to the much more interesting fight. As I've said, I much prefer lightsaber fights where we have a more emotional connection to the characters. We don't need one with the villain necessarily, but it helps and this one is definitely up there. Two best friends now turned into enemies. Really my problem with it is just how over the top it goes. They're zipping around everywhere, hanging from tall towers, balancing on beams. It's trying to make it seem like the most epic confrontation in the history of Evar, but it's not really helped by it intercutting with the Yoda and Sidious fight. Fortunately, the comic changes that by having the Sidious fight over and done with fairly quickly so we can focus on Anakin versus Obi-Wan and cut down to about three or four pages. Probably could have gone on longer, especially since the movies went on for quite a bit long. Probably longer than it needs to be thanks to the interspersing. But here it's a good length. When I first saw this, I was less impressed with the fight because the two had the same lightsaber color, so it didn't seem as visually interesting to me and made it harder to follow who was doing what. As an adult, I actually appreciate it a lot more, especially the comics version, because everything here is so deeply red and yellow and dark, but then there are these two blue sabers that help stand out. Unfortunately, the movie suffers a bit from this, because while it's easier to see the sabers, Anakin and Obi-Wan's own clothes end up blending into everything, which again, makes it harder to tell what's happening in the fight, not helped by the screen flashing each time the sabers collide. It's not impossible to follow, but it kind of wears on the eyes a bit. Eventually, Obi-Wan gets to some rocks and Anakin jumps at him. They leave out Eye of the High Ground, which kind of sucks because, hey, memorable mimetic lines. But then again, from this shot in the comic, Anakin looks like he has the high ground. Obi-Wan swings and, with one smooth motion, takes out Anakin's legs and remaining arm. The comic also unfortunately underplays Obi-Wan's final lines to him. His expression is distant and blank, and he's not screaming this like he should. It's probably the best moment of Ewan McGregor's time in the role. You were the chosen one! It was said you would destroy the Sith, not join them! Well, to be fair, Obi-Wan, we never saw the text of this prophecy, so I'm not sure you ever did either. Maybe it actually said, they will bring balance to the Force by destroying those stinking Jedi and their corrupting light side. I HATE YOU! Yeah, considering he just cut off your remaining limbs and you got set on fire, that's pretty fair. Obi-Wan takes Anakin's lightsaber and leaves just as clone troopers arrive to rescue Anakin and get him into a medical capsule. We cut over to a remote asteroid station where Yoda is convening with, believe it or not, Qui-Gon Jinn! Failed to stop the Sith Lord I have. Still much to learn there is. With my help, you will be able to merge with the Force at will. Eternal life. The ability to defy death can be achieved, but only for oneself. A shaman of the Whills discovered the secret. What the hell are the Whills? Something that our creator can't let go of for some reason. 
but it will never be accomplished by a Sith Lord. Oh boy, is there a lot of expanded universe stuff and a movie that says otherwise. And as such... A great Jedi Master you have become, Qui-Gon Jinn. Your apprentice I gratefully become. Yes, it's a good thing I learned how to become a ghost in the two minutes after I got stabbed. In all seriousness, I do actually love the idea of Qui-Gon passing on this kind of knowledge. It makes his presence in The Phantom Menace more important, elevating Episode One a bit. I wonder why the scene never actually made it into the movie. Was Liam Neeson just not available to record the cameo? Padme's in the medical bay delivering her twin children, and like I said, I have an easier time believing that she was dying from getting thrown into a wall than in the movie where some medical droid just says she lost the will to live. I was gonna have to dig up a Dr. Cox clip if they use that here, but yeah. She dies saying that she knows they're still good in Anakin. Later, Yoda, Senator Organa, and Obi-Wan discuss what to do with the kids, including how they need to send Padme's body to Naboo and make her appear to still be pregnant. Organa volunteers to adopt Leia. And what about the boy? To his family on Tatooine he should go. Wait, how do they know about them? After episode two, did Anakin have a debriefing session where he said, I defied orders to go looking for my mom, which I know forming attachments is against the Jedi code, but I had a bad dream. After discovering I had a stepbrother and stepdad, I went hunting for her kidnappers and I slaughtered them like animals. And not just the men, but the women and the children too. Can I still be a Jedi? I mean, I can believe that he told Obi-Wan about meeting them, but it feels like a lost bit of character development. Maybe a scene where he mentions, I have a stepbrother, but you're my real brother, Obi-Wan. Or something along those lines would have been nice. Obi-Wan says he'll watch over the kid, with Yoda expressing that the Force runs strong in the Skywalker line, but only for space, Jesus kids. Screw you, Shmi. And that they can only hope that someday they can stop Sidious. In your solitude on Tatooine, training I have for you. Wait, Yoda, I need to go back to the Jedi Temple and pick up one of those training droids for younglings. Imagine what I'd do without one. No, he talks about how Qui-Gon Jinn can contact him and teach him the ways of joining the Force. 3PO and R2 were along for this ride. Makes me really wonder if R2 had any opinions about Anakin turning evil and yet was gung-ho about all this. And Organa decides to give them to Captain Antilles, who runs the ship they escaped on. Clean them up and have the protocol droid's memory wiped. Otherwise, he might recognize Owen and Beru at some point and then they'd realize he wasn't just some random protocol droid. Okay, wiping C-3PO's memory to preserve the secret of the kids being born is fine, but why are you ignoring R2? Do they think that information can't be downloaded from his memory banks? Or do they think no one can understand his beeps? Over on Coruscant, Anakin has of course been placed in the Darth Vader armor to save his life. Lord Vader, can you hear me? Yes, my master. Where is Padme? Is she alright? It seems in your anger... You killed her. Wait, I was dismembered and set on fire and put into a robot suit, but you can't do the same for her? What the hell, man? And of course, Vader in his anger destroys everything and lets out the epic, No! As I mentioned in the Sins Past review, I think a moment like this would have been stronger with just a yell and not actually saying, No! Kudos to the artwork, though, for capturing the moment effectively. This splash page has actually become semi-memetic on its own. And so our comic ends with a montage of where everybody ends up. Yoda arrives on Dagobah. Eh, grave mistake I may have made with this choice. Vader and Sidious see the Death Star under construction, which apparently takes 20 years to finish. Leia is on Alderaan, and Obi-Wan delivers Luke to Owen and Beru on Tatooine as they observe the setting suns. So, you're not gonna believe this, but in my opinion, this comic is actually pretty damn good. In fact, this is one of those rare cases where the comic is better than the movie. Despite a few goofy facial expressions, I'm especially fond of the art style for this one. A kind of semi-realistic penciling and shading with coloring done over it. The inking being much lighter than the usual strong black lines you'd normally have in a comic. It adapts a lot of the stronger moments of the film effectively while also giving their own spin on scenes. More often than not, an improvement over the original's version of events. It also leaves out a lot of stupider lines from the movie that I was fully planning on making fun of. Sith Lords are our special. From my point of view, the Jedi are evil! She has lost the will to live.
As a result, the overall writing is a lot stronger, with deleted scenes and dialogue exchanges making more sense than in the finished product. It's still not perfect, but it's a lot better, and without the clunkier delivery of the lines it conveys the tone it was going for. The pacing is so much better in the comic, too. When you actually watch, say, the Jedi Council meeting with them, declaring the attack on the Wookiees, it's so slow. There are a few seconds between anyone speaking. You can call it calm Jedi patience or whatever, but it makes for a boring, laid-back experience when you're watching it. Any non-action scenes can sometimes feel like that. Just this prevailing feeling of lethargy, a lack of enthusiasm for the material, no sense of urgency about anything. Even a few of the action scenes are like that. When Anakin and Obi-Wan escape from Grievous on his ship, there's lightsabers flashing and droids getting cut in half, but it takes a minute or two for music to start playing, so the mood isn't exciting or anything. Just another day at the office for the Jedi! The comic keeps things interesting. There may not be an abundance of action scenes, but this is a movie that's all about the characters. As for the film, and the prequel trilogy overall, here are some final thoughts. Most of what I have to say about this movie I've said throughout. Anakin's turn to the dark side feels rushed, line delivery is still pretty bad, and it chopped out a lot of good stuff. While there are still plenty of problems with the CGI in this movie, I will say that when it comes to, say, the CGI Yoda, it's actually vastly improved over Attack of the Clones. Part of the problem with these early entirely CG characters is that they only had them move when they were talking, or had very deliberate motions. Even the mocap stuff with Jar Jar was very very janky in his movements. As such, when they stop talking, they just seem to suddenly freeze in place for a moment. In this movie, Yoda feels more real, as if he was an actual living thing interacting with them. It's not perfect, but it's much better than last time. The technology had finally started catching up with the ambition of the film. And then there's the thing that people are still commenting on. The whole Jedi bringing about their own downfall, their arrogance and hubris and all that. The problem comes down to framing. You can list off the individual plot points that occur to support this argument, but the issue is the movie's presentation of those points does not, in my opinion, support the argument. As an analogy, the romance in Attack of the Clones is not framed as creepy and awkward. It's presented in a straightforward manner of star-crossed lovers. It does not actually recognize the thing that we see from the actors' performances. That this is wrong and uncomfortable. As far as the movie is concerned, Anakin's I don't like sand, but your skin is smooth and nice isn't something we're supposed to be creeped out by. And thus, by that token, the Jedi are not framed as arrogant, emotionless fools but wise guardians of the light. A Jedi Master uses his powers to take things for the sake of expedience, and that's considered normal. A Jedi Master will rig gambling to win in his favor, and Jar Jar grins at that. A Jedi Master will steal from someone to get what he wants through attempted mind control when the individual refuses their payment method. A Jedi Padawan and Master torture and interrogate a suspect in the streets, and none of it is ever called out. No one reacts with shock and horror at this. There's no dark music sting to indicate that they're going too far. A Jedi slaughters children in a fit of rage at the death of his mother, and the movie frames it not as him becoming a villain, but a tragic loss of control that he feels insanely guilty over. He's not a villain in that scene, but a remorseful, weeping object of pity and sympathy for the audience. People wondered why Padme was comforting him after he admitted to slaughtering children. That's because the movie wants you to feel sorrow for him about this, and thus she comforts him out of love. The movie frames it as something to identify with. No one's pulling a Todd here. You can't keep doing shitty things and then feel bad about yourself like that makes it okay. The movies don't have a problem with what the Jedi are doing, and that tells the audience there is nothing wrong with what they are doing. People bring up the Jedi kidnapping children to be indoctrinated into their order as further evidence of them having fallen so far. But unfortunately, I have to sing this song again. That's not in the movie. The movie only says they they trained little kids, not that they were taken or anything. There's nothing in the film to suggest that their methods of teaching are wrong either. Hell, people bring up how the Jedi are supposed to be shown as out of touch, focusing too much on combat and politics, or how their emotional detachment makes them bad guys. But the movies don't present it that way. And frankly, it's not exactly a strong counter-argument that the thing they explicitly say would be a bad idea, training Anakin despite being too old, ends with him becoming 
evil and murdering them all when he rejects their way of thinking. Never does Yoda say, our fault this is, should have understood and helped Anakin's feelings, not told him to ignore them. Obi-Wan never reflects on the rigidity of the code and their ways of thinking that led them to miss all the obvious red flags. It's just, only a Sith deals in absolutes. It's not that this opinion or reading of the films is wrong, that the Jedi aren't partly to blame for their own downfall, it's that the movies are bad and don't present it that way. The closest we get is them talking about them discussing in secret how they should overthrow the Chancellor if he refuses to end the war or give up his power, and Yoda rightfully pointing out, hey, this is kind of a dark line of thought we're heading down. However, saying that an attempted coup would be bad is kind of undermined by the fact that the Chancellor is the Dark Lord of the Sith who has been manipulating everything from the start. But despite all that I've said, all that I've complained about, I can't find it in my heart to hate these movies. There are things about them that I hate, but honestly, it's still Star Wars. I'll rant and rave like any fan, but then Duel of the Fate starts up and I'm suddenly invested. I'll make fun of the goofiest of dialogue and most bizarre performances, but in the end, I'm still gonna enjoy it. Rewatching them, I still see all their problems, and yet there's still something about them that makes me smile, and I suddenly get why so many are still entranced by them, even after all these years. And I'm sure that's not gonna change even after another 20 years. And maybe that's the real new hope that ultimately we can still talk about these movies, what we hate and love about them, while still coming together to love everything about the franchise overall. Next time, we end Star Wars Prequels Month with another darker film turned comic, and see what Disney's version of a prequel film is with Rogue One. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Star Wars Prequel Month concludes with Rogue One. So, why am I not covering Solo? Two reasons. Main one being there are only four Mondays in May. Yeah, yeah, hold your laughter for a second as if that made a difference with these releases. But also because Solo isn't really a Star Wars prequel, it's a Han Solo prequel. The distinction is around the fact that we started with A New Hope as the first Star Wars movie ever made. Rogue One is a prequel to A New Hope, thus it is a prequel to Star Wars. Solo, despite being set in the Star Wars universe, is not really about advancing the overall plot of the main Star Wars movies. Rogue One, while not a story that needed to be told, provided the details by which the events of A New Hope could happen at all. They're not necessary to know, but much like the expanded universe itself, it shows that it's a larger galaxy out there and we don't need to spend all of our time focusing around the same group of people. Solo is just the story of how Han Solo got some of the stuff he had in A New Hope. Solo is not a bad movie at all. It's a completely unnecessary movie, since nobody was clamoring to have a Han Solo movie. Give us our damn Obi-Wan movie for Ewan McGregor already. But it's a fun, enjoyable heist film set in the Star Wars universe. So a few people had a question for me when I announced I was doing this. Which adaptation am I doing? There are two comic adaptations of Rogue One. One produced by Marvel and one by IDW. Which shouldn't surprise people really, most of the films have had multiple adaptations. This is especially true of the original trilogy, where Marvel not only adapted all three movies as they came out, but had the first ongoing Star Wars series that introduced a lot of weirder stuff in between the movies, similar to Star Trek comics over the years. However, in this case, what people are referring to is that there's an adaptation Marvel did that's like the sequel trilogy ones. Six issue miniseries, covering pretty much everything in the film and then some, but also a considerably shorter printed as graphic novel version that's only 64 pages. Basically the equivalent of only three issues. The original trilogy got this same kind of treatment in 2016. The artwork is done in a more cartoony style with scenes compressed more, but getting all the relevant information out to the reader. It's not a bad adaptation style at all, it's just it ends up losing a lot of the finer details that a more straightforward adaptation has. This is really more meant for kids. While it doesn't shy away from the death and destruction, the art style is more appealing for kids to look at and is more easily digestible for a kid reading it for a bit in the afternoon or something. However, since we've traditionally covered the multi-issue adaptations for these reviews, that's what I'll be doing for this episode as well. I don't see a lot of hate for Rogue One out there. There. Mostly, it's just either a shrug or this is one of the best damn Star Wars movies ever. For me, yeah, I like it more than the prequel trilogy, but I feel like it was more interested in having cool characters that could have had a lot of room for expansion in future films. 
if everybody didn't die at the end. It kind of feels like Rogue One and Solo were two opposite sides of the same coin with Star Wars. The former is a war drama, a bit dreary in spots, but about the seriousness of what a war between the Empire and the Rebellion could be like. Whereas Solo was a fun sci-fi flick in the vein of Guardians of the Galaxy, featuring charming, funny, interesting characters that show off how colorful Star Wars can be. And that's the great thing about this universe. While all grown at how stupid I think Queen Amidala's outfits are, Star Wars has so much much room in its universe to be funny, serious, a rainbow of silliness, while also a dour, dirty, gray drama. It's a larger world with room for every kind of story there is. So let's dig into Rogue One, a Star Wars Stories comic adaptation, and see if they can tell a good story with it. Reading from a trade, no covers, the doors open, let's go! Can't believe I didn't reference that in the Phantom Menace review. Anyway, we open on the planet Lamu 15 years ago. I was gonna make a joke related to a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, but honestly, just two months ago feels like a hundred years ago, so yeah. A guy and his wife quickly hide away their daughter, Jin, saying that they do what they have to to protect her, giving her the nickname Stardust. An Imperial shuttle lands with a squad of black-clad stormtroopers, referred to as Death Troopers. Are we the baddies? They're flanking an Imperial officer named Krennic, who's meeting with a guy in an open field. What is it you want, Krennic? The work has stalled. I need you to come back to the Empire. This is how you know the Empire is evil. They don't let you work from home. His wife, Lyra, pulls a gun and says they won't be taking him. Of course not, Lyra. I'm taking you all. You, your child, you'll all live in comfort as heroes of the Empire. You will never win. I will make myself thoroughly uncomfortable while I'm there. Apparently none of the troopers bother to bring along stun weapons, so they just shoot her dead. Krennic takes the man, Galen, and tells the death troopers to find their child. We cut to the present on the planet Edu, where Galen, apparently not having aged a day in 15 years, gotta give the Empire this, their healthcare system is second to none, is talking to a cargo pilot named Bodhi. Bodhi had apparently asked what it was Galen was doing and what it was he was transporting, and the answer does not make him happy. Galen agrees and tells him he has to leave. But there's still time for us to make this right. You can't unask a question. You can only move forward with what you have learned. Perhaps, but I still shouldn't have asked what hot porn is like. This scene wasn't in the movie, and probably best it not be. While Galen's lines are perfectly fine, it doesn't really convey any new information that Bodhi's later scenes wouldn't also give. We cut to an Imperial labor camp, where Jin is now grown up, and under a different alias, and getting shoved around by stormtroopers. We have an expanded scene here, where Jin talks to her alien cellmate. Bad dreams? Not really. Then you shouldn't be up. I mean, I should know. I'm Cthulhu. Do you want a warning before I do it? Not really. I will give you one anyway. Next work crew we are together, I will kill you then. What if I kill you first? Ha 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 ha! Then I hope you like a quiet cell, Liana Halleck. Prison gangs in Star Wars are very polite. Sure, you'll still get shivved, but they'll ask if there's a preferred spot so as not to make it extra painful. Back to Bodhi, he arrives on the moon of Jeddah and walks out into the desert, where a group of armed individuals find him and recognize him as an Imperial. However, he announces that he's here to defect, and specifically here with a message for Saw Gerrera. In the movie, we had briefly seen Saw rescuing the young Jin from a hiding spot after the Death Troopers had left, but that scene was left out of the comic. From there, we cut over to the Ring of Kefreen, a trading post where someone from Saw Gerrera's group is meeting with a member of the Rebellion, Cassian. He he tells Cassian about Bodhi defecting, that he knows why the Empire is mining kyber crystals from Jeddah, a weapon they're building. Cassian gets rough with the guy because he needs to leave, Saw's group is stealing ammo from the trading post and is worried he'll be left behind, and he finally admits to what kind of weapon it is. A planet killer! That's what he called it! My god, those Transformers were only the first step! They're going to build Unicron! Actually, that's a good question. Those Star Wars Transformers toys are a real thing, so why didn't we get a Death Star Unicron? That doesn't count. 
His shouting attracts the attention of some stormtroopers, so to get away, Cassian kills them. Unfortunately, even in a crowded market, gunfire tends to attract more stormtroopers. Cassian plans to climb a wall to get out, but the guy he's talking to has an injured arm and can't climb. As such, Cassian elects to shoot the guy himself. This scene is... a bit mixed for me for a few reasons. Firstly, because the comic leaves out the guy wanting to walk and talk instead of just staying in the alley. Cassian was probably right not to discuss this stuff in a crowded area, but at the same time, he's the one who was yelling at him and caused the stormtroopers to come by. In addition, while this scene is also supposed to help establish a kind of deconstruction of the Rebel Alliance to show off that, hey, they may have been the heroes, but they were also kind of terrorists and it's an inglorious business, the reason Saw's group isn't part of the Rebellion is because they're supposed to be more extremist, employing unethical tactics that the Rebellion finds abhorrent. Yet here's one of our heroes committing murder, and in turn, what makes them different from Saw's group if that's the case? It's not that it's bad or anything, it's that the movie seems a bit confused in its messaging. And this is part of Cassian's supposed arc in the film, trying to move away from these unsavory tactics, but it feels a bit hollow since the only remorse he seems to indicate is him just kind of pausing for a second after doing it, but his acting doesn't seem to have the weight it's going for. Back with Jin, the transport she's on gets attacked by rebels, who are looking specifically for her. They disable her handcuffs, but she's clearly not interested in whatever they're selling, because she kicks their asses and runs out. Right into a large droid, K2SO. Congratulations, you're being rescued. Please do not attempt to resist. This is a weird reboot of the Terminator. K2 is easily the best part of the movie. A snarky reprogrammed Imperial droid who will tell you what an idiot you are, but still remains loyal and trustworthy. As they take her back to the Yavin 4 base, in a cutscene, she assumes that these guys are a part of Saw's crew, but they say nothing to her in response. Once there, she meets Mon Mothma, and the dialogue is mostly the same, though with additions here or there. My name is Mon Mothma. I sit on the Council of Alliance High Command. It's nice to actually have my scenes in a movie for once. Fun fact, she's actually played by the same actress as in Revenge of the Sith, Genevieve O'Reilly. She introduces her to Cassian, who explains about the defector and how her father is working on some kind of planet-destroying weapon. Jin suggests that she doesn't really care, implying that she resents her father for leaving and doesn't actually give a crap about the Rebellion or the Empire. However, the Rebels instead want her to serve as the foot in the door with Saw Gerrera, since he had raised her for several years after he rescued her. One nice thing the comic does that the movie doesn't is show some flashbacks over narration where we see their last encounter, which seemed to be Saw giving her a blaster pistol as a child before leaving. I haven't seen him in years. Gotta tell you, third worst birthday ever. Galen Erso is apparently vital to the weapon's development, and they want to take him and have him appear before the Imperial Senate to provide testimony on the weapon he's building. There's a deleted scene where Bail Organa talks to Mon Mothma about the plan. She still has hope that the Senate will do something about the Emperor. After 20 years?! I'm betting the only thing they've ever stopped was when the Emperor wanted to rename Coruscant Palpa Planet! And that's only because they convinced him that it hurt the brand recognition! I think I've brought this up before, but I do really like how all the post-Disney movies make references to the prequels. I may not like the prequels, but they're still Star Wars, still part of the canon, and they deserve that much respect. As such, seeing Jimmy Smith's back as Bail Organa, and the same actress for Mon Mothma to provide that continuity link is fantastic. Anyway, Jin agrees and more formally meets K2, who expresses how he hates how she gets a gun, but he doesn't. You're letting her keep it? The blaster? Are you interested in the probability of her using it against you? It's high. Gotta imagine there's an app out there for people to turn their droid speech into astromech beeping that's very lucrative. Feels like, especially given what happened with her earlier rescue, that there should have been a scene where she threatens him with the blaster to get away in order to go for more character development later. We also see in flashback that Cassian Superior informs him that with Galen Erso as vital as he is to the weapon development, that his mission is, in reality, to kill him. No attempt at extraction. Placing the flashback here was a neat trick for the adaptation, since it implies that that will be the moment where she tries to shoot him. Unfortunately, it doesn't actually happen. We cut to the Star Destroyer Executrix. You ever look up the names the Empire gave Star Destroyers? A lot of them are quite extra. Oh, I'm sorry, they're extra-ix. 
Director Krennic is meeting with Governor, soon to be Grand Moff, Tarkin. There's a lot of debate about the decision here with the mocap to recreate Peter Cushing for the role. Some find it disrespectful to him as a person to do this. Others point out that Cushing himself was always sad he didn't appear in more Star Wars movies because his character died, and still others just find the CGI to be unconvincing. Personally, when I saw it, I was pretty sold on the CGI on the big screen. Again, we've come a long way since Jar Jar, and nowadays I only really notice it if I'm actively looking for it. The voice for him is... okay. I feel like it gets most of Cushing's inflections right, though not enough of the lighter bits that Cushing brought when he wasn't attempting to be super serious. Charming to the last. As for the ethics of it... And I couldn't say. Cushing's estate was apparently heavily involved in decision-making for the recreation, and it is honestly hard to imagine anyone else playing the role in live action. My only question is, for the authenticity of the performance, did Guy Henry wear slippers during it like Cushing did? Regardless of how you feel about any of that, the comic does not do a great job with him. They kind of smoothed out his face a bit too much here. Kind of made him more of a caricature of Tarkin rather than resembling him like some of the other actors' likenesses. In any case, the point of the meeting is that they're aware of the cargo pilot defecting and Tarkin is worried about proof of the weapons. Yeah, it's the Death Star. No point in me being coy, really. Existence leaking out and thus getting more star systems to join the Rebel Alliance. In addition, the numerous delays they've had on the Death Star project over the last two friggin' decades makes it pretty clear that the Emperor is tired of waiting for it, so they need to test this thing to prove it's ready. As such, they're going to do a limited test on Jeddah to solve both problems at once. After that, the comic includes an early introduction to Chirrut and Baze, whom we'll be properly introduced to soon. May the force of others be with you. May the force of others be with you. Oh great, Chirrut's in the wrong thing. He's supposed to be in THE Star Wars. Man, I should really get back to that series at some point. Saw Guerrera decides to use tentacle porn to ascertain the truth about Bodhi's story. Yeah, this just seems like a weird inclusion that doesn't really impact the story at all. Thing reads his mind... and then what? At Jeddah City, Cassian and Jen arrive. That contact in Saw's group that Cassian killed, not that he mentions that, had a sister who might serve as an introduction to Saw, so they start looking for her. We we'll give her your name and hope that gets us a meeting with Saw. Hope? Rebellions are built on hope. And guns! Don't forget guns! The city's also swarming with stormtroopers, along with a Star Destroyer hanging over it, because of Saw's group attacking the cargo shipment of kyber crystals that they're strip mining from the planet. Chirrut, a blind monk, offers Jin a glimpse into her future in exchange for the necklace she's wearing. I see... a TIE fighter confronting you on a bridge. Wait... no, that doesn't happen. It must have only been for the trailer. What do you know of kyber crystals? My father. He said they powered the Jedi lightsabers. And that if you, like, glued two together, you could make a double-bladed one. Indeed, that's actually canon. Cassian leads Jin away. Strongest stars have hearts of Kyber. Although they're not great at nuclear fusion. Cassian explains that Chirrut and Baze are Guardians of the Whills. The first time the Whills thing actually made it into any of the movies. So, of course, they never actually explain what the hell they are for any audience member who isn't a colossal nerd like me who has read stuff about the original Star Wars ideas. Anyway, they're basically protectors of the Jedi Temple that was here. Except there's nothing to protect anymore, so they just hang around and offer to glimpse people's futures in exchange for necklaces. Saw's group launches a bombing in the city that takes out an Imperial tank. However, since his little terrorist action is also a risk for them, Cassian shoots some of them before they toss any more grenades grenades, forcing them to flee. Jin also shoots an Imperial droid that's the same design as K2SO, who shows up behind it. Did you know that wasn't me? Uh, Imperial droid! Unfortunately, they cut out some of K2's bits here, but the important thing is that they end up running into more troopers, who assume the two are K2's prisoners. However, when the troopers try to take them off his hands, Chirrut shows up and says to let them pass in peace. The Force is with me, and I am with the Force, and I fear nothing. For all is as the Force wills it. Blessed be the unlikely coincidences of the Force. When the troopers try to force him away, he kicks their asses with a stick and the ability to dodge their blaster fire. That being said, Baze still has his back with, like, a blaster chain gun or something. I don't even know how to describe it. Oh wait, yes I do. Awesome.
Chirrut and Baze are sadly the biggest victims of this being a standalone film. Now, obviously not everything needs to be a trilogy, but they mostly exist to look cool and do cool stuff without much in the range of character arcs or anything. And in turn, not every character needs an arc, but their presence doesn't really serve much else in the plot other than to be cool. Also, you ever think about the fact that Stormtrooper armor is basically useless? I mean, a dude manages to knock them out with just a wooden stick. Cassian orders K2 back to the ship while Jin inquires about Chirrut. Is he a Jedi? No Jedi anymore. Only dreamers like this fool. You don't know that! There could be a whole expanded universe of Jedi out there! Saw's forces surround and take the four. Jin, however, warns them about who she is and that she knew Saw long before any of them. At Saw's base, Cassian meets up with Bodhi, whose mind is still shaken up by the tentacle monster, while Jin reunites with Saw. Once again, the comic makes good use of flashback over their dialogue to basically tell how things went down. Saw left Jin behind at the age of 16, giving her only a knife and a blaster to defend herself. Some of his forces were catching wind of the fact that she was the daughter of an Imperial officer and wanted to use her as a hostage. So instead, he elected to leave her behind. She's naturally bitter about all this, but says her job is done. She's only there to make the introduction, not fight for the cause. The soldier I trained was a true believer. You saw our enemy with unclouded eyes. What happened to the girl who was willing to die for the rebellion? Well, gee, Saw, maybe that girl got left behind by her only remaining parental influence while she probably already had abandonment issues stemming from losing her birth parents to the Empire at a young age. God, this franchise has a lot of bad father figures in it. The Alliance, the Rebels, whatever it is you're calling yourselves these days, all it's ever brought me is pain. You can stand to see the Imperial flag rain across the galaxy? It's not a problem if you don't look up. Jin actually has a pretty good character arc for the movie. It's just Felicity Jones is underplaying it a little too much. Not to the extremes of the prequel trilogy, but even when she has an emotional breakdown in a moment, it comes across as too restrained. It's not Bad, just not as good, if that makes any sense. As Krennic oversees the test firing of the Death Star on Jetta City, Saw shows Jen the message from her father. He expresses his love for her, but also what he's been doing the last 15 years. He knew that his refusal to work on the Death Star would mean nothing, because sooner or later, someone on the team would figure out that they didn't actually need him to complete the project. So instead, he lied, pretended to be broken and beaten down into obedience, but in reality was working on implanting a weakness in it. Jin, if you're listening, my beloved, so much of my life has been wasted. I spent years on that whole phase where I claimed to be into Magic the Gathering, but never actually played it. He explains that he's placed a flaw in the Death Star's reactor systems. It's unstable, so a blast to any part of it will set off a chain reaction that destroys it. Still not sure if it's going to generate a shockwave when it explodes or not. That uncertainty is keeping me up at night. He says they'll need the structural plans of the Death Star to find the reactor, with said plans located in the Empire's data vault on the planet Scarif. Jetta City is destroyed, and even using the Death Star at that little power causes the surrounding area to kick up dust storms and earthquakes, threatening Saw's base. Our heroes escape their cell with Bodhi, finding Jin and Saw as the members of his terrorist band flee. Cassian says he knows where her father is, and they invite Saw to come with, but he says he won't be running any longer. The comic, unfortunately, doesn't really do a good job of portraying what's up. While the implication is that Saw doesn't think he can keep up because he basically has the Star Wars equivalent of a peg leg, really it seems to be more that he's just tired of the fight, broken and beaten down by the whole thing. The comic left out a few more of his paranoid ramblings and statements that he made that seemed to indicate his psyche was not in great shape. I think that's what I've come to realize about this film. It's a movie that's better on a rewatch than it is the first time you see it. Some movies it's harder to pick up on details during the first watch-through. Your attention isn't on everything, some aspects are more subtle, and since it's something you're seeing for the first time, you're not absorbing everything that's happening. And that's the case with this film. Saw's characterization makes a lot more sense to me the third time through. The comic does help with that with the flashback panels, just a pity they left out some bits too. Anyway, K2 rescues our merry band, now made up of Jin, Cassian, Bodhi, Chirrut, and Baze. Oh, and the comic 
also makes a reference to Saw's sister, Stila. Yeah, the character actually originated in that Clone Wars cartoon that everyone wants me to watch, alongside his sister. So there's some trivia for you right before he meets his untimely end. Cassian elects to jump to light speed before making the calculations to avoid the city's blast. Honestly, with decisions like that, it's surprising we haven't ended up with more Holdo maneuvers in the Star Wars universe. Cassian sets course for the planet Edu while Bodhi laments the situation, what with Galen having told him that this was a way to make amends for his own small part in creating the Death Star, now seemingly for nothing since the weapon has clearly been completed. However, Jin takes a step up and says that thanks to her father's message, they know what the Death Star is and that there is a way to destroy it. Unfortunately, since they didn't have time to grab Galen's message, Cassian says they won't have proof and it'll be hard to convince the Alliance about all this. Jin suggests finding Galen and bringing him back to tell the Alliance himself. Which seems odd that they're suggesting this now after they already started on their way to where he is. On board the Death Star, Tarkin says that now that the weapon is proven effective, he's taking control of it. Krennic objects, since this is his achievement, but Tarkin says that the recent security breaches prove that Krennic isn't up to the job, pointing out that the defector came from Galen Erso's facility on Edu. They reach the facility, but because they need to fly low away from the scanners and there's a lot of wind and rain, they end up crashing their ship. Somehow, the Rebels were tracking them, but once it crashes, they lose the signal. As such, they elect to launch a squadron of X-Wings to attack the facility and hopefully kill him that way. This is kind of a bizarre decision chain in the movie, since in the film, Cassian already sent a coded message to the Rebels confirming the existence of the weapon and the defector, so what does killing Galen at this point accomplish? Cassian goes out with Bodhi to scout out how things look out there. After they've left, Chirrut has a question and observation, wondering if Cassian looks like a killer. What do you mean, does he look like a killer? The Force moves darkly near a creature that's about to kill. You don't want to know what the Force looked like when Obi-Wan Kenobi shot General Grievous a bunch of times. When K2 points out that indeed Cassian's gun was configured as a sniper rifle, Jin goes running after them. Krennic's shuttle arrives, Galen being brought out to greet him while Cassian sets up his rifle. He takes aim, but then has an image of Jin in his head and hesitates. Although Krennic does not, shooting down the rest of Galen's team. Seems like a really stupid and pointless gesture, especially since he doesn't kill Galen, but just slaps him around a bit, but what do I know? How do I know the weapon is complete? Let me share with you some details. Jedha, Saw Gerrera, his band of fanatics, their holy city, the last remainder of the Jedi, gone! You'd think Sidious would have already ordered all the Jedi stuff destroyed by this point. This has changed around quite a bit from how it ended up in the movie, where Galen actually tried to sacrifice himself to keep Krennic from killing the other scientists while looking for the traitor, and him killing them anyway because he's the bad guy and an idiot. In addition, there's a sequence in the comic where Baze actually wants to try to shoot at them from his own vantage point for vengeance, but Shirit encourages him not to, instead to follow Jin's lead because she shines. Which is unfortunately kind of bad for a secret commando squadron. The X-Wing squadron attacks, knocking out Galen and Krennic. The comic once again includes flashback bits, this time of Krennic and Galen's relationship over the years. I guess it's to show that the two once had a time when they were friends and colleagues, but it's not really necessary for the story. The Death Troopers wake Krennic up and take him away, and the comic includes a scene that definitely should have been in the movie. Cassian had sent Bodhi back to the ship, but now he and K2 are on their way up to steal an Imperial shuttle for them, with Bodhi wanting to lead the way. K2 is annoyed because he's slower, but Bodhi says he needs K2 to trust him. You are asking for a great deal of trust. I really don't know you, Bodhi Rook. You say you don't know me. We're the same. We've both got the Imperial symbol on us. We both got drunk that one time and had it tattooed on our butts. And yet we're both here anyway, all to help the Rebellion. Cassian reprogrammed you, right? Well, Galen Erso reprogrammed me. We can still finish this mission. We can steal a shuttle and get the information back to the Rebellion. But you have to let me lead the way. Bodhi's character development was very subtle in the movie, probably a little too much so. This would have been a good addition and made a cool connection with K2. Jin goes over to Galen, who's sadly dying. He reiterates how the Death Star needs to be destroyed. I have so much to tell you. First of all, invest in Imperial construction stocks. They're gonna go way up soon. 
He dies as Cassian pulls her away, the two soon getting picked up by the rest of our heroes. As they fly off, Jin is pissed at Cassian because he lied about what their mission was. We get some good back and forth, with Cassian pointing out he chose to disobey the orders to kill him, but Jin is incensed because it was still the Rebel Alliance who killed him. Cassian does hit the nail on the head, though, especially in regards to her earlier comment about not looking up at the Imperial flag. We don't all have the luxury of deciding when and where we want to care about something. Suddenly the rebellion is real for you? Some of us live this. I've been in this fight since I was six years old. You're not the only one who lost everything. Some of us just decided to do something about it. Once again, though, I feel like Felicity Jones is underplaying it too much. She's supposed to be outraged and furious, but her expression remains the same stone-faced seriousness she's had the entire time. I want to emphasize this. It's not that her acting is bad. We've seen bad acting and line delivery in a Star Wars prequel. You're so beautiful. I have brought peace. Freedom, justice, and security to my new empire. From my point of view, the Jedi are evil. Her decision to play it like this is a legit acting choice, and there is a certain logic to it as someone beaten down and broken over the years, but as a result, I don't feel like it has the impact it should have if she were pushing it more. Speaking of our old buddy Anakin, we cut to Mustafar. Krennic has been summoned there by Captain Crispy himself. Krennic tells Vader he wants an audience with the Emperor. It's not clear if he's just power hungry, wanting to schmooze with Palpatine, or if it's more professional pride. He spent a good chunk of his life on the Death Star, after all. In keeping with his characterization in A New Hope, Vader is not particularly impressed with the thing. It's power to create problems has certainly been confirmed. A city destroyed? An Imperial facility openly attacked? And have you seen the property taxes on this thing? We own it. It literally belongs to the government, and we still have to pay for it. That's how expensive it is. It was Governor Tarkin that suggested the test. You were not summoned here to grovel, Director Krennic. You were summoned here for fan service. He tells them that officially the Death Star does not exist. The story to the Senate is that Jeddah was destroyed in a mining disaster, and that he's being charged with ensuring that the weapon hasn't been compromised in some way by Galen. Vader starts walking off. So I'm... I'm still in command. You'll speak to the Emperor about... And Vader starts choking him. Be careful not to choke on your aspirations, Director. Darth Vader, Sass Master of the Sith. Like I joked, this scene is fan service. It's fan service I can get behind, though, since it's always fun to see James Earl Jones doing his Vader. You can tell in one or two lines he's aged a bit, though, and it ends up affecting his performance. A city destroyed. An Imperial facility openly attacked? This scene, I think, illustrates why I believe some of us have a disconnect when it comes to Anakin and the prequels. Some said I just don't get Anakin's character, that his problem is that he cares too much about people and can't accept their deaths. As a result, those commenters disagree when I suggested that Anakin should be the one who doesn't care about the clone troopers. Except he's also the same guy who will casually choke people who annoy him and choke them to death if they fail him. And that's the problem. I don't think Revenge of the Sith does a good enough job explaining how we get from I'm gonna go help the clones to Shut up, Krennic, or I'll pop your head off like a Barbie doll. And you can say, well, that's because they're two different people, from a certain point of view. But it doesn't feel narratively satisfying is all. I just feel like there were better ways of gradually making the changeover. But yeah, this scene, despite not really having much point other than fan service, is enjoyable. As for the other Vader fan service bit, we'll get to that. By the by, how hardcore is Vader? This is the place where he lost the rest of his limbs, almost burned to death, fought his best friend, supposedly killed his wife, and he still sets up a huge-ass castle here for himself. We cut over to Yavin 4, where the full Rebel Alliance leadership is arguing about what to do now that they know the Death Star exists. Things go a bit differently in the comic rather than the movie, where Mon Mothma goes to talk to Jin, who's waiting outside the base. She offers her apology to Jin about how they took so much from her. It's definitely a bit that should have stayed, since it helps inspire Jin to go into the meeting to argue on behalf of fighting the Death Star. If the Empire has this kind of power, what chance do we have? What chance do we have? The question is, what choice? You want to run? Hide? Plead for mercy? Scatter your forces? You give way to an enemy this evil with this much power, and you condemn the galaxy to an eternity of submission! I mean, it's not like some farm boy is just gonna show up and save the galaxy! 
Send your best troops to Scarif. Send the whole rebel fleet if you have to. We need to capture the Death Star plans if there is any hope of destroying it. You're asking us to invade an Imperial installation based on nothing but hope. Rebellions are built on hope. And on the financial backings of several governments, if you want to be cynical about it. Ultimately, because the full council won't support the act, they won't approve the mission. Jin walks out with Bodhi, though Chirrut and Baze say they're with her if they want to try to go anyway. Fortunately, it won't just be the four of them. Cassian has gathered up a group of volunteers to assist. Cassian's character development comes in here, and once again aided by the flashback panels. How he and these volunteers have done terrible, immoral things for the Rebellion before, because they thought it was for a cause they believed in. And if the fight ends here, with the Alliance scattering, then it will all have been for nothing. They grab what gear they can, and take the Imperial shuttle they use to escape Edu. The shuttle takes off, with Flight Control asking what the hell they're doing and what their call sign is. Bodhi, in a rush, registers themselves as Rogue One. Title drop! But seems odd that it's just some offhand remark made in a panic and not like Mon Mothma sending them on a secret mission and giving them that call sign or having been assigned it when they first left for Jeddah. Later, Admiral Radis, a Mon Calamari like Admiral Akbar, is informed of the shuttle theft and figures out what they're doing, and as such, organizes a bunch of ships to provide support. This is a minor nitpick, but I think it was a mistake to give this role to someone introduced in this film. Spoilers, but this guy is gonna die to help save the mission, and it doesn't carry the emotional impact it should as a result. Personally, and I'm probably in the minority here, but I think it should have been Bail Organa who did this. There's a scene cut from the comic where he elects to go back to Alderaan to inform his people that there's going to be open war with the Empire. What's more, he's going to dispatch Leia to get Obi-Wan Kenobi out of hiding since the time to fight back is now and they'll need his help. I don't mind that part, but the assumption is that he dies on Alderaan during the Death Star attack, and I feel like it would have had a stronger departure for the character if he died to get the Death Star plans to safety. The only problem the problem with it is that we wouldn't have Leia dealing with it emotionally at the beginning of A New Hope like she should, but you could make it so that she doesn't know and just assumes he's on Alderaan at the time. In any case, there's a bit of character interaction with Chirrut and Baze that, yet again, was missing from the movie, where they explain they're on this mission because, as Guardians of the Jedi Temple, they need to stop the desecration of the kyber crystals and the use of the weapon. Now if they'd only made them into a giant lightsaber instead... Scarif has a planetary shield and only one entranceway within, which you'd think would be the kind of technology they'd be employing on Coruscant as well, since it's like the capital world and all. And they're given clearance to land. Not included in the comic, but they give a convincing story about being redirected from Edu. Jin explains the plan to the troops. Saw Gerrera used to say, one fighter with a sharp stick and nothing left to lose can take the day. Which is good, because in our haste to leave, we only grab sharp sticks and no blasters. They have no idea we're coming. They have no reason to expect us. If we can make it to the ground, we'll take the next chance. And the next. On and on, until we win, or the chances are spent. Make sure you've pre-rolled all the ones out of your dice. Basically, it's a guerrilla action. Make ten men seem like a hundred by creating enough distractions and damage that they'll get the stormtroopers away from their target. The central tower where the Death Star plans are most likely kept. We get another moment with K2 and Bodhi, with our happy droid trying to encourage him as he becomes increasingly nervous about the entire thing. Again, it's a real shame character stuff like this was cut. Once they land, they knock out the Imperial guards who were sent to investigate their cargo and take their uniforms. Jin, Cassian, and K2 head into the tower to begin their search. However, Krennic also soon arrives, wanting to figure out what it was that Galen had sent out in his message. I wonder if by the time the action starts, Krennic just assumes that Tarkin is doing this to him deliberately, since disaster seems to be following him to every place he goes today. Once inside, K2 interfaces with another Imperial droid and finds out the best route to the Data Vault. On their way, they tell the other rebels to light the place up. And light it up they do, blowing up a bunch of targets all across the island they're on. As stormtroopers are deployed to fight the attack, Tarkin is informed of what's happening on Scarif and orders the Death Star sent there. And inform Lord Vader. But, but sir! Yes, yes, I know he has standing orders not to land on any planet with sand on it, but he can still observe from orbit. Our heroes reach the Data Vault and K2 is left to stand guard while Cassian and Jin go into the vault itself. The comic doesn't really leave out the character development moment where Jin gives him a gun, but just pushes it forward into the final issue of the miniseries and told in flashback, probably because they ran out of space to tell it in that particular issue. 
Still no time for that, since the Empire has dispatched AT-ATs. And please, let's not have any arguments about pronouncing it at at or at at Both are legitimate, just as much as it is to call an ATST a chicken walker. Admiral Radis's fleet soon heads out to Scarif and engages the Imperial forces. Some of the X-Wings get through the defense shield before they close it, but not many, providing some air support to the forces on the ground. Back in the data vault, Jin locates the Death Star plans under the file name Stardust, since that was Galen's nickname for her. Galen, I appreciate that you wanted to be cute, but if Jin wasn't along on this trip, the Rebellion would have been screwed. Also, cute bit in the movie not included in the comic. One of the things they mention seeing while looking through the files is hyperspace tracking, setting up what would pay off in The Last Jedi. Once again, takes two decades for Imperial forces to actually get stuff done. I guess this is what happens when you put all your funding into cyborg monster suits instead. Someone in the base must have realized the diversion, so stormtroopers soon arrive in the vault. K2 holds them off as long as he can, but eventually is shot dead, his final act sealing the vault to try to protect them. In the meantime, Bodhi works to set up a comm link on the ground to get the message out through the shield. Namely, that they have to take out the shield. The plans are too big to transfer this way. Another sign of Imperial inefficiency, they've got terrible network latency. Jin and Cassian have to physically extract the hard drive or whatever containing the Death Star plans, but Krennic soon arrives with Death Troopers to deal with them. Meanwhile, everything's ready on Bodhi's end, but someone needs to flip a master switch to direct their comm activity through the communication tower. The Rebels closest to it are pinned down, and so Chirrut decides to go and remind everyone of how awesome he is, walking out in the middle of the gunfire to get to the switch. I am one with the Force and the Force is with me. Fortunately, the Force is letting him pass in peace. Inside the vault, Cassian gets shot down off of the massive server rack or whatever and falls onto a platform, seemingly killed. Chirrut reaches the switch and turns it on, but he was right next to some fuel or something and gets blowed up. Welp, he's definitely one with the Force now. He says his farewell to Baze as Bodhi makes contact with Admiral Radis, telling him they need to bring down the shield. Unfortunately, he's next as a grenade falls into the shuttle and blows him up too. Baze charges at some troopers, getting shot a few times in the process as he takes several of them down. Like his fellows, he also gets blown up. When you stop and think about it, this has been a wild day for these people. Jin makes it to the top of the communications tower and prepares to transmit, though she's soon cornered by Krennic. She admits who she is to him and what she's doing, but Krennic is confident because the shield is still up. However, thanks to a Star Destroyer being disabled, a rebel craft rams into it and uses its thrusters to force that destroyer into another, the two crashing into the shield generator and destroying it. Physics! A rarity in Star Wars! Krennic is soon shot from behind by Cassian, who's injured but alive. They successfully transmit the plans and our heroes make their way down the tower. Well hey, happy ending for at least two of our main characters! So then the Death Star arrives. Tarkin, being a bastard, elects to destroy the entire base on Scarif. You know, the one that includes a bunch of loyal imperialists, too. Admiral Radis prepares to jump to hyperspace, but then Vader's Star Destroyer arrives and detects that their ship has received transmissions from the planet. Cassian and Jin embrace as the blast of the Death Star's weapons soon consumes them. The Rebels receive the plans and condense them down into a little USB drive, but then the boarding party arrives. The boarding party consisting of Darth Vader, who pursues the crew as they try to pass the plans through a door that's stuck. Oh man, it's that great scene where Darth Vader shows up and is all badass and kills all these troops and we finally get to see how cool Darth Vader is as he uses the force and swings his lightsaber around and deflects their blast and it's the best scene in the movie and- I hate this scene. You're of course free to like it, but I sure as hell don't. To me, it's the exact same problem as the prequel trilogy. It's more about looking cool than it is having any actual meaning. I don't need to see Darth Vader doing some elaborate lightsaber twirling and tossing guys around with telekinesis or crap like that. I've seen Darth Vader be scary impressive. It's when in Empire Strikes Back, he just holds out his hand as Han shoots at him and he doesn't move an inch. It's when he's toying with Luke and just casually having no difficulty in fighting him, making us fear for Luke 
Duke's life as he's so thoroughly outmatched. It's when all these officers in the Empire are so frightened of him that they'd rather risk doing stupid things rather than question him. It's his imposing presence. It's him just being able to stand there and command the room. The more effort he expends in doing stuff like this, fancy pants twirling and movements, the less impressive he becomes because of how much extra effort is involved. If he can do all this, why does he need to go over closer to them to begin with? Close the door completely with the Force and swipe the data out of their hands. Choke them all at once. Hell, just for a continuity issue with this, if it's so damn easy for him to handle all these rebel troopers without any effort, why did a platoon of stormtroopers board Leia's ship in A New Hope? Why didn't he just step out and deal with it all himself? This isn't cool, it's turning on the character's god mode, and I hate it. I get why people find it cool. You're free to enjoy it as much as you like and disagree, but me personally, I just sigh in frustration at this blatantly unnecessary and lame fan service. Also, he turned off his own damn life support system, since otherwise we'd be able to see all the indicator lights on his chest unit blinking in the darkness. You know, I look at the scene where Vader brutally murders a bunch of terrified people who are trying to stop a weapon of mass destruction that kills on an almost inconceivable scale, and really what comes to mind is... Anakin Skywalker's problem was that he cared about people too much. I kid, I kid, I kid. I will give you this, though. Holy crap, it took four movies, but we finally get a scene of Vader demonstrating his super awesome mega powers that they wouldn't shut up about in the prequels. They get the plans onto the blockade runner ship seen in A New Hope, jumping to light speed. And so our comic, and the movie, ends with the plans being brought to Princess Leia. For some reason, the comic elected to not actually show her face, unlike the digital reconstruction they did from the movie. Although one final neat touch to end out the comic, it ends with the opening crawl of A New Hope. This comic is a bit better than the movie. Not by a lot, but it is better. The movie itself is decent, it's just not as spectacular as it could have been. The comic's main advantage, as I've said throughout, is that it includes a lot more of the character development that the movie lacked or just more subtly implied. The addition of the flashback panels was a great help and artistic choice, breaking up the talky bits more with visuals that told their own stories. The likenesses of the actors were reasonable for the most part, but Tarkin has sadly not done sufficient justice. The trade also includes a Cassian and K2 one-shot comic that tells of how Cassian first reprogrammed him. It's not bad at all, though it's a bit of a reminder that you know, these interesting characters with their own histories got killed. I get why they did it, since it would seem odd that people who had such a great success rate wouldn't be around for future major rebel operations, but it still seems like a bit of a waste. Anyway, as an adaptation, it's pretty damn good. Covers most of the film, adds in stuff that improves upon it, and the stuff that gets cut wasn't too major in the grand scheme of things. As for the movie itself, while it lacks a lot of the more overt character stuff, it excels in other areas. As a sci-fi war movie, it's very good, with a lot of action and interesting action set pieces. One thing this movie gets right that sadly the comic doesn't as well, the gorgeous visuals, especially in showing off how big and terrifying the Death Star is. In my Force Awakens review, I talked about how the movie didn't do enough to really show off how scary Starkiller Base was, but this one gets it. A New Hope said that the Death Star was the size of a small moon, but this film actually has the Death Star right next to a planet to show off its size, even slowly revealing it from the shadows like a monster emerging from the dark dwarfing the Star Destroyers. Which, of course, we see how big even one of those is as it hovers over the city. The Death Star looks scary and imposing, as it should. Even without actually blowing up a planet, it shows why the Alliance is ready to throw in the towel once it's revealed. Hell, we really get a better idea of the destructive power from someone on the ground. Even just the blast of a city is enough to make it look like the world is ending. It's not just the Death Star either. The AT-ATs bearing down on the rebel attack on Scarab once again show the size and power of the things. It's like the opening shot of A New Hope, that reminder of the size and reach of the Empire, now brought down to a micro level as we see how small the Rebels truly are compared to this massive war machine they fight. Although one thing I don't really like about the movie is the music. Michael Giacchino decided to incorporate a few Star Wars leitmotifs into the film, 
but then for a lot of recognizable themes, they suddenly zig in ways that make them sound like they were made for a Star Wars ripoff rather than a Star Wars film. He probably wanted to try something different since this was the first non-main series Star Wars movie. I'm not counting the Ewok movies, but I don't think it quite works. However, one fun detail, Apparently in the liner notes, he had alternate titles for the soundtrack listings, usually with puns. Stuff like, Jincarcerated, Takes One to Rogue One, and Jedha Call Saw. Brilliant. And thus, Star Wars prequel month finally comes to an end. And after 11 episodes worth of material, I think next week we should try something a bit more... challenging. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. For four out of the five last years, we've had Star Wars movies coming out in December, and we kind of made it a tradition to review Star Wars comics during the holidays, in particular the comic adaptations of movies. And truth be told, I was kind of gearing up to review Rise of Skywalker's adaptation, despite my one-year cutoff date. I hated that movie, and I have ten pages of notes already for it, defending things I liked, providing analysis of why it doesn't work and how a lot of the creative decisions were terrible ones, how I would have handled the ending of the sequel trilogy. No, I have not read the Trevorrow script. Did we ever get actual, real confirmation from him that that was the real script? I just have a hard time believing that the guy who wrote Book of Henry would have made a better Star Wars movie. Unfortunately, in case you haven't heard, the comic adaptation's been cancelled. It was kind of in limbo for a while as COVID started ravaging things, but a short while ago they confirmed that it was officially cancelled. Though it might just get released straight to trade as opposed to individual issues. Kind of a surprising move that they cancelled it because, regardless of anyone's feelings about any of the sequel trilogy, the comic adaptations for Force Awakens and Last Jedi were decent moneymakers. I don't know, maybe a consolidation move to save money on printing it? But yeah, unless they announce that trade or someone Patreon sponsors a review of the movie, that review ain't gonna happen. And I got repeatedly asked, Oh my god, are you just gonna cover Rise of Skywalker itself instead of a comic adaptation? No one even seemed to consider the possibility of me doing a review of Solo's comic adaptation, despite me reviewing all the other prequels this year. And therein lies the problem with Solo. It's not bad, it's just not memorable. Say what you will about any movie in any of the trilogies, you remember what happens in them. You remember the feelings of exultation. You remember the disappointment. You remember the dialogue you'd quote again endlessly. You remember the lines that made you wince that you'd equally quote again endlessly. I don't like the prequel trilogy, but they're incredibly fun to talk about, debate, have arguments with people in the comments about. Solo is a fun sci-fi heist movie with pretty good characters and moments, but it's also a movie that nobody wanted and nobody really knew what to do with after it was over. It's just... there. It is not a bad movie. I actually really liked it and had fun watching it, especially watching it a second time with friends, but it is a movie that is completely unnecessary. The lion's share of character development, the most interesting and important part of Han Solo's story, is the original trilogy. We did not need a movie learning how he met Chewbacca and got the Millennium Falcon. For all the flack that The Force Awakens gets for it supposedly just being about pushing the nostalgia button, in my opinion, Solo deserves that more, because it's banking on you giving a crap about how Han Solo made the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs. And honestly, I doubt that the comic adaptation will fix what I felt was the major deficiency of the film, Han Solo himself. But that's something we could talk about during the review. Let's dig into Solo, a Star Wars Stories comic adaptation, and see if there's any way we can connect it to Christmas. from a trade and no cover analysis. We open not with an introductory crawl, but still intro text. Crime syndicates compete for resources, food, medicine, and hyperfuel, all currently fighting for commercial spots at the Super Bowl. On the shipbuilding planet of Corellia, the foul Lady Proxima forces runaways into a life of crime in exchange for shelter and protection. And yet she still pays a better hourly rate than most corporations. Why are Lady Proxima and Hyperfuel in all caps, but not Corellia? On these mean streets, a young man fights for survival. 
but yearns to fly among the stars. Watch as this turns out to be a prequel to Aladdin's flying carpet. Don't look at me like that! You know they do it! We open on a bit that's not in the finished movie, namely because it's brief exposition we'd get later. But hey, we do see a Star Destroyer being constructed, and apparently they're just three parts that get glued together. I kid, but now I just want to see Star Trek's multi-vector assault mode, but like, a Star Destroyer splitting into three ships. Anyway, Lady Proxima instructs the young Han Solo to do a handoff in an alley, and apparently she's located in the Den of the White Worms. Man, young Peter Capaldi looks weird. Later in the alley, a fight ensues. Han apparently didn't bring the full amount of coaxium that he was supposed to deliver, and the guy he was making the handoff to was supposed to be alone. So it erupts into a chase scene as Han steals a hover car. I was promised flying cars. The car had some gold dice on the windshield that he takes for luck. It seems to work as it gets him away and back to the den, where he's pulled into the shadows by his girlfriend Kira. Since he still has the coaxium he was supposed to hand off, the two plan to sell it to get off the planet. But they're soon found by Proxima's goons, who drag him away while Kira pockets the coaxium. Han says that the goons kept the money and the coaxium, and that he barely made it out with his life. Honestly, not that far off. But she doesn't believe him. He steals a staff that one of the goons hit him with, but another points a gun at him. Kira steps in to defend Han, with Proxima trying to get her to not side with him when her gang is the one who helped her. She tries to bargain and says that they'll earn back double what she lost in the deal, but the goon doesn't buy it and just gets ready to shoot them. To bluff, Han takes out what he claims is a thermal detonator. That's a rock. No, it isn't, Proxima. Yes, it is, and you just made a clicking sound with your mouth. Yeah, but the explosion sound I make will blow you away! Eh? Eh? Instead, he just throws the rock at a window above them, and apparently sunlight burns Proxima, which allows Han and Kira to escape via the car Han stole. They have to abandon the car soon afterwards in the chase, which now includes a bit where they hide in a barrel full of space worms to throw off the scent of the goons' dogs. Probably a good cut, not really necessary to have in the movie. From there, they enter a spaceport and make their way to the checkpoint. They hope to get away from the Empire, at the very least. Kira points out that this is incredibly risky. We've got no protection. We could get snatched up by traffickers, sold to Crimson Dawn or the Hut Cartel. Hey, don't worry. I hear that Jabba guy's a wonderful human being. Han assures her that's not going to happen, handing over the gold dice for luck. Okay, I didn't bring this up in the last Jedi review, but the dice thing is weird. They're like a bit of background decoration in A New Hope, and then never appear again in the original trilogy. And for some reason, they decided that there's now, like, a bunch of importance and history to them? Like, I wouldn't have even known they existed until they were given such significance in Last Jedi. Are we gonna learn the shocking truth behind the Falcon's How's My Driving bumper sticker next? They manage to bribe the guard with the coaxium, but as they pass through the checkpoint, Kira is grabbed by Proxima's goons. The security gate closes, and Han's on the other side. She tells him to run, but he swears he'll come back for her. Of course, he has no money, no supplies, and nowhere to go to actually accomplish something like that, so he sees a recruitment station for the Empire. Explore new worlds, learn valuable skills, bring order and unity to the galaxy, build enormous super weapons, wear completely worthless armor, obey the flagrant whims of weirdos in capes and robes. Weirder still is that in the movie, the recruitment hologram is actually playing what seems to be a variation on the Imperial theme, implying that the march is somewhat diegetic in the Star Wars universe. I mean, you open that door and suddenly Luke staring at the twin sunsets while his theme song plays is actually him being overly dramatic to his own MP3 player. Anyway, he signs up for the Imperial Navy and gives his name. Han. Han what? Who are your people? I don't have people. I'm alone. Hmm? Han alone it is then. Oh, wait, 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 no. Lone Star. No, of course he calls him Han Solo. Some take umbrage with his name coming from some random Imperial. And I kind of have to agree. It's just goofy. Did we need an explanation why his name is the word Solo? This is a universe with characters whose last names include Skywalker, Starkiller, and Fisto. What's weirder still is that later Han will point out that he knew his father, so why wouldn't he know his own surname? 
Anyway, he's off to the Academy, and the comic takes an interesting turn here. So in the finished movie, the recruiter says, We'll have you flying in no time. Which cuts to him flying through the air as part of an infantry fight on the planet Karita. This is already weird because he was explicitly not signing up for the infantry, but there is a deleted scene you can see on YouTube where we find out what happened. That Han broke formation during a fight with raiders, disobeying orders, and the fallout from this gets him reassigned to the infantry, and that's where we get the, we'll have you flying in no time line. It's better executed there, but the comic handled things a little differently. It starts on the infantry stuff before briefly flashing back to not only the incident in the TIE Fighter, but another incident where he stole a TIE Fighter and modified its engines. That part's not as important as the bit where he broke formation, though. We actually get to see it and the court-martial afterwards, and I frankly like the comics version a little better. While the cutscene in the movie is still good, showing Han doing his wheeling and dealing pretty well even if he's mostly unsuccessful, the comic actually has dialogue that explains everything a little better. Sure, Han saved the lives of his teammates by breaking formation, but they point out that in doing so, he destroyed valuable Empire equipment, which they cared about more. It's a good reminder of the actual culture of fascism that the Empire has. Lives are less important than equipment to them. But at the same time, they've already invested time and money in training him, so send him to the infantry. On the planet Mimban. Wait, if they were actually on Mimban, then why did the caption say this was on Karita? I know his court-martial was occurring there, but it's really weird to have the caption like that. But yeah, regardless of anything else, the scene should not have been deleted in my opinion. On Mimba, it's three years later and Han's superior officer gets blasted and some captain named Beckett soon takes command. Han overhears him talking to two others about the AT hauler they're here to get and even spots that one of the ones with him, named Rio, has additional arms and his face is hidden behind a mask. And while aliens in the Empire aren't unheard of, High Thrawn, the the Empire is usually a homo sapiens only club. Later, he secretly goes up to them and asks to join up, even pointing out that Beckett's uniform is full of laser holes, meaning he probably stole it off of a dead guy. Well, either that or the Empire is installing a really weird new rank insignia system. He tries to sell himself on coming along, but they're reluctant to do so. He tries to blackmail them by saying he'll sell them out to the lieutenant in charge, but Beckett's not stupid, calling the lieutenant over first and claiming Han's a deserter that they've caught. The lieutenant decides to feed him to the beast, throwing Han down into some cage they have, where a very pissed off Chewbacca is located. Chewbacca starts to attack him, even try to drown him in the mud at the base of the cage, but then Han gets his attention by speaking a bit of Wookiee. Me have plan of breakout! You and I freedom make by secret battle of pretend! Look! Big stick! <laughs> The stick they took out was a support beam where the stormtroopers watching over them were standing, so they fall into the pit, allowing Chewbacca and Han to escape. Han convinces Chewie that Beckett and his crew are friends waiting for him, so they have to get to them to escape. And indeed, Beckett is impressed when he spots Han and Chewie down on the ground. Rio encourages bringing them on, especially since a Wookiee will provide some extra muscle for the job. After a cutscene where Han points out the ways that the stolen ship can be tracked by the Empire, Han and Chewie formally introduce themselves to each other. Chewbacca? All right, well, you're gonna need a nickname because I ain't saying that every time. I'm gonna call you... 3PO. Yeah, I got a good feeling about that name. On the planet Vandor, Beckett and his partner, Val, explain the job. It's basically a space version of a train robbery, using their ship to steal a cargo container on said train. It's full of coaxium, and there are Viper droids that can act as security if a certain beam is tripped, but they're confident they've got all the angles covered. After a character development scene the night before the heist, we get to the job in question. The only important bit of information we learn is from Chewbacca, who apparently explains that the Wookiees have been enslaved by the Empire, and that he's searching for his family or tribe. Well, at least we know that his wife, son, and father will eventually escape so that they can have the freedom to watch cooking shows, repair transmitters, and masturbate to Diane Carroll. This is the way. 
That could gives Han his iconic blaster. The answer to a question nobody was asking. Anyway, the next day the heist is on and things seem to be going well. But this is a heist movie, so things go wrong with the arrival of Enfys Nest, a group of pirates and marauders who intend to steal the coaxium now that Beckett's done the heavy lifting. The sequence is exciting and action-packed and does not go well for our heroes. Rio gets killed, Val blows herself up to take out a bridge and the Viper droids, and they lose the coaxium, which explodes and takes out a mountain. Still, Enfys Nest doesn't get it either. All in all, a hundred percent successful trip! Han made the call to ditch the coaxium since the two forces were struggling over it, and if they had continued to do so, they would have died. Unfortunately, they were hired for this job by the crime syndicate Crimson Dawn. And if they don't deliver on it, they'll be killed. Han suggests that they just run for it, but Beckett says that Crimson Dawn will hunt them down. Their only shot is to talk to Dryden Voss, the direct guy who hired them, and see if they can find a way to make it up to him. Beckett does try to be nice and say that Han and Chewie can leave since Voss only knows about him, but Han volunteers to go anyway. And this is where I start having issues with our title character. While Han in both the movie and the comic says it's worth the risk if they can still get the money, it comes across more like an attempt to at taking responsibility and sticking his neck out for a friend. And that doesn't feel like Han Solo when we first meet him. Look, Han's not an utter bastard. After all, there's a reason why he came back and joined the attack on the Death Star, but the movie, needing him to not be a total asshole, has too many examples of him just being so nice and, well, unscoundrel-like. Have a conscience, sure, but even if you tried to argue, well, the events of this movie are what shape him into the more selfish figure in A New Hope, it still doesn't match up. His later actions especially don't make him come across as the guy who's in this exchange. But they're gonna kill her! Better her than me. To tie this into the other prequel reviews I did, that's kind of the point I was trying to make about Anakin. The journey we saw him on does not feel like it ends with the person he is in Rogue One or A New Hope. It's the difference between the story of Anakin Skywalker's fall from grace versus the story of Darth Vader's beginnings. And thus it's the same with Han Solo. This is the story of a decent guy just trying to make his way in a harsh universe versus a thief with a heart of gold. Neither character is bad, but there's this disconnect between the two. Han Solo is the weakest part of his own movie because he doesn't feel like Han Solo. Anyway, apparently they were scheduled to meet up with Voss and his yacht on the planet. Or maybe Beckett called him, I'm not sure. And they get picked up. Voss is apparently holding a party or something and is in the middle of murdering the regional governor while this is happening. While Beckett goes off to get a drink, Han is greeted by... Kira! Unlike the movie, we get a montage of what happened to her after she was recaptured. Sold to some weird looking dude, who in turn sold her to Voss, where she became a member of Crimson Dawn. I think it's better if we left this part out. It's better to have it implied versus actually shown. And of course, we get this little gem that was dropped later on in the movie. Learning Terrace Kasi will only get you so far, Kira. You must master all the dark forces of the Jedi arena, whether it is on the battlefront as a Republic commando or seeking a racer's revenge in Super Bombad Racing. You may fight a Jedi outcast from the Jedi Academy or just any other apprentice of the Force that lives in the shadows of the Empire. Angry Birds Star Wars. Anywho, yeah, Voss trains her to be a badass fighter, and she even murders the guy who owned her before him. The two reunite, and Han expresses how everything he's been doing the last few years was to get back to Corellia to find her. It's soon revealed that she's Voss's top lieutenant as he enters, and is introduced to Han and Chewbacca. Privately, Voss berates Beckett for not anticipating that Enfys Ness would try to steal the coaxium, and he needs an excuse not to kill him. Beckett promises to get the coaxium, but this was really the best chance to get it. Refined coaxium is strictly controlled by the Empire and heavily guarded. Han suggests getting unrefined coaxium, which can only be found in one spot, the Spice Mines of Kessel. Voss is reluctant, since it's controlled by the Pikes, who have a fragile alliance with Crimson Dawn, and they don't want to jeopardize it. Still, since Beckett doesn't have any allegiance to the Pikes, he and Han could get in, steal the coaxium, get it refined before it destabilizes and explodes, and then deliver it to Voss. Voss is impressed by Han's arrogance and eagerness, so decides to go through with it, but wants Kira to come along to make sure it happens. If you don't want the Pikes to find out about your involvement, maybe don't bring along the woman with a Crimson Dawn tattoo on her arm. To get the coaxium to a refinery in time, they need a fast ship, which Kira can help with. 
she knows a guy with the right kind of ship, a retired smuggler and proficient gambler, aka Lando Calrissian. While Alden Ehrenreich never really convinces me he was Han Solo in this movie, Donald Glover's Lando Calrissian is amazing, and I was sold that this was young Lando immediately. He oozes charisma and cool in everything he says and does, and it kind of makes me wish it was his movie instead. Kira doesn't think he'll sign on for the job since he's retired, so Han suggests winning his ship in a game of cards, since that's how Lando originally won his ship. Han joins the game, and he's actually pretty damn good at playing cards, getting to the final bet. I'll see your 2,000, and I'll raise you... however much this is. Must be a peach of a hand. Lando bets his ship in response, and it looks like Han won... But Lando cheats with a hidden card. This is another bit I'm kind of iffy about in regards to Han. Sure, he's a bit of a doofus at times in the original trilogy, but this movie keeps crapping on him to where it seems like Han never wins anything, never has any successful jobs or operations, and is screwed over all the time. Han is supposed to be a smooth talker full of BS, yet most of the time nobody believes him. Let's actually see Han developing the skills that would be so useful for the original trilogy that his enemies were sick of by the time Force Awakens came around. But yeah, Lando is intrigued by this whole thing and decides to sign on for a percentage of their take. We're then introduced to his first mate, a droid named L-33T, a character whom I love right down to her being named Leet. Some people have problems with this character. So what's it like being utterly wrong? I kid, of course. Personal preferences and subjective opinions and all. For me, the name is just a goofy little reference. No sillier than any other overly dramatic name in Star Wars, like the aforementioned Skywalker. Or, of course, our old pal Elon Sleazebagano, or whatever. It's not like they ever call her Leet or the like. As with other droids, her nickname is just a shortened version of her full name, L3. Her deal and motivation is that she is a droid rights activist. And frankly, it's about friggin' time we had someone like that! Droids are forever crapped on in the Star Wars universe, and it's nice one of the movies acknowledges that and tries to do something about it! Yeah, yeah, there are some in expanded universe stories, but we're talking movies here, and the closest we've gotten is Rey being nice to droids, which isn't the same thing as acknowledging droids' craptacular existence in the galaxy. People say she's played off like a pair of activism or the like, but honestly I don't see it. She doesn't take any bull and only works with Lando because she legitimately wants to. I really do get the impression that if Lando ever legit pissed her off, she'd snap his neck like a toothpick and take the ship for herself. Although it's not helped by Lando claiming that he would wipe her memory, but she has the best navigational database in the galaxy. Let's be real here, she's got a buzzsaw in her chest unit. The minute he tried, she'd cut his heart out and eat it. And she doesn't even have a mouth. And thus we're introduced to his ship, the Millennium Falcon. A lot cleaner than we'd see in later movies, plus with an escape pod and the mandible notch. So, uh, I, I got this at a Goodwill for the review, but honestly, I, I don't know what to do with it. Maybe hang it up down here or something, I guess. The Falcon is such a cool damn ship, but this toy is so huge. As they fly off, we learn that Enfys Ness has placed a homing beacon on them to track them. That happens a lot with the Falcon. They should really do something about that. I wouldn't be surprised if the toy came with- It's here where Han reveals that his dad helped build Corellian YT-1300 freighters like the Millennium Falcon before he got laid off, so he's been on one before. And so it's here where we finally learn the explanation of the Kessel Run and why a unit of distance was boasted about in A New Hope as if it was time. You know, besides the obvious joke of George Lucas thought it sounded spacey, but the expanded universe cannot pretend that anything is just a mistake like any other movie would have. Or it was meant to be fake boasting that Obi-Wan saw through. Take your pick. Point is, elaborate explanation. Basically, Kessel is located inside of a dangerous area of space, one you can't just travel through hyperspace to get in and out of. Asteroids, debris, cosmic storms, a maelstrom, black holes, etc. Instead, needing to navigate in or near a narrow channel of safe space. The Kessel Run was done by smugglers to get illicit substances from Kessel in as short a distance as possible, since that safe zone is patrolled by the Empire, usually by going into the more dangerous parts of it. We get some character bits of Beckett, in particular his 
belief that people are predictable, especially as Han goes off to have some private time with Kira. Kira's in the middle of trying on some of Lando's cape collection, and let's be real here, we'd all do that if given the chance. After the character bits and them briefly making out, Beckett the cock blocker comes in to basically tell Han, Dude, she's in too deep with Crimson Dawn and will break your heart. Also including that one should always assume everyone will betray you, so you'll never be disappointed. There are also character bits with L3 and Kira along similar lines, implying that she and Lando... Play cards together, as it were. Anyway, let's get to the heist. Kira claims to be a representative of a trade group offering slaves for spice in the mines, with Han and Chewie acting as the slaves. She slips Han the dice for luck while the plan begins. Kira, Beckett, and L3 handling negotiations while Han and Chewie escape their bonds. They trip a security alarm, forcing the others to take out the leadership and assume control of the security office. To help create some chaos for the two, L3 releases a bunch of restraining bolts on droids and and deactivates slave collars for those working the mines, basically creating a little revolt. Although he's not the only one, as Chewie breaks off to go free some Wookiee prisoners. Han is at first annoyed because they need to stick to the plan, but he gives him a weapon to help and says he hopes to see him around. This is the kind of thing we needed more of. Han's not interested in freeing the slaves or stopping the spice mining or anything. He's got his eye on the prize. But he'll give a friend something to help their chances for their own goals. While Han starts loading up the Coaxium, we cut over to Lando and the Falcon. The Calrissian Chronicles. Chapter 5 continued. We are supposedly getting a Lando series in the future on Disney+. Plus. It better be called The Calrissian Chronicles. Otherwise, what's the point? Spotting the mass breakout in progress, Lando heads out to go protect the ship and help everyone get out. Han runs into some more guards on the way out with the Coaxium, but fortunately, Chewie returns with some buddies to help speed things along. They get back to the Falcon, but L3 gets hit repeatedly during the escape. Lando runs and retrieves most of her upper body as they head out. Han takes the controls, but there's a Star Destroyer in their way, no doubt having been summoned because of the revolt. And I've gotta say, both the comic and the movie do a spectacular job of making it terrifying. The Star Destroyer releases some TIE Fighters to go after them, so Han quickly turns the ship around. Lando says that with all this, they don't have time to get to the refinery before the Coaxium explodes. As such, Han says they have to find a faster route, which Lando balks at because you can't make the Kessel Run in less than 20 parsecs. Han's suggestion fly into the maelstrom itself, which is a stupid and insane idea. He then, however, suggests hooking L3's neural core into the Falcon. Her special navigational database should be able to chart a shorter course out. The TIE fighters follow and continue the attack, though eventually they manage to peel them all off. One bit the comic left in that wasn't in the movie is that when the Falcon gets struck by lightning, everyone's hair, including Chewie's, goes poof. Probably a good cut. It's amusing and all, but a little too silly, especially when they enter a dark area and, when they turn on the lights, they're confronted by some kind of massive, multi-eyed hell beast. Now being chased by the massive creature, they find a huge gravity well that's part of the maelstrom. They eject the escape pod towards it and the creature flies after it, getting caught in the gravity well too. Oh hey, it turns out this is a prequel to Hellstar Ramina too! L3 manages to find a way out of the maelstrom, but they're using all their power to not get sucked into the gravity well themselves. Using some of the coaxium, they get enough of a kick to escape and reach the refinery on the planet Savarine. The Falcon crash lands, having taken quite a beating, much to Lando's eternal annoyance. He wants his share of the coaxium. And then, I don't ever want to see you again. Never? Not unless you bring a hot princess with you. Feeling lonely? No, I just need someone to finance the Calrissian Chronicles. Self-publishing is the way to go these days, Han. While they wait for the Coaxium to be refined, Han talks with Kira about maybe hooking back up with him once they get paid, but Kira says she can't. She owes Voss too much. We also attempt to get some character development with Han claiming that he's an outlaw, but that Kira knows he's really the good guy. And... yeah, no. Again, it just doesn't work for Han. We'll talk about it some more at the end. In the meantime, Enfys Nest arrives. Han tries to bluff and claim that he's got reinforcements in the Falcon ready to come at his signal, but I guess Lando saw what was going on and decided to cut his losses, flying the ship off instead. 
Beckett and Kira step up, pointing out that Crimson Dawn is on its way, and that they'll be here by the time the Coaxium's refined, hoping for a compromise without so much killing. However, the leader of Enfys Ness, which I guess is not the name of their group, just their leader, takes off their helmet to reveal a young girl. She explains that, once upon a time, a band of mercenaries came to a peaceful planet and kept raiding the people who lived there for supplies. The people eventually fought back, but the mercenaries retaliated by cutting off the tongues of every person there. The mercenaries transformed into Crimson Dawn. Enfys's group was formed not as just everyday pirates, but specifically to combat Crimson Dawn for all the terrible things they've done. They ask our heroes not to give Voss the Coaxium, that they'll just use it to brutalize system after system while being allied with the Empire. She wants to use it to help fight back against Crimson Dawn and the Syndicates. And here's where we get, again, what I feel is out of character behavior for Han. He tells Beckett he doesn't think they can give the Coaxium to Voss. You joining the cause, Han Solo? I'm just trying to make it out alive. Yeah, except your reasoning for doing so is to help Enfys and try to prevent Crimson Dawn from getting the resources. This is not avoiding a fight or trying to get out alive. It's actively deciding, morality forbids me from helping evil people acquire more power and wealth. Han has a plan, but Beckett doesn't think it'll work, so he's skipping out. If by some miracle you make it out of here, find me on Tatooine. What's on Tatooine? Heard about a job. Big shot gangster putting together a crew. Okay, that really seems to be implying that this leads into the events that occur right before A New Hope for Han, but I hope that wasn't the implication, since this is supposed to be... Like, a decade before then. I mean, sure, he could be working for Jabba for that long and built up a rapport during that time, but it just seems like a weird reference to throw in when Han should be going around the galaxy doing jobs and not just the place we know he ends up. Anyway, the yacht arrives... I'm um, sorry. According to this caption, I've gotten his name wrong the whole time. It's Dyden Voss. I look forward to the EU explanation that he goes by both names. They tell Voss that Beckett died saving Han's life on Kessel. Voss demands to see the Coaxium for himself. It's magnificent. How'd you do it? Wasn't easy. No, I mean, how'd you do it? It looks exactly like the real thing. Cosplayers, man, never underestimate their craftsmanship. Voss reveals Beckett, who spilled the beans about the plan. Come on, don't look at me like that. You weren't paying attention. I am an Imperial captain. It's just my uniform was stored in a place that had moths in it. Nearby, Voss's men have apparently already apprehended Enfys and her forces. Voss asks Kira what he should do with her in light of the betrayal. I would want to know why. If it was a moment of weakness or something else. And then what? Then I would ask that person to prove their loyalty by sacrificing something they love. And then? And then ask why you have red paint on your face as if they hadn't finished washing off the vision makeup before bringing you over here. However, it turns out to be a trick. Han and Kira knew Beckett wouldn't join up and indeed betray them. The real goal was to get Voss's forces off the yacht, where we see that Enfys and her group are actually normal people from the area dressed up like them, allowing the real ones to ambush them. And indeed, the canisters they have with them are the real Coaxium. Realizing the opportunity before him, Beckett shoots Voss's remaining guards. But not Voss himself for some reason? Still, he has Chewie carry the Coaxium with him as they leave. And thus, shootout between Han and Voss ensues. With some good banter, another fake betrayal by Kira, but... Uh, wait. That's... the end of the issue. The comic's not over, but... Wait. Solo has seven issues? Okay, forgive me for a moment my confusion. I recall this only being a five-issue miniseries, so when it went into issue six, I figured I was just mistaken. I did not realize it was seven! None of the other Star Wars movie comics are this long! And look, I like the movie just fine, but... This gets seven issues? What the hell? When The Last Jedi's awesome throne room lightsaber battle gets reduced to two friggin' pages for space saving, and this okay movie gets extra length to it, something is wrong here. Ugh. Anyway, Kira, of course, kills Voss and tells Han to go after Chewie and Beckett. What are you gonna do? Well, if we give all the coaxium to Enfys, we're gonna need something to buy our ship with. I mean, you pretty much killed everyone else around here, you... Could just use the yacht itself as your new ship. Pretty sure it's got a stocked bar. Han leaves, 
But of course, Kira has other plans. She contacts the head of Crimson Dawn and informs him that Beckett stole the Coaxium and killed Voss, not mentioning Han at all. The guy instructs her to come to Dathomir, where they'll discuss what will happen next, and we get our big reveal. The head of Crimson Dawn is Darth Maul. Probably would have been a bigger reveal for me if I wasn't already aware of Clone Wars and Rebels and everything where he's alive. But as I've said, most people will only ever see the movies, so I'm hoping someone thought that was really cool. Although me personally... This is personal preference here, but I've always found the idea that Darth Maul survived and started his own criminal organization kind of lame. Oh sure, surviving, fine. Kind of weird that the power of hate apparently is stronger than getting cut in half. But hey, this is a series of movies about space wizards. Weirder things have happened. But this quiet, dark warrior who has all that hate to survive death, seeking revenge on those who have wronged him. Not just the Jedi, but Palpatine as well. And what he does with his second chance is... Start a mafia syndicate. It just seems so... Petty! So small! Sure, a Sith needs to build a power base and all, but I don't know, it just seems so beneath him to me when his aspirations are supposed to be so grandiose. I'm probably in the minority on this, like so many other Star Wars opinions I have. But yeah, clearly this was supposed to set up stuff for the future. Maybe more solo sequels, but that feels off when Han is supposed to not even believe in the Force, or Force users or the like. Speaking of, Han somehow gets ahead of Chewie and Beckett. Beckett tells him Kira's just gonna betray him, starting to give a speech as he gets ready to pull his gun. But Han shoots him first. And you know what? That is also a very Han Solo thing to do, so kudos there, movie. Beckett tells him he was right to do so. You made the smart move, kid. For once. I would have killed you. Was even gonna say... McClunky. Beckett dies and the yacht flies off, to Han's disappointment. Later, Enfys thanks him for what he's done. It's the blood that brings life to something new. Yeah, what? A rebellion. I mean, yeah, we could have had an important character in the prequels help start the rebellion, but how about instead we just have a random person introduced in this one started up? I guess. Maybe? You could come with us, you know. We need warriors and leaders. Like you. Well, of course he'll join up. This entire movie has been his journey to show he's actually the good guy, as Kira said. Hell, his entire goal was to go back to Corellia and free Kira, but that's not a thing anymore. And Chewie explicitly was all about helping free his people from the Empire. Or, you know, because this is supposed to be a Han Solo prequel, he says no. Yeah, this is bullcrap. His character arc is leading him to the moment where he joins up for a greater cause, especially in light of Kira not being able to get away from Crimson Dawn. He should be all about fighting the syndicates in the Empire now. But because this is a Han Solo prequel, he can't because he doesn't do that until A New Hope. Anyway, Enfys gives him a little bit of coaxium for all his trouble. The movie cuts straight to him going to find Lando, but the comic more reasonably shows a montage of him and Chewie doing jobs and having adventures together before then. And indeed, he finds Lando at another card table. At first it looks like he's going to kill him for leaving them behind, but then he spots the hidden card dispenser he used to cheat, so it's just all, ha ha ha, good buddy, I'm not gonna steal your secret card or anything. He uses the coaxium to buy into the game, once again getting into a position to win the Falcon. Without the card Lando used to cheat before, Han wins the Falcon. And so our comic and movie ends with the two flying off in the Falcon. Beckett said he heard about this very big gangster putting together a job. Yeah, but in the comic version, that was implied to be like weeks ago. I'm pretty sure the job is over by now. This comic is a very good adaptation, arguably better than the movie in some spots. The addition of one more issue gives everything a lot more room to breathe and have not only every scene in the film, but additional ones that would have benefited the movie greatly. The artwork is spot on for likenesses and portraying a lot of the big action set pieces of the film and doing them justice, with a few moments like the Star Destroyer's appearance in the Maelstrom even being comparable to how it looked in the film for which you would like better. The only adaptation problems really seem to be more in the captions, like that spelling error or the misleading one for the earlier flashback. Probably need another once-over by the editor for those. Like I've said though, the big problem with the movie is Han Solo himself. 
The movie itself is fine. It's fun. It's exciting. It's witty. It's got interesting characters and cool shots and adventure that works great for Star Wars. But this guy is not Han Solo, and I have a difficult time believing that he's ever going to become the Han Solo we see in A New Hope. Others might feel differently, but for me, he's not grouchy enough, he's not cynical enough, and he's not selfish enough. This guy is fine in a kind of Star-Lord, good-natured doofus, but having more roguish aspects kind of way, but he's not Han Solo. I dub him Haas Nolo. And you know what? I'm still okay with that, too. This holiday season, maybe we all just need to sit back and watch something fun. It's imperfect, it's not great, but it is just something enjoyable, and Lord knows we need that this year. Happy Life Day, everyone, and come back next week for us to reflect on this year and count down yet another 15 mistakes I've made during this show's run. We decided to come and rescue you. Good job. <laughs>